Chapter One of the Lamplighter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bridget Gage. The Lamplighter by Maria Susanna Cummins. Chapter One. Good God, to think upon a child that has no childish days, no careless play, no frolics wild, no words of prayer and praise. Landon. It was growing dark in the city. Out in the open country it would be light for half an hour or more, but within the close streets where my story leads me it was already dusk. Upon the wooden doorstep of a low-roofed, dark, and unwholesome-looking house sat a little girl who was gazing up the street with much earnestness. The house door, which was open behind her, was close to the sidewalk, and the step on which she sat was so low that her little unshod feet rested on the cold bricks. It was a chilly evening in November, and a light fall of snow, which had made everything look bright and clean in the pleasant open squares, near which the fine houses of the city were built, had only served to render the narrow streets and dark lanes dirtier and more cheerless than ever. For, mixed with the mud and filth which abound in those neighborhoods where the poor are crowded together, the beautiful snow had lost all its purity. A great many people were passing to and fro, bent on their various errands of duty or of pleasure. But no one noticed the little girl, for there was no one in the world who cared for her. She was scantily clad, in garments of the poorest description. Her hair was long and very thick, uncombed and unbecoming, if anything could be said to be unbecoming, to a set of features which, to a casual observer, had not a single attraction, being thin and sharp, while her complexion was sallow, and her whole appearance unhealthy. She had, to be sure, fine dark eyes, but so unnaturally large did they seem, in contrast to her thin puny face, that they only increased the peculiarity of it, without enhancing its beauty. Had any one felt any interest in her, which nobody did, had she had a mother, which, alas, she had not, those friendly and partial eyes would perhaps have found something in her to praise. As it was, however, the poor little thing was told, a dozen times a day, that she was the worst-looking child in the world, and what was more, the worst behaved. No one loved her, and she loved no one. No one treated her kindly. No one tried to make her happy, or cared whether she were so. She was but eight years old, and all alone in the world. There was one thing, and one only, which she found pleasure in. She loved to watch for the coming of the old man who lit the street lamp in front of the house where she lived, to see the bright torch he carried flicker in the wind, and then, when he ran up his ladder, lit the lamp so quickly and easily, and made the whole place seem cheerful, one gleam of joy was shed on a little desolate heart, to which gladness was a stranger. And, though he had never seemed to see, and certainly had never spoken to her, she almost felt, as she watched for the old lamplighter, as if he were a friend. "'Gertie!' exclaimed a harsh voice within. "'Have you been for the milk?' The child made no answer, but gliding off the doorstep, ran quickly round the corner of the house, and hid a little out of sight. "'What's become of that child?' said the woman, from whom the voice proceeded, and who now showed herself at the door. A boy was passing, and had seen Gertie run, a boy who had caught the tone of the whole neighborhood, and looked upon her as a sort of imp, or spirit of evil, laughed aloud, pointed to the corner which concealed her, and walking off with his head over his shoulder, to see what would happen next, exclaimed to himself as he went, "'She'll catch it. Nan Grant'll fix her.' In a moment more, Gertie was dragged from her hiding-place, and, with one blow for her ugliness, and another for her impudence, for she was making up faces at Nan Grant with all her might, she was dispatched down a neighboring alley with a kettle for the milk. She ran fast, for she feared the lamplighter would come and go in her absence, and was rejoiced on her return to catch sight of him as she drew near the house, just going up his ladder. She stationed herself at the foot of it, and was so engaged in watching the bright flame that she did not observe when the man began to descend, and, as she was directly in his way, he hit against her as he sprang to the ground, and she fell upon the pavement. "'Hello, my little one!' exclaimed he. "'How's this?' as he stooped to lift her up. She was upon her feet in an instant, 
for she was used to hard knocks, and did not much mind a few bruises. But the milk! It was all spilt. "'Well, now I declare,' said the man, "'that's too bad. What'll Mammy say?' And for the first time, looking full in Gertie's face, here he interrupted himself with, "'My, what an odd-faced child! Looks like a witch!' Then, seeing that she looked apprehensively at the spilt milk, and gave a sudden glance up at the house, he added kindly, "'She won't be hard on such a mite of a thing as you are, will she? Cheer up, my ducky. Never mind if she does scold you a little. I'll bring you something to-morrow that I think you'll like, maybe. You're such a lonesome sort of a looking thing. And mind, if the old woman makes a row, tell her I did it. But didn't I hurt you? What was you doing with my ladder?' "'I was seeing you light the lamp,' said Gertie, "'and I ain't hurt a bit, but I wish I hadn't spilt the milk.' At this moment Nan Grant came to the door, saw what had happened, and commenced pulling the child into the house, amidst blows, threats, and profane and brutal language. The lamplighter tried to appease her, but she shut the door in his face. Gertie was scolded, beaten, deprived of the crust which she usually got for her supper, and shut up in her dark attic for the night.' Poor little child! Her mother had died in Nan Grant's house, five years before, and she had been tolerated there since. Not so much because when Ben Grant went to sea, he bade his wife be sure and keep the child until his return, for he had been gone so long that no one thought he would ever come back, but because Nan had reasons of her own for doing so, and though she considered Gertie a dead weight upon her hands, she did not care to excite inquiries by trying to dispose of her elsewhere. When Gertie first found herself locked up for the night in the dark garret, Gertie hated and feared the dark. She stood for a minute perfectly still, then suddenly began to stamp and scream, tried to beat the door open, and shouted, "'I hate you, Nan Grant! Old Nan Grant, I hate you!' But nobody came near her, and after a while she grew more quiet, went and threw herself down on her miserable bed, covered her face with her little thin hands, and sobbed and cried as if her heart would break." She wept until she was utterly exhausted, and then gradually, with only now and then a low sob and catching of the breath, she grew quite still. By and by she took away her hands from her face, clasped them together in a convulsive manner, and looked up at a little glazed window by the side of the bed. It was but three panes of glass, unevenly stuck together, and was the only chance of light the room had. There was no moon, but as Gertie looked up, she saw through the window shining down upon her one bright star. She thought she had never seen anything half so beautiful. She had often been out of doors when the sky was full of stars, and had not noticed them much. But this one, all alone, so large, so bright, and yet so soft and pleasant-looking, seemed to speak to her. It seemed to say, Gertie, Gertie, poor little Gertie. She thought it seemed like a kind face, such as she had a long ago seen or dreamt about. Suddenly it flashed through her mind. Who lit it? Somebody lit it. Some good person I know. Oh, how could he get up so high? And Gertie fell asleep, wondering who lit the star. Poor little, untaught, benighted soul, who shall enlighten thee? Thou art God's child, little one. Christ died for thee. Will he not send man or angel to light up the darkness within? to kindle a light that shall never go out, the light that shall shine through all eternity. End of chapter 1Emily Taylor. Gertie awoke the next morning, not as children wake who are roused by each other's merry voices, or by a parent's kiss, who have kind hands to help them dress, and know that a nice breakfast awaits them. But she heard harsh voices below, knew from the sound that the men who lived at Nan Grant's, her son and two or three boarders, had come in to breakfast, and that her only chance of obtaining any share of the meal was to be on the spot when they had finished to take that portion of what remained which Nan might chance to throw or shove towards her. So she crept downstairs, waited a little out of sight, until she smelt the smoke of the men's pipes as they passed through the passage, 
and when they had all gone noisily out, she slid into the room, looking about her with a glance made up of fear and defiance. She met but a rough greeting from Nan, who told her she had better drop that ugly, sour look, eat some breakfast if she wanted it, but take care and keep out of her way, and not come near the fire, plaguing round where she was at work, or she'd get another dressing, worse than she had last night. Gertie had not looked for any other treatment, so there was no disappointment to bear, but glad enough of the miserable food left for her on the table, swallowed it eagerly, and waiting no second bidding to keep herself out of the way, took her little old hood, threw on a ragged shawl, which had belonged to her mother, and which had long been the child's best protection from the cold, and, though her hands and feet were chilled by the sharp air of the morning, ran out of the house. Back of the yard where Nan Grant lived was a large wood and coal yard, and beyond that a wharf, and the thick muddy water of a dock. Gertie might have found playmates enough in the neighborhood of this place. She sometimes did mingle with the troops of boys and girls, equally ragged with herself, who played about in the yard. But not often. There was a league against her among the children of the place. Poor, ragged, and miserably cared for, as most of them were, they all knew that Gertie was still more neglected and abused. They had often seen her beaten, and daily heard her called an ugly, wicked child, told that she belonged to nobody, and had no business in anyone's house. Children as they were, they felt their advantage, and scorned the little outcast. Perhaps this would not have been the case if Gertie had ever mingled freely with them, and tried to be on friendly terms. But while her mother lived there with her, though it was but a short time, she did her best to keep her little girl away from the rude herd. Perhaps that habit of avoidance, but still more, a something in the child's nature, kept her from joining in their rough sports, after her mother's death had left her to do as she liked. As it was, she seldom had any intercourse with them. Nor did they venture to abuse her, otherwise than in words. For, singly, they dared not cope with her. Spirited, sudden, and violent, she had made herself feared as well as disliked. Once a band of them had united in a plan to tease and vex her. But Nan Grant, coming up at the moment when one of the girls was throwing the shoes, which she had pulled from Gertie's feet, into the dock, had given the girl a sound whipping, and put them all to flight. Gertie had not had a pair of shoes since, but Nan Grant, for once, had done her good service, and the children now left her in peace. It was a sunshiny, though a cold day, when Gertie ran away from the house, to seek shelter in the woodyard. There was an immense pile of timber in one corner of the yard, almost out of sight of any of the houses. Of different lengths and unevenly placed, the planks formed, on one side, a series of irregular steps, by means of which it was easy to climb up. Near the top was a little sheltered recess, overhung by some long planks, and forming a miniature shed, protected by the wood on all sides but one, and from that looking out upon the water. This was Gertie's haven of rest, her sanctum, and the only place from which she never was driven away. Here, through the long summer days, the little lonesome girl sat, brooding over her griefs, her wrongs, and her ugliness, sometimes weeping for hours. Now and then, when the course of her life had been smooth for a few days, that is, when she had been so fortunate as to offend no one, and had escaped whipping, or being shot up in the dark, she would get a little more cheerful, and enjoy watching the sailors belonging to a schooner hard by, as they labored on board their vessel, or occasionally rowed to and fro in a little boat. The warm sunshine was so pleasant, and the men's voices at their work so lively, that the poor little thing would for a time forget her woes. But summer had gone, the schooner and the sailors, who had been such pleasant company, had gone too. The weather was now cold, and for a few days it had been so stormy that Gertie had been obliged to stay in the house. Now, however, she made the best of her way to her little hiding place, and to her joy the sunshine had reached the spot before her, dried up the boards, so that they felt warm to her bare feet, and was still shining so bright and pleasant that Gertie forgot Nan Grant, forgot how cold she had been, and how much she dreaded the long winter. Her thoughts rambled about some time, but at last settled down upon the kind look and voice of the old lamplighter. And then, for the first time since the promise was made, it came into her mind that he had engaged to bring her something the next time he came. She could not believe he would remember it. But still, he might. He seemed to be so good-natured, and sorry for her fall. What could he mean to bring? 
Would it be something to eat? Oh, if it were only some shoes. But he wouldn't think of that. Perhaps he did not notice, but she had some. At any rate, Gertie resolved to go for her milk in season to be back before it was time to light the lamp, so that nothing should prevent her seeing him. The day seemed unusually long, but darkness came at last, and with it came True, or rather Truman, Flint, for that was the lamplighter's name. Gertie was on the spot, though she took good care to elude Nan Grant's observation. True was late about his work that night, and in a great hurry. He had only time to speak a few words in his rough way to Gertie, but they were words coming straight from as good and honest a heart as ever throbbed. He put his great smutty hand on her head in the kindest way, told her how sorry he was she got hurt, and said, It was a plaguey shame that she should have been whipped, too, and all for a spill o' milk. That was a Miss Forden, and no crime. But here, added he, diving into one of his huge pockets, here's the critter I promised you. Take good care on it. Don't buse it. And I'm guessin', if it's like the mother that I've got at home, won't be a little you'll be likin' it, for you're done. Good-bye, my little gal. And he shouldered his ladder and went off, leaving in Gertie's hands a little gray and white kitten. Gertie was so taken by surprise on finding in her arms a live kitten, something so different from what she had anticipated, that she stood for a minute irresolute what to do with it. There were a great many cats, of all sizes and colors, inhabitants of the neighboring houses and yard, frightened-looking creatures, which, like Gertie herself, crept or scampered about, and often hid themselves among the wood and coal, seeming to feel, as she did, great doubts about their having a right to be anywhere. Gertie had often felt a sympathy for them, but never thought of trying to catch one, carry it home, and tame it, for she knew that food and shelter were most grudgingly accorded to herself, and would not certainly be extended to her pets. Her first thought, therefore, was to throw the kitten down and let it run away. But while she was hesitating, the little animal pleaded for itself in a way she could not resist. Frightened by its long imprisonment and journey in true Flint's pocket, it crept from Gertie's arms up to her neck, clung there tight, and with its low, feeble cries seemed to ask her to take care of it. Its eloquence prevailed over all fear of Nan Grant's anger. She hugged Pussy to her bosom, and made a childish resolve to love it, feed it, and, above all, keep it out of Nan's sight. How much she came in time to love that kitten, no words can tell. Her little, fierce, untamed, impetuous nature had hitherto only expressed itself in angry passion, sullen obstinacy, and even hatred. But there were in her soul fountains of warm affection yet unstirred, a depth of tenderness never yet called out, and a warmth and devotion of nature that wanted only an object to expend themselves upon. So she poured out such a wealth of love on the little creature that clung to her for its support as only such a desolate little heart has to spare. She loved the kitten all the more for the care she was obliged to take of it, and the trouble and anxiety it gave her. She kept it as much as possible, out among the boards, in her own favorite haunt. She found an old hat, in which she placed her own hood, to make a bed for pussy. She carried it a part of her own scanty meals. She braved for it what she would not have done for herself. For she almost every day abstracted from the kettle, when she was returning with the milk for Nan Grant, enough for pussy's supper, running the risk of being discovered and punished, the only risk or harm the poor ignorant child knew or thought of, in connection with the theft and deception, for her ideas of abstract right and wrong were utterly undeveloped. She would play with her kitten for hours among the boards, talk to it, and tell it how much she loved it. But when the days were very cold, she was often puzzled to know how to keep herself warm out of doors, and the risk of bringing the kitten into the house was great. She would then hide it in her bosom, and run with it into the little garret room where she slept, and taking care to keep the door shut, usually eluded Nan's eyes and ears. Once or twice, when she had been off her guard, her little playful pet had escaped from her, and scampered through the lower room and passage. Once, Nan drove it out with a broom, but in that thickly peopled region, as we have said, cats and kittens were not so uncommon as to excite inquiry. It may seem strange that Gertie had leisure to spend all her time at play. Most children living among the poorer class of people learn to be useful even while they are very young. Numbers of little creatures, only a few years old, 
may be seen in our streets, about the yards and doors of houses, bending under the weight of a large bundle of sticks, a basket of shavings, or more frequently yet, a stout baby, nearly all the care of which devolves upon them. We have often pitied such little drudges, and thought their lot a hard one. But, after all, it was not the worst thing in the world. They were far better off than Gertie, who had nothing to do at all, and had never known the satisfaction of helping anybody. Nan Grant had no babies, and being a very active woman, with but a poor opinion of children's services at the best, she never tried to find employment for Gertie, much better satisfied if she would only keep out of her sight, so that, except her daily errand for the milk, Gertie was always idle, a fruitful source of unhappiness and discontent, if she had suffered from no other. Nan was a Scotchwoman, no longer young, and with a temper which, never good, became worse and worse as she grew older. She had seen life's roughest side, had always been a hard-working woman, and had the reputation of being very smart and a driver. Her husband was a carpenter by trade, but she made his home so uncomfortable that for years he had followed the sea. She took in washing, and had a few boarders, by means of which she earned what might have been an ample support for herself, had it not been for her son, an unruly, disorderly young man, spoilt in early life by his mother's uneven temper and management, and who, though a skillful workman when he chose to be industrious, always squandered his own, and a large part of his mother's earnings. Nan, as we have said, had reasons of her own for keeping Gertie, though they were not so strong as to prevent her often having half a mind to rid herself of the encumbrance. End of chapter 2《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》
which in the meantime crept down from her arms, and springing upon the table, began to devour the remnants of the repast. The organ grinder was not out of sight when Gertie's eyes fell upon the figure of the old lamplighter coming up the street. She thought she would stay and watch him light his lamp, when she was startled by a sharp and angry exclamation from Nan, and turned just in time to see her snatch her darling kitten from the table. Gertie sprang forward to the rescue, jumped into a chair, and caught Nan by the arm. But she firmly pushed her back with one hand, while with the other she threw the kitten half across the room. Gertie heard a sudden splash and a piercing cry. Nan had flung the poor creature into a large vessel of steaming hot water, which stood ready for some household purpose. The little animal struggled and writhed an instant, then died in torture. All the fury of Gertie's nature was roused. Without hesitation, she lifted a stick of wood which lay near her, and flung it at Nan with all her strength. It was well aimed, and struck the woman on the head. The blood started from the wound the blow had given. But Nan hardly felt the blow, so greatly was she excited against the child. She sprang upon her, caught her by the shoulder, and opening the house door, thrust her out upon the sidewalk. "'Ye'll never darken my doors again, your imp of wickedness,' said she, as she rushed into the house, leaving the child alone in the cold, dark night. When Gertie was angry or grieved, she always cried aloud, not sobbing, as many children do, but uttering a succession of piercing shrieks, until she sometimes quite exhausted her strength. When she found herself in the street, she commenced screaming, not from fear at being turned away from her only home, and left all alone at nightfall to wander about the city, and perhaps freeze before morning, for it was very cold. She did not think of herself for a moment. Horror and grief at the dreadful fate of the only thing she loved in the world entirely filled her little soul. So she crouched down against the side of the house, her face hid in her hands, unconscious of the noise she was making and unaware of the triumph of the girl who had once thrown away her shoes, and who was watching her from the house-door opposite. Suddenly she found herself lifted up and placed on one of the rounds of Truman Flint's ladder, which still leaned against the lamp-post. True held her firmly, just high enough on the ladder to bring her face opposite his, recognized her as his old acquaintance, and asked her, in the same kind way he had used on the former occasion, what was the matter. But Gertie could only gasp and say, "'Oh, my kitten, my kitten!' "'What? The kitten I gave you? Well, have you lost it? Don't cry. There, don't cry. "'Oh, no, not lost. Oh, poor kitty!' And Gertie began to cry louder than ever, and coughed at the same time, so dreadfully, that True was quite frightened for the child. Making every effort to soothe her, and having partially succeeded, he told her she would catch her death of cold, and she must go into the house. "'Oh, she won't let me in,' said Gertie, "'and I wouldn't go if she would.' "'Who won't let you in? Your mother?' "'No, Nan Grant.' "'Who's Nan Grant?' "'She's a horrid, wicked woman that drowned my kitten in bile and water.' "'But where's your mother?' "'I hain't got none. "'Who do you belong to, you poor little thing?' "'Nobody, and I've no business anywhere.' "'But who do you live with, and who takes care of you?' "'Oh, I lived with Nan Grant, but I hate her. "'I threw a stick of wood at her head, and I wished I'd killed her.' "'Hush, hush, you mustn't say that. "'I'll go and speak to her.' "'True moved towards the door, trying to draw Gertie in with him. "'But she resisted so forcibly that he left her outside, "'and walking directly into the room, "'where Nan was binding up her head with an old handkerchief, "'told her she had better call her little girl in.' "'for she would freeze to death out there.' "'She's no child of mine,' said Nan. "'She's been living here long enough. "'She's the worst little creature that ever lived. "'It's a wonder I've kept her so long. "'And now I hope I'll never lay eyes on her again. "'And what's more, I don't mean to. "'She ought to be hung for breaking my head. "'I believe she's got an ill spirit in her, "'if ever anybody did have in this world.' "'But what'll become of her?' said True. "'It's a fearful cold night.' "'How'd you feel, Marm, if she were found to-morrow morning? "'I'll frizz up just on your doorstep.' "'How'd I feel? That's your business, is it? "'Sposin' you take care on her yourself. "'You are make a mighty deal of fuss about the brat. "'Carry her home, and try how you're like her. "'You've been here a-talkin' to me about her once afore, "'and I tell you I won't bear a word more. "'Let other folks see to her, I say. 
I've had more in my share. And, as to her freezin', or her dyin' anyhow, I'll risk her. Them children that comes into the world, anybody knows how, don't go out of it in a hurry. She's the city's property. Let em look out for her. And you'd better go long, and not meddle with what don't consarn you. True did not wait to hear more. He was not used to women, and an angry woman was the most formidable thing to him in the world. Nan's flashing eyes and menacing attitude were sufficient warning of the coming tempest, and he wisely hastened away before it should burst upon his head. Gertie had ceased crying when he came out, and looked up into his face with the greatest interest. Well, said he, she says you shan't come back. Oh, I'm so glad, said Gertie. But where'll you go to? I don't know. Perhaps I'll go with you, and see you light the lamps. But where'll you sleep to-night? I don't know where. I haven't got any house. I guess I'll sleep out, where I can see the stars. I don't like dark places. But it'll be cold, won't it? My goodness, you'll freeze to death, child. Well, what'll become of me then? The Lord only knows. True looked at Gertie, in perfect wonder and distress. He knew nothing about children, and was astonished at her simplicity. He could not leave her there such a cold night, but he hardly knew what he could do with her if he took her home, for he lived alone and was poor. But another violent coughing spell decided him at once to share with her his shelter, fire, and food, for one night at least. So he took her by the hand, saying, Come with me, and Gertie ran along confidently by his side, never asking whither. True had about a dozen more lamps to light before they reached the end of the street, when his round of duty was finished. Gertie watched him light each one with as keen an interest as if that were the only object for which she was in his company, and it was only after they had reached the corner of the street and walked on for some distance without stopping that she inquired where they were going. "'Going home,' said True. "'Am I going to your home?' said Gertie. "'Yes,' said True, "'and here it is.' He opened a little gate close to the sidewalk. It led into a small and very narrow yard, which stretched along the whole length of a decent two-storied house. True lived in the back part of the house, so they went through the yard, passed by several windows and the main entrance, and keeping on to a small door in the rear, opened it and went in. Gertie was by this time trembling with the cold. Her little bare feet were quite blue from walking so far on the pavements. There was a stove in the room into which they had entered, but no fire in it. It was a large room, and looked as if it might be pretty comfortable, though it was very untidy. True made as much haste as he could to dispose of his ladder, torch, etc., in an adjoining shed, and then, bringing in a handful of wood, he lit a fire in the stove. In a few minutes there was a bright blaze, and the chilly atmosphere grew warm. Drawing an old wooden settle up to the fire, he threw his shaggy greatcoat over it, and lifting little Gertie up, he placed her gently upon the comfortable seat. He then went to work to get supper, for True was an old bachelor, and accustomed to do everything for himself. He made tea, then mixing a great mugful for Gertie, with plenty of sugar, and all his cents worth of milk, he produced from a little cupboard a loaf of bread, cut her a huge slice, and pressed her to eat and drink as much as she could, for he judged well when he concluded, from her looks, that she had not always been well fed, and so much satisfaction did he feel in her evident enjoyment of the best meal she had ever had, that he forgot to partake of it himself, but sat watching her with a tenderness which proved that the unerring instinct of childhood had not been wanting in Gertie, when she felt, as she watched True about his work, so long before he ever spoke to her, that he was a friend of everybody, even to the most forlorn little girl in the world. Truman Flint was born and brought up in New Hampshire, but when fifteen years old, being left an orphan, he had made his way to Boston, where he supported himself for many years, by whatever employment he could obtain, having been, at different times, a newspaper carrier, a cab driver, a porter, a woodcutter, indeed, a jack at all trades. And so honest, capable, and good-tempered, had he always shown himself, that he everywhere won a good name and had sometimes continued for years in the same employ. Previous to his entering upon the service in which we find him, he had been for some time a porter in a large store, owned by a wealthy and generous merchant. 
Being one day engaged in removing some heavy casks, he had the misfortune to be severely injured by one of them falling upon his chest. For a long time no hope was entertained of his recovering from the effects of the accident, and when he at last began to mend, his health returned so gradually that it was a year before he was able to be at work again. This sickness swallowed up the savings of years, but his late employer never allowed him to want for any comforts, provided an excellent physician, and saw that he was well taken care of. True, however, had never been the same man since. He rose up from his sickbed ten years older in constitution, and his strength so much enfeebled that he was only fit for some comparatively light employment. It was then that his kind friend and former master obtained for him the situation he now held as lamplighter, in addition to which he frequently earned considerable sums by sawing wood, shoveling snow, etc. He was now between fifty and sixty years old, a stoutly built man, with features cut in one of nature's rough moulds, but expressive of much good nature. He was naturally silent and reserved, lived much by himself, was known to but few people in the city, and had only one crony, the sexton of a neighboring church, a very old man, and one usually considered very cross-grained and uncompanionable. But we left Gertie finishing her supper, and now, when we return to her, she is stretched upon the wide settle, sound asleep, covered up with a warm blanket, and her head resting upon a pillow. True sits beside her. Her little thin hand lies in his great palm. Occasionally he draws the blanket closer round her. She breathes hard. Suddenly she gives a nervous start, then speaks quickly. Her dreams are evidently troubled. True listens intently to her words, as she exclaims, eagerly, "'Oh, don't drown my kitty!' and then again, in a voice of fear, "'Oh, she'll catch me, she'll catch me!' once more, and now her tones are touchingly plaintive and earnest. "'Dear, dear, good old man, let me stay with you, do let me stay!' Great tears are in Truman Flint's eyes, and rolling down the furrows of his rough cheeks. He lays his great head on the pillow, and draws Gertie's little face close to his, at the same time smoothing her long, uncombed hair with his hand. He, too, is thinking aloud. What does he say? Catch you? No, she shan't. Stay with me? So you shall, I promise you, poor little birdie. All alone in this big world, and so am I. Please, God, we'll bide together. End of chapter 3「4 of the Lamplighter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bridget Gage. The Lamplighter by Maria Susanna Cummins. Chapter 4. In age, in infancy, from others' aid, is all our hope to teach us to be kind, that nature's first, last lesson to mankind. Young. Little Gertie had found a friend and a protector, and it was well she had for suffering and neglect had well nigh cut short her sad existence, and ended all her sorrows. The morning after True took her home, she woke in a high fever, her head and limbs aching, and with every symptom of severe illness. She looked around, and found she was alone in the room, but there was a good fire, and preparation for some breakfast. For a moment or two she was puzzled to know where she was, and what had happened to her, for the room seemed quite strange, now that she first saw it by daylight. A look of happiness passed over her little sick face when she recalled the events of the previous night, and thought of kind old True and the new home she had found with him. She got up and went to the window to look out, though her head was strangely giddy, and she tottered so that she could hardly walk. The ground was covered with snow, and it was still stormy without. It seemed as if the snow dazzled Gertie's eyes, for she suddenly found herself quite blinded. Her head grew dizzy. She staggered and fell. Truman came in, a moment after, and was very much frightened at seeing Gertie stretched upon the floor, but soon found out the real state of the case, for he had made up his mind during the night that she was a very sick child, and was not surprised that she had fainted in endeavoring to walk. He placed her in bed, and soon succeeded in restoring her to consciousness. But for three weeks from that time she never sat up, except when True held her in his arms. True was a rough and clumsy man about most things, but not so in the care of his little charge. He knew a good deal about sickness, was something of a doctor and nurse in his simple way, 
and, though he had never had much to do with children, his warm heart was a trusty guide, and taught him all that was necessary for Gertie's comfort, and far, far more kindness than she had ever experienced before. Gertie was very patient. She would sometimes lie awake whole nights, suffering from pain and extreme weariness at her long confinement to a sick-bed, without uttering a groan, or making any noise, lest she might waken True, who slept on the floor beside her, when he could so far forget his anxiety about her as to sleep at all. Sometimes when she was in great pain, True had carried her in his arms for hours. But even then Gertie would try to appear relieved, before she really was so, and even feign sleep, that he might put her back to bed again, and take some rest himself. Her little heart was full of love and gratitude to her kind protector, and she spent much of her time in thinking what she could ever do for him when she got well, and wondering whether she were capable of ever learning to do any good thing at all. True was often obliged to leave her, to attend to his work, and during the first week of her sickness she was much alone, though everything she could possibly want was put within her reach, and many a caution given to her to keep still in bed until his return. At last, however, she grew delirious, and for some days had no knowledge how she was taken care of. One day, after a long and quiet sleep, she woke quite restored to sense and consciousness, and saw a woman sitting by her bedside sewing. She sprang up in bed to look at the stranger, who had not observed her open her eyes, but who started the moment she heard her move, and exclaimed, "'Oh, lie down, my child, lie down!' at the same time laying her hand gently upon her, to enforce the injunction. "'I don't know you,' said Gertie. "'Where's my Uncle True?' For that was the name by which True had told her to call him. "'He's gone out, dear. He'll be home soon. How do you feel? Better?' "'Oh, yes, much better. Have I been asleep long?' "'Some time. Lie down now, and I'll bring you some gruel. It will be good for you.' "'Does Uncle True know you are here?' "'Yes. I came in to sit with you while he was away.' "'Came in? From where?' "'From my room. I live in the other part of the house.' "'I think you're very good,' said Gertie. "'I like you. I wonder why I did not see you when you came in.' "'You were too sick, dear, to notice, but I think you'll soon be better now.' The woman prepared her gruel, and after Gertie had taken it, reseated herself at her work. Gertie lay down in bed, with her face towards her new friend, and fixing her large eyes upon her, watched her some time, while she sat sewing. At last the woman looked up and said, "'Well, what do you think I'm making?' "'I don't know,' said Gertie. "'What are you?' The woman held up her work, so that Gertie could see it was a dark calico frock for a child. "'Oh, what a nice gown,' said Gertie. "'Who is it for? Your little girl?' "'No,' said the woman. "'I haven't got any little girl. I've only got one child. My boy, Willie.' "'Willie. That's a pretty name,' said Gertie. "'Is he a good boy?' "'Good?' "'He's the best boy in the world, and the handsomest,' answered the woman, her pale, careworn face lit up with all a mother's pride. Gertie turned away, and a look so unnaturally sad for a child came over her countenance, that the woman, looking up, thought she was getting tired, and ought to be kept very quiet. She told her so, and bade her to shut up her eyes and go to sleep again. Gertie obeyed the first injunction, and lay so still that the latter seemed in a fair way to be fulfilled when the door opened gently, and True came in. "'Oh, Miss Sullivan,' said he, "'you're still here. "'I'm very much obliged to you for staying. "'I hadn't calculated to be gone so long. "'And how does the child seem to be, marm?' "'Much better, Mr. Flint. "'She's come to her reason, and I think, with care, "'will do very well now. "'Oh, she's awake,' she added, "'seeing Gertie open her eyes. "'True came up to the bedstead, "'stroked back her hair, "'now cut short and neatly arranged, "'felt of her pulse,' and nodded his head satisfactorily. Gertie caught his great hand between both of hers, and held it tight. He sat down on the side of the bed, and glancing at Mrs. Sullivan's work, said, "'I shouldn't be surprised if she needed her new clothes sooner than we thought for, marm. It's my opinion we'll have her up and about afore many days.' "'So I was thinking,' said Mrs. Sullivan. "'But don't be in too great a hurry. She's had a very severe sickness, and her recovery must be gradual. Did you see Miss Graham to-day?' "'Yes, I did see her, poor thing. "'The Lord bless her sweet face. "'She axed a sight o' questions about little Gertie here, "'and gave me this parcel of arrowroot, I think she called it. "'She says it's excellent in sickness.' 
"'Did you ever fix any, Miss Sullivan, so that you can just show me how, if you'll be so good? "'For I declare I don't remember, though she took a deal of pains to tell me. "'Oh, yes, it's very easy. I'll come in and prepare some by and by. "'I don't think Gertie'll want any at present. She's just had some gruel. "'But father has come home, and I must be seeing about our tea. "'I'll come in again this evening, Mr. Flint. "'Thank you, marm, thank you. You're very kind.' During the few following days, Mrs. Sullivan came in and sat with Gertie several times. She was a gentle, subdued sort of woman, with a placid face, that was very refreshing to a child that had long lived in fear and suffered a great deal of abuse. She always brought her work with her, which was usually some child's garment that she was making. One evening, when Gertie had nearly recovered from her tedious fever, she was sitting in True's lap by the stove fire, carefully wrapped up in a blanket. She had been talking to him about her new acquaintance and friend. Suddenly looking up in his face, she said, "'Uncle True, do you know what little girl she's making a gown for?' "'For a little girl,' said True, "'that needs a gown, and a good many other things, "'for she hasn't got any clothes, as I know on, except a few old rags. "'Do you know any such little girl, Gertie?' "'I guess I do,' said Gertie, with her head a little on one side, and a very knowing look. "'Well, where is she? Ain't she in your lap?' "'What? You? Why, do you think Mrs. Sullivan would spend her time making clothes for you?' "'Well,' said Gertie, hanging her head, "'I shouldn't think she would. But then you said—' "'Well, what did I say? Something about new clothes for me.' "'So I did,' said True, giving her a rough hug. "'And they are for you. Two whole suits, and shoes and stockings into the bargain.' Gertie opened her large eyes in amazement, laughed and clapped her hands. True laughed, too. They both seemed very happy. "'Did she buy them, Uncle True? Is she rich?' said Gertie. "'Miss Sullivan? No, indeed,' said True. "'Miss Graham bought em, and is going to pay Miss Sullivan for making them.' "'Who is Miss Graham?' "'She's a lady too good for this world, that's sartin. "'I'll tell you about her some time. "'But I better not now, I guess. "'It's time you were abed and asleep.' "'One Sabbath, after Gertie was nearly well, "'she was so much fatigued with sitting up all day "'that she went to bed before dark.' and for two or three hours slept very soundly. On awaking, she saw that True had company. An old man, much older, she thought, than True, was sitting on the opposite side of the stove, smoking a pipe. His dress, though of ancient fashion, and homely in its materials, was very neat, and his hair, of which he had but little, and that perfectly white, growing in two long locks just behind his ears, was nicely combed up and tied on the top of his head, which was elsewhere bald and shiny. He had sharp features, and Gertie thought, from his looks, it must be easy for him to say sharp things. Indeed, rather hard for him to say anything pleasant. There was a sarcastic expression about the corners of his mouth, and a disappointed look in his whole face, which Gertie observed, though she could not have defined, and from which she drew her conclusions with regard to his temper. She rightly conjectured that he was Mrs. Sullivan's father, Mr. Cooper, and in the opinion she formed of him, from her first observation, she did not widely differ from most other people who knew the old church sexton. But both his own face and public opinion somewhat wronged him. It was true his was not a genial nature. Domestic trials, and the unkindness and fickleness of fortune, had caused him to look upon the dark side of life, to dwell upon its sorrows, and frown upon the bright hopes of the young and the gay, who, as he was wont to say, with a mysterious shake of his head, knew but little of the world. The occupation, too, which had of late been his, was not calculated to counteract a disposition to melancholy. His duties in the church were mostly solitary, and as he was much withdrawn in his old age from intercourse with the world at large, he had become severe toward its follies, and unforgiving towards its crimes. There was much that was good and benevolent in him, however, and True Flint knew it, and loved to draw it out. True liked the old man's sincerity and honesty, and many a Sabbath evening had they sat by that same fireside, and discussed all those questions of public policy, national institutions, and individual rights, which every American feels called upon to take under his especial consideration, besides many matters of private feeling and interest, without their friendly relations being once disturbed or endangered. And this was the more remarkable— insomuch as Truman Flint was the very reverse of old Paul Cooper in disposition and temper, being hopeful and sanguine, always disposed to look upon the bright side of things, and however discouraging they might seem, 
ever averring that it was his opinion to what all come out right at last. On the evening of which we are speaking, they had been talking on several of their usual topics. But when Gertie awoke, she found herself the subject of conversation. Of course, she soon became deeply interested. "'Where,' said Mr. Cooper, "'did you say you picked her up?' "'At Nan Grant's,' said True. "'Don't you remember her? "'She's the same woman whose son you were called up to witness against, "'at the time the church windows were broken, "'the night afore the Fourth of July. "'You can't have forgotten her at the trial, Cooper, "'for she blew you up with a vengeance, "'and didn't spare his honour the judge either. "'Well, t'was just such a rage she was in with this air child, "'the first time I see her, "'and the second time she'd just turned her out of doors.' "'Ah, yes, I remember the she-bear. "'I shouldn't suppose she'd be any too gentle to her own child, "'much less a stranger's. "'But what are you going to do with the foundling, Flint?' "'Do with her? "'Keep her, to be sure, and take care on her.' "'Cooper laughed rather sarcastically. "'Well, now, I suppose, neighbor, "'you think it is rather freakish in me "'to be adopting a child at my time of life. "'And perhaps it is. "'But I'll explain to you just how t'was. She'd a died that night, I tell yer on, if I hadn't brought her home with me, and a good many times since. What's more, if I, with the help of your daughter, hadn't took mighty good care of her. Well, she took on so in her sleep the first night ever she came, and cried out to me, all as if she'd never had a friend afore, and I doubt me she never had, that I made up my mind then she should stay, at any rate, and I'd take care on her, and share my last crust with the wee thing, come what might." THE LORD'S BEEN VERY MERCIFUL TO ME, MR. COOPER, VERY MERCIFUL. HE'S RAISED ME UP FRIENDS IN MY DEEP DISTRESS. I KNEW, WHEN I WAS A LITTLE SHAVER, WHAT A LONESOME THING IT WAS TO BE FATHERLESS AND MOTHERLESS. AND WHEN I SEE THIS LITTLE SUFFERING HUMAN BEING, I FELT AS IF, ALL FRIENDLESS AS SHE SEEMED, SHE WAS MORE PARTICULARLY THE LORD'S, AND AS IF I COULD NOT SARVE HIM MORE, AND OUGHT NOT TO SARVE HIM LESS, THAN TO SHARE WITH HER THE BLESSINGS HE HAS BESTOWED ON ME. "'You look round, neighbor, as if you thought wasn't much to share with any one. "'And tain't much there is here, to be sure. "'But it's a home, yes, a home, and that's a great thing to her that never had one. "'I've got my hands yet, and a stout heart, and a will in mind. "'With God's help, I'll be a father to that child, "'and the time may come when she'll be God's embodied blessing to me.' "'Mr. Cooper shook his head doubtfully, and muttered something about children.' even one's own, not being apt to prove blessings. But he had not power to shake Truman's high faith in the wisdom, as well as righteousness, of his own proceedings. He had risen in the earnestness with which he had spoken, and after pacing the room hastily and with excitement, he returned to his seat and said, "'Besides, neighbor Cooper, if I had not made up my mind the night Gertie came here, I wouldn't have sent her away after the next day.' For the Lord, I think, spoke to me by the mouth of one of his holy angels, and bade me persevere in my resolution. You've seen Miss Graham. She goes to your church regular, with the fine old gentleman, her father. I was at their house shoveling snow, after the great storm, three weeks since, and she sent for me to come into the kitchen. Well may I bless her angel face, poor thing. If the world is dark to her, she makes it light to other folks. She cannot see heaven's sunshine outside. "'but she's better off than most people, "'for she's got it in her, I do believe, "'and when she smiles it lets the glory out, "'and looks like God's rainbow in the clouds. "'She's done me many a kindness, "'since I got hurt so bad in her father's store, "'now some five years gone, "'and she sent for me that day, to ask how I did, "'and if there was anything I wanted "'that she could speak to the master about. "'So I told her all about little Gertie, "'and I tell you, she and I both cried for I'd done. "'She put some money into my hand, and told me to get Miss Sullivan to make some clothes for Gertie. More than that, she promised to help me if I got into trouble with the care of her. And when I was going away, she said, I'm sure you've done quite right, True. The Lord will bless and reward your kindness to that poor child. True was so excited and animated by his subject, that he did not notice what the sexton had observed, but did not choose to interrupt. Gertie had risen from her bed, and was standing beside True, her eyes fixed upon his face, breathless with the interest she felt in his words. She touched his shoulder. He looked round, saw her, and stretched out his arms. She sprang into them, buried her face in his bosom, and bursting into a paroxysm of joyful tears, gasped out the words, Shall I stay with you always? Yes, just as long as I live, said True, you shall be my child. End of chapter 4
Chapter Five of the Lamplighter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bridget Gage. The Lamplighter by Maria Susanna Cummins. Chapter Five. A light, busy foot astir in her small housewifery, the blithest bee that ever wrought in hive. Mitford. It was a stormy evening. Gertie was standing at the window, watching for True's return from his lamplighting. She was neatly and comfortably dressed her hair smooth, her face and hands clean. She was now quite well, better than for years before her sickness. Care and kindness had done wonders for her, and though still a pale and rather slender-looking child, with eyes and mouth disproportionately large to her other features, the painful look of suffering she had been wont to wear had given place to a happy, though rather grave, expression. On the wide window-sill in front of her sat a plump and venerable cat, parent to Gertie's lost darling, and for that reason very dear to her. She was quietly stroking its back, while the constant purring that the old veteran kept up proved her satisfaction at the arrangement. Suddenly a rumbling, tumbling sound was heard in the wall. The house was old, and furnished with ample accommodations for rats, who seemed, from the noise, to have availed themselves of this fact to give a ball. Such an excitement were they manifesting." One would almost have thought a chimney was falling down, brick by brick. It did not alarm Gertie, however. She was used to old, rat-inhabited walls, and too much accustomed to hearing such sounds all around her, when she slept in the garret at Nan Grant's, to be disturbed by them. Not so, however, with the ancient Grimalkin, who pricked up her ears and gave every sign of a disposition to rush into battle. No war-horse could have been more excited by the sound of the trumpet than was Puss at the rushing of her foes through the ceiling. "'Lie still, pussy,' said Gertie. "'Lie still, I say. Don't you be running off after rats. You must sit up straight and be good, till you see Uncle True coming, so's to hear what he'll say when he sees the room and me.' Here Gertie turned and glanced around the room with an air of infinite satisfaction, then clambering upon the wide, old-fashioned window-sill, where she could see up the yard, and have a full view of the lamplighter the moment he entered the gate. She took the cat in her arms, smoothed down her dress, gave a look of interest and pride at her shoes and stockings, and then composed herself, with a determined effort to be patient. It would not do, however, she could not be patient. It seemed to her that he never came so late before, and she was just beginning to think he would never come at all, when he turned into the gate. It was nearly dark, but Gertie could see that there was some person with him. He did not look tall enough to be Mr. Cooper, and did not step like him, but she concluded it must be he, for whoever it was stopped at his door further up the yard, and went in. Impatient as Gertie had been for True's arrival, she did not run to meet him as usual, but waited in a listening attitude, until she heard him come in through the shed, where he was in the habit of stopping to hang up his ladder and lantern, and remove the soiled frock and overalls, which he wore outside his clothes when about his work. She then ran and hid behind the door by which he must enter the room, she evidently had some great surprise in store for him, and meant to enjoy it to the utmost. The cat, not being so full of the matter, whatever it was, was more mindful of her manners, and went to meet him, rubbing her head against his legs, which was her customary welcome. "'Hello, Whiskers,' said True. "'Where's my little gal?' He shut the door behind him as he spoke, thus disclosing Gertie to view. She sprang forward with a bound, laughed, and looked first at her own clothes, and then in True's face, to see what he would think of her appearance. "'Well, I declare,' said he, lifting her up in his arms, and carrying her nearer to the light. "'Little folks do look famous. New gown, apron, shoes, got em all on. And who fixed your hair? My, you ain't none too handsome, sartin, but you do look famous nice. Mrs. Sullivan dressed me all up and brushed my hair. And more, too. Don't you see what else she has done?' True followed Gertie's eyes as they wandered around the room. He looked amazed enough to satisfy her anticipations, great as they had been, and no wonder. He had been gone since morning, and things had indeed undergone a transformation. Woman's hands had evidently been at work, clearing up and setting to rights. Until Gertie came to live with True, his home had never been subjected to female intrusion. Living wholly by himself, and entertaining scarcely any visitors, it had been his habit to make himself comfortable in his own way, utterly regardless of appearances. In his humble apartment sweeping day came but seldom, and spring cleaning was unknown. Two large windows, facing the yard, 
were treated with great injustice, the cheerful light they were capable of affording being half obscured by dirt and smoke. The corners of the ceiling were festooned with cobwebs. The high, broad mantelpiece had accumulated a curious medley of things useful and useless, while there was no end to the rubbish that had collected under the stove. Then the furniture, some of which was very good, was adjusted in the most inconvenient manner, and in a way to turn the size of the room to the least possible advantage. During Gertie's illness, a bed made up on the floor for True's use, and the various articles which had been required in her sick room, had increased the clutter to such an extent that one almost needed a pilot to conduct him in safety through the apartment. Now Mrs. Sullivan was the soul of neatness. Her rooms were like waxwork. Her own dress was almost Quaker-like in its extreme simplicity, and freedom from the least speck or stain. No one could meet her old father or her young son, even in their working dress, without perceiving at once the evidence of a careful daughter and mother's handiwork. It was to nurse Gertie, and to take care of her in True's absence, that she first entered a room so much the reverse of her own. And it is not easy to appreciate the degree in which the virtue and charity of her doing so was enhanced, unless one can realize how painful the contrast was to her, and how excessively annoying she found it, to spend sometimes a whole afternoon in a room which, as she expressed herself afterwards at home, it would have been a real pleasure to her to clear up and put to rights, if it were only to see how it would look, and whether anybody would recognize it. Mrs. Sullivan was a little bit of a woman, but had more capability and energy than could have been found in any one among twenty others twice her size. She really pitied those whose home was such a mass of confusion. She felt sure that they could not be happy, and inwardly determined, as soon as Gertie got well, to exert herself in the cause of cleanliness and order, which was in her eyes the cause of virtue and happiness. So completely did she identify outward neatness and purity with inward peace. She pondered in her own mind how she could broach the subject of a renovation in his affairs to true himself, without wounding his feelings. For she herself was so sensitive on a point of neatness, that she imagined he must be somewhat the same. And the little woman, being as tender-hearted as she was tidy, would not have mortified him for the world, when a mode of action was suggested to her by Gertie herself. On the day previous to that on which the great cleaning operations took place, Gertie was observed by Mrs. Sullivan standing in the passage near her door, and looking shyly but wistfully in. "'Come in, Gertie,' said the kind little woman. "'Come in and see me. Here,' added she, seeing how timid the child felt about intruding herself into a strange room. "'You may sit up here by the table and see me iron. This is your own little dress. I am smoothing it out, and then your things will be all done.' "'You'll be glad of some new clothes, shan't you?' "'Very glad, marm,' said Gertie. "'Am I to take them away, and keep them all myself?' "'Yes, indeed,' said Mrs. Sullivan. "'I don't know where I'll put em all. "'There ain't no place in our room. "'At least, no very nice place,' said Gertie, "'glancing with admiration at the open drawer, "'in which Mrs. Sullivan was now placing the little dress, "'adding it to a pile of neatly folded garments. "'Why, part of them, you know, you'll be wearing,' said Mrs. Sullivan.' and we must find some good place for the rest. "'You've got good places for things,' said Gertie, looking round the room. "'This is a very beautiful room, isn't it?' "'Why, it isn't very different from Mr. Flint's. It's just about the same size, and two front windows like his. My cupboard is the best. Yours is only a three-cornered one. But that's about all the difference. Oh, but then yours don't look one bit like ours. You haven't got any bed here, and all the chairs stand in a row, and the table shines.' and the floor is so clean, and the stove is new, and the sun comes in so bright. Oh, I wish our room was like this. I shouldn't think ours was more than half as big, either. Why, Uncle True stumbled over the tongs this morning, and he said there wasn't room there to swing a cat. Where were the tongs? said Mrs. Sullivan. About in the middle of the floor, marm. Well, you see I don't keep things in the middle of the floor. I think, if your room were all cleaned up, and places found for everything, it would look almost as well as mine. "'I wish it could be fixed up nice,' said Gertie. "'But what could be done with those beds?' "'I've been thinking about that. "'There's that little pantry, or bathing-room. "'I think it must have been once, when this house was new, "'and rich people lived in it. "'That's large enough to hold a small bedstead and a chair or two. "'Twould be quite a comfortable little chamber for you. "'There's nothing in it but rubbish that might just as well be thrown away. "'Or, if it were good for anything, put in the shed.' 
"'Oh, that'll be nice,' said Gertie. "'Then Uncle True can have his bed back again, and I'll sleep on the floor in there.' "'No,' said Mrs. Sullivan. "'It won't be necessary for you to sleep on the floor. "'I've got a very good little cross-legged bedstead "'that my Willie slept on when he lived at home. "'And I will lend it to you, "'if you'll try to take good care of it, "'and of everything else that is put into your room.' "'Oh, I will,' said Gertie. "'But can I?' added she, hesitating. "'Do you think I can? "'I don't know how to do anything.' "'You never have been taught to do anything, my child. "'But a girl eight years old can do a great many things.' if she is patient and tries hard to learn. I could teach you to do a great deal that would be useful, and that would help your Uncle True very much. What could I do? You could sweep the room up every day. You could make the beds, after a fashion, with a little help in turning them. You could set the table, toast the bread, and wash the dishes. Perhaps you would not do these things in the best manner at first, but you would keep improving, and by and by get to be quite a nice little housekeeper." "'Oh, I wish I could do something for Uncle True,' said Gertie. "'But how could I ever begin? "'In the first place, you must have things cleaned up for you. "'If I thought Mr. Flint would like it, "'I'd get Kate McCarty to come in some day and help us, "'and I think we could make a great improvement in his house.' "'Oh, I know he'd like it,' said Gertie. "'Twould be grand. "'May I help? "'Yes, you may do what you can, "'but Kate'll be the best hand. "'She's strong, and knows how to do cleaning very well. "'Who's she?' said Gertie. Kate, she's Mrs. McCarty's daughter in the next house. Mr. Flint does them many a good turn, saws wood and so on. They do most of his washing, but they can't half pay him all the kindness he's done that family. Kate's a clever girl. She'll be glad to come and work for him any day. I'll ask her. Will she come tomorrow? Perhaps she will. Uncle True's going to be gone all day tomorrow, said Gertie. He's going to get in Mr. Eustace's coal. Wouldn't it be a good time? Very, said Mrs. Sullivan. I'll try and get Kate to come tomorrow. Kate came. The room was thoroughly cleaned and put in complete order. Gertie's new clothes were delivered over to her own keeping. She was neatly dressed in one suit, the other placed in a little chest which was found in the pantry and which accommodated her small wardrobe very well. It was the result of all Mrs. Sullivan's, Kate's, and Gertie's combined labor, which called forth True's astonishment on his return from his work and the pleasure he manifested made the day a memorable one in Gertie's life, one to be marked in her memory as long as she lived, as being the first in which she had known that happiness, perhaps the highest earth affords, of feeling that she had been instrumental in giving joy to another. Not that Gertie's assistance had been of any great value, or that all could not have been done as well, or even better, if she had been where Nan Grant always put her, out of the way. But the child did not realize that. She had been one of the laborers. She had entered heart and soul into every part of the work. Wherever she had been allowed to lend a helping hand, she had exerted her whole strength. She could say with truth, We did it, Mrs. Sullivan, Kate, and I. None but a loving heart, like Mrs. Sullivan's, would have understood and sympathized in the feeling which made Gertie so eager to help. But she did, and allotted to her many little services— which the child felt herself more blessed in being permitted to perform than she would have done at almost any gift or favor that could have been bestowed upon her. She led True about, to show him how judiciously and ingeniously Mrs. Sullivan had contrived to make the most of the room and the furniture, how by moving the bed into a deep recess, which was just wide enough for it, she had reserved the whole square area, and made, as True declared, a parlor of it, it was some time before he could be made to believe that half his property had not been spirited away, so incomprehensible was it to him that so much additional space and comfort could be acquired by a little system and order. But his astonishment and Gertie's delight reached their climax, when she introduced him into the former lumber closet, now transformed into a really snug and comfortable bedroom. "'Well, I declare! Well, I declare!' was all the old man could seem to say. He sat down beside the stove, now polished, and made, as Gertie declared, new, just like Mrs. Sullivan's, rubbed his hands together, for they were cold with being out in the frosty evening, and then spreading them in front of the fire, took a general view of his reformed domicile, and of Gertie, who, according to Mrs. Sullivan's careful instructions, was preparing to set the table and toast the bread for supper. 
She was standing on a chair, taking down the cups and saucers from among the regular rows of dishes, shining in the three-cornered cupboard, having already deposited on the lower shelf, where she could reach it from the floor, a plate containing some smoothly cut slices of bread, which the thoughtful Mrs. Sullivan had prepared for her. True watched her motions for a minute or two, and then indulged in a short soliloquy. "'Mrs. Sullivan's a clever woman, sartin, and they've made my old house here complete.' and Gertie's gettin' to be like the apple of my eye, and I'm as happy a man as... End of chapter 5"'and say, Peace, be still. "'Cowper. "'Here True was interrupted. "'Quick, noisy footsteps in the passage "'were followed by a sudden and unceremonious opening of the door. "'Here, Uncle True,' said the newcomer. "'Here's your package. "'You forgot all about it, I guess, "'and I forgot it, too, "'till Mother saw it on the table, where I'd laid it down. "'I was so taken up with just coming home, you know.' "'Of course, of course,' said True. "'Much obliged to you, Willie, for fetching it for me.' It's pretty brittle stuff it's made of, and most like I should have smashed it for I got it home. What is it? I've been wondering. Why, it's a little knick-knack I brought home for Gertie. Here, that— Willie, Willie, called Mrs. Sullivan from the opposite room. Have you been to tea, dear? No, indeed, mother, have you? Why, yes, but I'll get you some. No, no, said True. Stay and take tea with us, Willie. Take tea here, my boy. "'My little Gertie is makin' some famous toast, "'and I'll put the tea as steep in presently.' "'So I will,' said Willie. "'I should like to first-rate. "'No matter about any supper for me, mother. "'I'm going to have my tea here, with Uncle True. "'Come now, let's see what's in the bundle. "'But first I want to see little Gertie. "'Mother's been telling me about her. "'Where is she? Has she got well? "'She's been very sick, hasn't she?' "'Oh, yes, she's nicely now,' said True. "'Here, Gertie, look here.' "'Why, where is she?' "'There she is, hiding up behind the settle,' said Willie, laughing. "'She ain't afraid of me, is she?' "'Well, I didn't know as she was shy,' said True. "'You silly little girl,' added he, going towards her. "'Come out here and see Willie. This is Willie Sullivan.' "'I don't want to see him,' said Gertie. "'Don't want to see Willie,' said True. "'Why, you don't even know what you're saying. "'Willie's the best boy that ever was.' "'I spect you and he'll be great friends by and by.' "'He won't like me,' said Gertie. "'I know he won't.' "'Why shan't I like you?' said Willie, approaching the corner where Gertie had hid herself. Her face was covered with her hands, according to her usual fashion when anything distressed her. "'I guess I shall like you first rate when I see you.' He stooped down as he spoke, for he was much taller than Gertie, and taking her hands directly down from her face, and holding them tight in his own, he fixed his eyes full upon her, and, nodding pleasantly, said, "'How do you do, Cousin Gertie? How do you do?' "'I ain't your cousin,' said Gertie. "'Yes, you are,' said Willie, decidedly. "'Uncle True's your uncle, and mine too, so we're cousins, don't you see? And I want to get acquainted.' Gertie could not resist Willie's good-natured words and manner. She suffered him to draw her out of the corner, and towards the lighter end of the room— as she came near the lamp, she tried to free her hands, in order to cover her face up again. But Willie would not let her, and, attracting her attention to the unopened package, and exciting her curiosity as to what it might contain, he succeeded in diverting her thoughts from herself, so that in a few minutes she seemed quite at her ease. "'There, Uncle True says it's for you,' said Willie, "'and I can't think what tis. Can you? Feel, it's hard as can be.' Gertie felt, and looked up wonderingly in True's face. "'Undo it, Willie,' said True. Willie produced a knife, cut the string, took off the paper, and disclosed one of those white plaster images, so familiar to every one, representing the little Samuel in an attitude of devotion. "'Oh, how pretty!' exclaimed Gertie, full of delight. "'Why didn't I think?' said Willie. "'I might have known what twas by the feeling.' "'Why, did you ever see it before?' said Gertie. "'Not the same one, but I've seen lots just like it.' "'Have you?' said Gertie. "'I never did. "'I think it's the beautifulest thing that ever was. "'Uncle True, did you say it was for me? "'Where did you get it?' 
It was by an accident I got it. A few minutes before I met you, Willie, I was stoppin' at the corner to light my lamp, when I saw one of those furrin' boys, with a sight o' these sort of things, and some black ones, too, all set up on a board, and he was walkin' with them atop of his head. I was just a-wonderin' how he kept em there, when he hit the board agin my lamp-post, and the first thing I knew, whack, they all went. He'd spilt em every one. Lucky enough for him, there was a great bank of soft snow close to the sidewalk, and the most of em fell into that, and wasn't hurt. Some few went on to the bricks, and were smashed. Well, I kind o' pitied the feller, for it was late, and I thought like enough he hadn't had much luck sellin' of em, to have so many left on his hands. "'On his head, you mean,' said Willie. "'Yes, Master Willie, or on the snow,' said True. "'Anyway, you're a mind to have it.' "'And I know what you did, Uncle True, just as well as if I'd seen you,' said Willie. "'You set your ladder and lantern right down, and went to work helping him pick em all up. "'That's just what you'd be sure to do for anybody. "'I hope, if ever you get into trouble, some of the folks you've helped will be by to make return.' "'This feller, Willie, didn't wait for me to get into trouble. "'He made return right off.' When they were all set right, he bowed, and scraped, and touched his hat to me, as if I'd been the biggest gentleman in the land. Talkin' too, he was, all the time, though I couldn't make out a word of his lingo. And then he insisted on my takin' one of the figures. I wasn't a-goin' to, for I didn't want it, but I happened to think little Gertie might like it. "'Oh, I shall like it,' said Gertie. "'I shall like it better than—no, not better, but almost as well as my kitten.' Not quite as well, because that was alive, and this isn't. But almost. Oh, ain't he a cunning little boy? True, finding that Gertie was wholly taken up with the image, walked away and began to get the tea, leaving the two children to entertain each other. You must take care and not break it, Gertie, said Willie. We had a Samuel once just like it in the shop, and I dropped it out of my hand onto the counter, and broke it into a million pieces. What did you call it? said Gertie. A Samuel. They're all Samuels. What are Samuels? said Gertie. Why, that's the name of the child they're taken for. What do you suppose he's sitting on his knee for? Willie laughed. Why, don't you know? said he. No, said Gertie. What is he? He's praying, said Willie. Is that what he's got his eyes turned up for, too? Yes, of course. He looks up to heaven when he prays. Up to where? To heaven. Gertie looked up at the ceiling, in the direction in which the eyes were turned, then at the figure. She seemed very much dissatisfied and puzzled. "'Why, Gertie,' said Willie, "'I shouldn't think you knew what praying was.' "'I don't,' said Gertie. "'Tell me.' "'Don't you ever pray? Pray to God?' "'No, I don't. Who is God? Where is God?' Willie looked inexpressibly shocked at Gertie's ignorance, and answered, reverently, "'God is in heaven, Gertie.' "'I don't know where that is,' said Gertie. "'I believe I don't know nothing about it.' "'I shouldn't think you did,' said Willie. "'I believe heaven is up in the sky. "'But my Sunday-school teacher says heaven is anywhere goodness is, "'or some such thing,' he said. "'Are the stars in heaven?' said Gertie. "'They look so, don't they?' said Willie. "'They're in the sky, where I always used to think heaven was.' "'I should like to go to heaven,' said Gertie. "'Perhaps if you're good, you will go some time.' "'Can't any but good folks go?' "'No.' "'Then I can't ever go,' said Gertie, mournfully. "'Why not?' said Willie. "'Ain't you good?' "'Oh, no, I'm very bad.' "'What a queer child,' said Willie. "'What makes you think yourself so very bad?' "'Oh, I am,' said Gertie, in a very sad tone. "'I'm the worst of all. "'I'm the worst child in the world.' "'Who told you so?' "'Everybody. "'Nan Grant says so, and she says everybody thinks so.' I know it, too, myself. Is Nan Grant the cross old woman you used to live with? Yes. How did you know she was cross? Oh, my mother's been telling me about her. Well, I want to know if she didn't send you to school or teach you anything. Gertie shook her head. Why, what lots you've got to learn. What did you used to do when you lived there? Nothing. Never did anything, and don't know anything. My gracious! Yes, I do know one thing, said Gertie. I know how to toast bread. Your mother taught me. She let me toast some by her fire. As she spoke, she thought of her own neglected toast, and turned towards the stove. But she was too late. The toast was made, the supper ready, and True was just putting it on the table. Oh, Uncle True, said she, I meant to get the tea. I know it, said True, 
but it's no matter. You can get it tomorrow. The tears came into Gertie's eyes. She looked very much disappointed, but said nothing. They all sat down to supper. Willie put the Samuel in the middle of the table for a center ornament, and told so many funny stories, and said so many pleasant things, that Gertie laughed heartily, forgot that she did not make the toast herself, forgot her sadness, her shyness, even her ugliness and wickedness, and showed herself, for once, a merry child. After tea, she sat beside Willie on the great settle, and in her peculiar way, and with many odd expressions and remarks, gave him a description of her life at Nan Grant's, winding up with a touching account of the death of her kitten. The two children seemed in a fair way to become as good friends as True could possibly wish. True himself sat on the opposite side of the stove, smoking his pipe, his elbows on his knees, his eyes bent on the children, and his ears drinking in all their conversation. He was no restraint upon them. So simple-hearted and sympathizing a being, so ready to be amused and pleased, so slow to blame or disapprove, could never be any check upon the gaiety or freedom of the youngest, most careless spirit. He laughed when they laughed, seemed soberly satisfied, and took long whiffs at his pipe, when they talked quietly and sedately, ceased smoking entirely, letting his pipe rest on his knee, and secretly wiping away a tear when Gertie recounted her childish griefs. He had heard the story before, and he cried then. He often heard it afterwards, but never without crying. After Gertie had closed her tale of sorrows, which was frequently interrupted by Willie's ejaculations of condolence or pity, she sat for a moment without speaking. Then, becoming excited, as her ungoverned and easily roused nature dwelt upon its wrongs, she burst forth in a very different tone from that in which she had been speaking, and commenced uttering the most bitter invectives against Nan Grant, making use of many a rough and coarse term, such as she had been accustomed to hear used by the ill-bred people with whom she had lived. The child's language expressed unmitigated hatred, and even a hope of future revenge. True looked worried and troubled at hearing her talk so angrily. Since he brought her home, he had never witnessed such a display of temper, and had fondly believed that she would always be as quiet and gentle as during her illness and the few weeks subsequent to it. True's own disposition was so placid, amiable, and forgiving, that he could not imagine that any one, and especially a little child, should long retain feelings of anger and bitterness. Gertie had shown herself so mild and patient since she had been with him, so submissive to his wishes, so anxious even to forestall them, that it had never occurred to him to dread any difficulty in the management of the child. Now, however, as he observed her flashing eyes, and noticed the doubling of her little fist, as she menaced Nan with her future wrath, he had an undefined, half-formed presentiment of coming trouble in the control of his little charge, a feeling almost of alarm, lest he had undertaken what he could never perform. For the moment she ceased, in his eyes, to be the pet and plaything he had hitherto considered her. He saw in her something which needed a check, and felt himself unfit to apply it. And no wonder, he was totally unfit to cope with a spirit like Gertie's. It was true he possessed over her one mighty influence, her strong affection for him, which he could not doubt. It was that which made her so submissive and patient in her sickness, so grateful for his care and kindness, so anxious to do something in return. It was that deep love for her first friend, which never wavering, and growing stronger to the last, proved in after years a noble motive for exertion, a worthy incentive to virtue. It was that love, fortified and illumined by a higher light, which came in time to sanctify it, that gave her, while yet a mere girl, a woman's courage, a woman's strength of heart and self-denial. It was that which cheered the old man's latter years, and shed joy on his dying bed. But for the present it was not enough. The kindness she had received for the few weeks past had completely softened Gertie's heart toward her benefactors, but the effect of eight years' mismanagement, ill-treatment, and want of all judicious discipline, could not be done away in that short time. Her unruly nature could not be so suddenly quelled, her better capabilities called into action. The plant that for years has been growing distorted, and dwelling in a barren spot, deprived of life and nourishment, withered in its leaves and blighted in its fruit, cannot at once recover from so cruel a blast. Transplanted to another soil, it must be directed in the right course, Nourished with care, and warmed with heaven's light, ere it can recover from the shock occasioned by its early neglect, 
and find strength to expand its flowers and ripen its fruit. So with little Gertie, a new direction must be given to her ideas, new nourishment to her mind, new light to her soul, ere the higher purposes for which she was created could be accomplished in her. Something of this True felt, and it troubled him. He did not, however, attempt to check the child. He did not know what to do, and so did nothing. Willie tried once or twice to stop the current of her abusive language, but soon desisted, for she did not pay the least attention to him. He could not help smiling at her childish wrath, nor could he resist sympathizing with her in a degree, and almost wishing he could have a brush with Nan himself, and express his opinion of her character in one or two hard knocks. But he had been well brought up by his gentle mother, was conscious that Gertie was exhibiting a very hot temper, and began to understand what made everybody think her so bad. After Gertie had railed about Nan a little while, she stopped of her own accord, though an unpleasant look remained on her countenance, one of her old looks that it was a pity should return, but which always did when she got into a passion. It soon passed away, however, and when, a little later in the evening, Mrs. Sullivan appeared at the door, Gertie looked bright and happy, listened with evident delight, while True uttered warm expressions of thanks for the labor which had been undertaken in his behalf, and, when Willie went away with his mother, said her good night, and asked him to come again so pleasantly, and her eyes looked so bright as she stood holding on to True's hand in the doorway, that Willie said, as soon as they were out of hearing, "'She's a queer little thing, ain't she, mother? But I kind of like her.'" End of chapter 6《ハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデー Leaving very little property for the support of his family, the widow went home to her father, taking her child with her. The old man needed his daughter, for death had made sad inroads in his household since she left it, and he was alone. From that time, the three had lived together in humble comfort, for though poor, industry and frugality secured them from want. Willie was his mother's pride, her hope, her constant thought. She spared herself no toil or care to provide for his physical comfort, his happiness, and his growth in knowledge and virtue. It would have been strange enough if she had not been proud of a boy whose uncommon beauty, winning disposition, and early evidences of a manly and noble nature won him friends even among strangers. He had been a handsome child, but there was that observable in him, now that he had nearly reached his thirteenth year, far excelling the common boyish beauty, which consists merely in curly hair, dark eyes, and rosy cheeks. It was his broad, open forehead, the clearness and calmness of his full gray eye, the expressive mouth, so determined and yet so mild, the well developed figure and ruddy complexion, proclaiming high health, which gave promise of power to the future man. No one could have been in the boy's company half an hour without loving and admiring him. He had a naturally warm hearted, affectionate disposition, which his mother's love and the world's smiles had festered. An unusual flow of animal spirits, tempered by a natural politeness toward his elders and superiors. A quick apprehension, a ready command of language, a sincere sympathy in others' pleasures and pains. In fine, one of those genial natures that wins hearts one knows not how. He was fond of study, and until his twelfth year, his mother kept him constantly at school. The sons of poor parents have, in our large cities, almost every educational advantage that can be obtained by wealth. And Willie, having an excellent capacity, and being constantly encouraged and exhorted by his mother to improve his opportunities to the utmost, had attained a degree of proficiency quite unusual at his age. When he was twelve years old, He had an excellent opportunity to enter into the service of an apothecary, 
who did an extensive business in the city, and wanted a boy to assist in his store. The wages that Mr. Bray offered were not great, but there was the hope of an increased salary, and at any rate, situated as Willie was, it was not a chance to be overlooked. Fond as he was of his books, he had long been eager to be at work, helping to bear the burden of labor in the family. His mother and grandfather assented to the plan, and he gladly accepted Mr. Bray's proposals. He was sadly missed at home, for as he slept at the store during the week, he rarely had much leisure to make even a passing visit to his mother, except on Saturday, when he came home at night and passed Sunday. So Saturday night was Mrs. Sullivan's happy night, and the Sabbath became a more blessed day than ever. When Willie reached his mother's room on the evening of which we have been speaking, he sat down with her and Mr. Cooper, and for an hour conversation was brisk with them. Willie never came home that he had not a great deal to relate concerning the occurrences of the week, many a little anecdote to tell, many a circumstance connected with the shop, the customers, his master the apothecary, and his master's family, with whom he took his meals. Mrs. Sullivan was interested in everything that interested Willie, and it was easy to see that the old grandfather was more entertained by the boy than he was willing to appear. For, though he sat with his eyes upon the floor, and did not seem to listen, he usually heard all that was said, as was often proved afterward by some accidental reference he would make to the subject. He seldom asked questions, and indeed it was not necessary, for Mrs. Sullivan asked enough for them both. He seldom made comments, but would occasionally utter an impatient or contemptuous expression regarding individuals, or the world in general, thereby evidencing that distrust of human nature— that want of confidence in men's honesty and virtue, which formed, as we have said, a marked trait in the old man's character. Willie's spirits would then receive a momentary check, for he loved and trusted everybody, and his grandfather's words, and the tone in which they were spoken, were a damper to his young soul. But with the elasticity of youth and a gay heart, they would soon rebound, and he would go on as before. Willie did not fear his grandfather, who had never been severe to him, never having, indeed, interfered at all with Mrs. Sullivan's management. But he sometimes felt chilled, though he hardly knew why, by his want of sympathy, with his own warm-heartedness. On the present occasion, the conversation having turned at last upon True Flint and his adopted child, Mr. Cooper had been unusually bitter and satirical, and as he took his lamp to go to bed, wound up with remarking that he knew very well Gertie would never be anything but a trouble to Flint, who was a fool not to send her to the almshouse at once. There was a pause after the old man left the room. Then Willie exclaimed, "'Mother, what makes Grandfather hate folks?' "'Why, he don't, Willie.' "'I don't mean exactly hate. I don't suppose he does that, quite. But he doesn't seem to think a great deal of anybody. Do you think he does?' "'Oh, yes, he don't show it much,' said Mrs. Sullivan. "'But he thinks a great deal of you, Willie, "'and he wouldn't have anything happen to me for the world. "'And he likes Mr. Flint, and—' "'Oh, yes, I know that, of course. I don't mean that. "'But he doesn't think there's much goodness in folks, "'and he don't seem to think anybody's going to turn out well, and— "'You're thinking of what he said about little Gertie. "'Well, she ain't the only one. "'That's what made me speak of it now. "'But I've often noticed it before.' "'particularly since I went away from home, and am only here once a week. "'Now you know I think everything of Mr. Bray, "'and when I was telling to-night how much good he did, "'and how kind he was to old Mrs. Morris and her sick daughter, "'grandfather looked just as if he didn't believe it, "'or didn't think much of it, somehow. "'Oh, well, Willie,' said Mrs. Sullivan, "'you mustn't wonder much at that. "'Grandpa's had a good many disappointments. "'You know he thought everything of Uncle Richard.' and there was no end to the trouble he had with him. And there was Aunt Sarah's husband. He seemed to be such a fine fellow when Sally married him. But he cheated Father dreadfully at last, so that he had to mortgage his home in High Street, and finally give it up entirely. He's dead now, and I don't want to say anything against him. But he didn't prove what we expected, and it broke Sally's heart, I think. That was a dreadful trial to Father, for she was the youngest and had always been his pet. And, just after that, Mother was taken down with her death-stroke, and there was a quack doctor prescribed for her, that Father always thought did her more hurt than good. Oh, take it all together, he's had a great deal to make him look on the dark side now. But you mustn't mind it, Willie. You must take care, and turn out well yourself, my son, and then he'll be proud enough. 
He's as pleased as he can be when he hears you praised, and expects great things of you one of these days. Here the conversation ended, but not until the boy had added another to the many resolves already made, that, if his health and strength were spared, he would prove to his grandfather that hopes were not always deceitful, and that fears were sometimes groundless. Oh, what a glorious thing it is for a youth when he has ever present with him a high, a noble, an unselfish motive! What an incentive it is to exertion, perseverance, and self-denial! What a force to urge him on to ever-increasing efforts! Fears that would otherwise appall, discouragements that would dishearten, labors that would weary, obstacles that would dismay, opposition that would crush, temptation that would overcome, all, all lie disarmed and powerless, when, with a single-hearted and worthy aim, he struggles for the victory. And so it is, that those born in honor, wealth, and luxury, seldom achieve greatness. They were not born for labor, and without labor, nothing that is worth having can be won. Why will they not make it their great and absorbing motive, a worthy one it certainly would be, to overcome the disadvantages of their position, and make themselves great, learned, wise, and good, in spite of those riches, that honorable birth, that opportunity for luxurious sloth, which are, in reality, to the clear judging eye of wise men and angels, their deadliest snare. A motive Willie had long had. His grandfather was old, his mother weak, and both poor. He must be the staff of their old age. He must labor for their support and comfort. He must do more. They hoped great things of him. They must not be disappointed. He did not, however, while arming himself for future conflict with the world, forget the present, but sat down and learned his Sunday school lessons, after which, according to custom, he read aloud in the Bible, and then Mrs. Sullivan, laying her hand on the head of her son, offered up a simple, heartfelt prayer for the boy, one of those mother's prayers, which the child listens to with reverence and love, and remembers in the far-off years, one of those prayers which keep men from temptation, and deliver them from evil. After Willie went home that evening, and Gertie was left alone with True, she sat on a low stool beside him for some time, without speaking. Her eyes were intently fixed upon the white image which lay in her lap. That her little mind was very busy, there could be no doubt. For thought was plainly written on her face. True was not often the first to speak, but finding Gertie unusually quiet, he lifted up her chin, looked inquiringly in her face, and then said, "'Well, Willie's a pretty clever sort of a boy, isn't he?' Gertie answered, "'Yes,' without, however, seeming to know what she was saying. "'You like him, don't you?' said True. "'Very much,' said Gertie, in the same absent way. It was not Willie she was thinking of. True waited for Gertie to begin talking about her new acquaintance, but she did not speak for a minute or two. Then, looking up suddenly, she said, "'Uncle True, what say?' What does Samuel pray to God for? True stared. Samuel? Pray? I guess I don't know exactly what you're saying. Why, said Gertie, holding up the image, Willie says this little boy's name is Samuel, and that he sits on his knee, and puts his hand together so, and looks up, because he's praying to God, that lives up in the sky. I don't know what he means. Way up in the sky, do you? True took the image and looked at it attentively. He moved uneasily upon his chair, scratched his head, and finally said, "'Well, I s'pose he's about right. This ere child is prayin', sartin, though I didn't think on it afore. But I don't just know what he calls it a Samuel for. We'll ask him some time.' "'Well, what does he pray for, Uncle True?' "'Oh, he prays to make him good. It makes folks good to pray to God.' "'Can God make folks good?' "'Yes, God is very great.' He can do anything. How can he hear? He hears everything and sees everything in the world. And does he live in the sky? Yes, said True, in heaven. Many more questions Gertie asked, many strange questions that True could not answer, many questions that he wondered he had not oftener asked himself. True had a humble, loving heart and a childlike faith. He had enjoyed but little religious instruction, but he earnestly endeavored to live up to the light he had. Perhaps in his faithful practice of the Christian virtues, and especially in his obedience to the great law of Christian charity, 
he more nearly approached to the spirit of his divine master than many who by daily reading and study are far more familiar with christian doctrines but he had never inquired deeply into the sources of that belief which it had never occurred to him to doubt and he was not at all prepared for the question suggested by the inquisitive keen and newly excited mind of little gertie he answered her as well as he could however and where he was at fault hesitated not to refer her to willie who he told her went to sunday school and knew a wonderful sight about such things all the information that gertie could gain amounted to the knowledge of these facts that god was in heaven that his power was great and that people were made better by prayer her little eager brain was so intent upon the subject however that as it grew late the thought even of sleeping in her new room could not efface it from her mind after she had gone to bed with the white image hugged close to her bosom and true had taken away the lamp she lay for a long time with her eyes wide open just at the foot of the bed was the window gertie could see out as she had done before in her garret at nan grant's but the window being larger she had a much more extended view the sky was bright with stars and the sight of them revived her old wonder and curiosity as to the author of such distant and brilliant lights now however as she gazed there darted through her mind the thought god lit them oh how great he must be but a child might pray to him she rose from her little bed approached the window and falling on her knees and clasping her hands precisely in the attitude of the little samuel she gazed up to heaven she spoke no word but her eyes glistened with the dew of a tear that stood in each was not each tear a prayer she breathed no petition but she longed for god and virtue was not that very wish a prayer her little uplifted heart throbbed vehemently was not each throb a prayer and did not god in heaven without whom not a sparrow falls to the ground hear and accept that first homage of a little untaught child and did it not call a blessing down many a petition did gertie offer up in after years and many a time of trouble did she come to god for help in many an hour of bitter sorrow did she from the same source seek comfort and when her strength and heart failed her god became the strength of her heart but never did she approach his throne with a purer offering a more acceptable sacrifice than when in her first deep penitence her first earnest faith her first enkindled hope she took the attitude and her heart uttered though her lips pronounced them not the words of the prophet child here i am lord end of chapter 7、Chapter、Chapter Chapter 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 True was in the habit of going to church half the day at least with the sexton's family, but Gertie, having no bonnet, could not go, and True would not leave her. So they spent the morning together, wandering round among the wharves and looking at the ships, Gertie wearing her old shawl pinned over her head. In the afternoon, True fell asleep by the fireside, and Gertie played with the cat. Willie came in the evening, but it was only to say good-bye before going back to Mr. Bray's. He was in a hurry, and could not stop at all, for his master had a sober household, and liked to have his doors closed early, especially Sunday night. Old Mr. Cooper, however, made his usual visit, and when he had gone, True, finding Gertie sound asleep on the settle, thought it a pity to wake her, and laid her in bed with her clothes on. She did not wake until morning, and then, much surprised and amused at finding herself dressed, sprung up and ran out to ask True how it happened. True was busy making the fire, and Gertie, having received satisfactory answers to her numerous inquiries, when and where she fell asleep, and how she came in bed, applied herself earnestly to help in every possible way about getting the breakfast and putting the room in order. She followed Mrs. Sullivan's instructions, all of which she remembered. And showed a wonderful degree of capability in everything she undertook. In the course of the few following weeks, during which her perseverance held out surprisingly, she learned how to make herself useful in many ways, and, as Mrs. Sullivan had prophesied, gave promise of becoming one day quite a clever little housekeeper. 
Of course, the services she performed were trifling, but her active and willing feet saved True a great many steps, and she as of essential aid in keeping the rooms neat, that being her especial ambition. She felt that Mrs. Sullivan expected her, now that the dust and cobwebs were all cleared away, to take care that they should not accumulate again, and it was quite an amusing sight every day, when True had gone out as usual to fill and clean the street lamps, to see the little girl diligently laboring with an old broom, the handle of which was cut short to make it more suitable for her use. Mrs. Sullivan looked in occasionally, to praise and assist her, and nothing made Gertie happier than learning how to do some new thing. She met with a few trials and discouragements, to be sure. In two or three instances the toast got burned to a cinder, and worse still, she one day broke a painted teacup, over which she shed many a tear. But as True never thought of blaming her for anything, she forgot her misfortunes, and experience made her careful. Kate McCarty thought her the smartest child in the world, and would sometimes come in and wash up the floor, or do some other work, which required more strength or skill than Gertie possessed. Prompted by her ambition to equal Mrs. Sullivan's expectations, and still more by her desire to be useful to True, and in some degree manifest her love to him by her labors, Gertie was usually patient, good-natured, and obliging. So very indulgent was True, that he rarely indeed lay a command upon the child, leaving her to take her own course and have her own way. But undisciplined as she was, she willingly yielded obedience to one who never thwarted her and the old man seldom saw her exhibit in his presence that violent temper which, when roused, knew no restraint. She had little to irritate her in the quiet home she now enjoyed, but instances sometimes occurred which proved that the fire of her little spirit was not quenched, or its evil propensities extinguished. One Sunday Gertie, who had now a nice little hood which True had bought for her, was returning with Mr. Cooper, Mr. Flint, and Willie from the afternoon service at church. The two old men were engaged in one of their lengthy discussions, and the children, having fallen into the rear, had been talking earnestly about the church, the minister, the people, and the music, all of which were new to Gertie, and greatly excited her wonder and astonishment. As they drew near home, Willie remarked how dark it was growing in the streets, and then, looking down at Gertie, whom he held by the hand, he said, "'Gertie, do you ever go out with Uncle True and see him light the lamps?' "'No, I never did,' said Gertie, since the first night I came. "'I've wanted to, but it's been so cold Uncle True would not let me. "'He said I'd just catch the fever again.' "'It won't be cold this evening,' said Willie. "'It'll be a beautiful night. "'And if Uncle True's willing, let's you and I go with him. "'I've often been, and it's first-rate. "'You can look into the windows and see folks drinking tea "'and sitting all round the fire in the parlors.' "'And I like to see him light those great lamps,' interrupted Gertie. "'They make it look so bright and beautiful all round. "'I hope he'll let us go. "'I'll ask him. Come,' said she, pulling him by the hand. "'Let's catch up with them and ask him now.' "'No. Wait,' said Willie. "'He's busy talking with Grandpa, and we're almost home. "'We can ask him then.' "'He could hardly restrain her impatience, however, "'and as soon as they reached the gate, "'she suddenly broke away from him.' and rushing up to True, made known her request. The plan was willingly acceded to, and the three soon started on the rounds. For some time Gertie's attention was so wholly engrossed by the lamplighting that she could see and enjoy nothing else. But when they reached the corner of the street and came in sight of a large apothecary shop, her delight knew no bounds. The brilliant colors displayed in the windows, now for the first time seen by the evening light, completely captivated her fancy and when Willie told her that his master's shop was very similar, she thought it must be a fine place to spend one's life in. Then she wondered why this was open on Sunday, when all the other stores were closed. And Willie, stopping to explain the matter to her, and to gratify her curiosity on many other points, found, when they started on their way, that True was some distance in advance of them. He hurried Gertie along, telling her that they were now in the finest street they should pass through, and that they must make haste, for they had nearly reached the house he most wanted her to see. When they came up with True, he was just placing his ladder against a post opposite a fine block of buildings. Many of the front windows were shaded, so that the children could not see in. Some, however, either had no curtains, or they had not yet been drawn. In one parlor there was a pleasant wood fire, around which a group were gathered. 
and here Gertie would fain have lingered. Again, in another, a brilliant chandelier was lit, and though the room was vacant, the furniture was so showy, and the whole so brilliant, that the child clapped her hands in delight, and Willie could not prevail upon her to leave the spot, until he told her that further down the street was another house, equally attractive, where she would perhaps see beautiful children. "'How do you know there'll be children there?' said she, as they walked along. "'I don't know, certainly,' said Willie, "'but I think there will. They used always to be up at the window when I came with Uncle True last winter.' "'How many?' asked Gertie. Three, I believe. There was one little girl with such beautiful curls, and such a sweet, cunning little face. She looked like a wax doll, only a great deal prettier. "'Oh, I hope we shall see her,' said Gertie, dancing along on the tops of her toes, so full was she of excitement and pleasure. "'There they are,' exclaimed Willie. "'All three, I declare, just as they used to be.' "'Where?' said Gertie. "'Where?' "'Over opposite, in the great stone house. Here, let's cross over.' It's muddy, I'll carry you. Willie lifted Gertie carefully over the mud, and they stood in front of the house. True had not yet come up. It was he that the children were watching for. Gertie was not the only child that loved to see the lamps lit. It was now quite dark, so that persons in a light room could not see any one out of doors. But Willie and Gertie had so much the better chance to look in. It was indeed a fine mansion, evidently the home of wealth. A clear coal fire, and a bright lamp in the centre of the room, shed abroad their cheerful blaze. Rich carpets, deeply tinted curtains, pictures in gilded frames, and huge mirrors, reflecting the whole on every side, gave Gertie her first impressions of luxurious life. There was an air of comfort combined with all this elegance, which made it still more fascinating to the child of poverty and want. A table was bountifully spread for tea, the cloth of snow-white damask, the shining plate, above all, the home-like hissing tea-kettle, had a most inviting look. A gentleman in gay slippers was in an easy-chair by the fire. A lady in a gay cap was superintending a servant-girl's arrangements at the tea-table, and the children of the household, smiling and happy, were crowded together on a window-seat, looking out, as we have said. They were, as Willie had described them, sweet, lovely-looking little creatures, especially a girl, about the same age as Gertie, the eldest of the three. Her fair hair fell in long ringlets over a neck as white as snow. She had blue eyes, a cherub face, and a little round plump figure. Gertie's admiration and rapture were such that she could find no expression for them, except in jumping up and down, shouting, laughing, and directing Willie's notice first to one thing and then another. "'Oh, Willie, isn't she a darling? And see what a beautiful fire!' What a splendid lady! And look, look at the father's shoes. What is that on the table? I guess it's good. There's a big looking-glass. And, oh, Willie, ain't they dear little handsome children? In all her exclamations, she began and ended with her praises of the children. Willie was quite satisfied. Gertie was as much pleased as he had expected or wished. True now came up, and, as his torchlight swept along the sidewalk, Gertie and Willie became, in their turn, the subjects of notice and conversation. The little curly-haired girl saw them, and pointed them out to the notice of the other two. Though Gertie could not know what they were saying, she did not like the idea of being stared at and talked about. And hiding behind the post, she would not move or look up, though Willie laughed at her, and told her it was now her turn to be looked at. When True took up his ladder, however, and started to move off, she commenced following him at a run, so as to escape observation. But Willie calling to her, and saying that the children were gone from the window, she ran back as quickly to have one more look, and was just in time to see them taking their places at the tea-table. The next instant the servant-girl came and drew down the window-shades. Gertie then took Willie's hand again, and they hastened on once more to overtake True. "'Shouldn't you like to live in such a house as that, Gertie?' said Willie. "'Yes, indeed,' said Gertie. "'Ain't it splendid?' "'I wish I had just such a house,' said Willie. "'I mean to, one of these days.' "'Where will you get it?' exclaimed Gertie, much amazed at so bold a declaration. "'Oh, I shall work, and grow rich and buy it.' "'You can't. It would take a lot of money.' "'I know it, but I can earn a lot, and I mean to. "'The gentleman that lives in that grand house was a poor boy when he first came to Boston. "'And why can't one poor boy get rich, as well as another?' 
How do you suppose he got so much money? I don't know how he did. There are a good many ways. Some people think it's all luck, but I guess it's as much smartness as anything. Are you smart? Willie laughed. Ain't I, said he. If I don't turn out a rich man one of these days, you may say I ain't. I know what I'd do if I was rich, said Gertie. What? asked Willie. First, I'd buy a great nice chair for Uncle True, with cushions all in the inside and bright flowers on it, just exactly like that one the gentleman was sitting in. And next, I'd have great big lamps, ever so many all in a bunch, so's to make the room as light, as light as it could be. Seems to me you're mighty fond of lights, Gertie, said Willie. I be, said the child. I hate old, dark, black places. I like stars and sunshine and fires and Uncle True's torch. And I like bright eyes, interrupted Willie. Yours look just like stars. They shine so tonight. Ain't we having a good time? Yes, real. And so they went on, Gertie jumping and dancing along the sidewalk, Willie sharing in her gaiety and joy and glorying in the responsibility of entertaining and at the same time protecting the wild little creature. They talked much of how they would spend that future wealth which, in their buoyant hopefulness, they both fully calculated upon one day possessing. For Gertie had caught Willie's spirit, and she, too, meant to work and grow rich. Willie told Gertie of the many plans he had for surrounding his mother and grandfather, and even herself and Uncle True, with every comfort and luxury he had ever heard or dreamt of. Among other things, his mother was to wear a gay cap, like that of the lady they had seen through the window. And at this, Gertie had a great laugh. She had an innate perception of the fact that the quiet, demure little widow would be ridiculous in a flowered headgear. Good taste is inborn, and Gertie had it in her. She felt that Mrs. Sullivan, attired in anything that was not simple, neat, and sober looking, would altogether lose her identity. Willie had no selfish schemes. The generous boy suggested nothing for his own gratification. It was for the rest he meant to labor. And in and through them that he looked for his reward. Happy children, happy as children only can be. What do they want of wealth? What of anything, material and tangible, more than they now possess? They have what is worth more than riches or fame. They are full of childhood's faith and hope. With a fancy and imagination unchecked by disappointment, they are building those same castles that so many thousand children have built before, that children always will be building. To the end of time. Far off in the distance they see bright things and know not what myths they are. High up they rise and shine and glitter, and the little ones fix their eyes on them, overlook the rough dark places that lie between, see not the perils of the way, suspect not the gulfs and snares into which many are destined to fall. But confident of gaining the glorious goal, they set forth on the way rejoicing. Blessings on that childhood's delusion, if such it be. Undeceive not the little believers, ye wise ones. Check not that God given hopefulness, which will, perhaps, in its airy flight, lift them in safety over many a rough spot in life's road. It lasts not long at the best, then check it not, for as it dies out, the way grows hard. One source of the light heartedness that Willie and Gertie experienced undoubtedly lay in the disinterestedness and generosity of the emotion which occupied them, for in the plans they formed neither seemed actuated by selfish motives. They were both filled with the desire to contribute to the comfort of their more aged friends. It was a beautiful spirit of grateful love which each manifested, a spirit in a great degree natural to both. In Willie, however, it had been so fostered by pious training that it partook of the nature of a principle, while in Gertie it was a mere impulse, and alas for poor human nature, when swayed by its own passions alone. The poor little girl had, as who has not, other less pleasing impulses, and if the former needed encouraging and strengthening, so did the latter require to be uprooted and destroyed. They had reached the last lamp post in the street. And now turned another corner, but scarcely had they gone a dozen steps before Gertie stopped short, and positively refusing to proceed any further, pulled hard at Willie's hand and tried to induce him to retrace his steps. What's the matter, Gertie? said he. Are you tired? No, oh no, but I can't go any further. Why not? Oh, because. 
"'Because—' and here Gertie lowered her voice, and putting her mouth close to Willie's ear, whispered, "'There is Nan Grant's house. I see the house. I had forgot Uncle True went there. And I can't go. I'm afraid.' "'Oh, ho!' said Willie, drawing himself up with dignity. "'I should like to know what you're afraid of when I'm with you. Let her touch you if she dares. And Uncle True, too. I should laugh.' Very kindly and pleasantly did Willie plead with the child, telling her that Nan would not be likely to see them, but that perhaps they should see her, and that was just what he wanted, nothing he should like better. Gertie's fears were easily allayed. She was not naturally timid. It was only the suddenness of the shock she received, on recognizing her old home, that had revived, with full force, her dread and horror of Nan. It needed but little reasoning to assure her of the perfect safety of her present position, and her fears soon gave place to the desire to point out to Willie her former persecutor. So by the time they stood in front of the house, she was rather hoping than otherwise to catch sight of Nan, and never had any one a fairer chance to be looked upon than Nan at that moment. She was standing opposite the window, engaged in an animated dispute with one of her neighbors. Her countenance expressed angry excitement and, as ill-looking a woman at best, her face now was so sufficient an index to her character, that no one could see her thus, and afterwards question her right to the title of vixen, virago, scold, or anything else that conveys the same idea. "'Which is she?' said Willie, the tall one swinging the coffee-pot in her hand. "'I guess she'll break the handle off if she don't look out.' "'Yes,' said Gertie, "'that's Nan. "'What's she doing?' "'Oh, she's fighting with Miss Birch. She does most always with somebody. She don't see us, does she?' "'No, she's too busy. Come, don't let stop. She's an ugly-looking woman, just as I knew she was. I've seen enough of her, and I'm sure you have. Come.' But Gertie lingered. Courageous in the knowledge that she was safe and unseen, she was attentively gazing at Nan, and her eyes glistened, not as a few minutes before, with the healthy and innocent excitement of a cheerful heart but with the fire of kindled passion, a fire that Nan had kindled long ago, which had not yet gone out, and which the sight of Nan had now revived in full force. Willie, thinking it was time to be hurrying home, and perceiving once more that Mr. Flint and his torch were far down the street, now left Gertie, and started himself, as an expedient to draw her on, saying, at the same time, "'Come, Gertie, I can't wait.' Gertie turned, saw that he was going, then, quick as lightning, stooped, and picking up a stone from the sidewalk, flung it at the window. There was a crash of broken glass, an exclamation in Nan's well-known voice, but Gertie was not there to see the result of her work. The instant the stone had left her hand, and she heard the crash, her fears all returned, and flying past Willie, she paused not until she was safe by the side of True. Willie did not overtake them until they were nearly home, and then came running up, exclaiming breathlessly, "'Why, Gertie, do you know what you did? You broke the window.' Gertie jerked her shoulders from side to side to avoid Willie, pouted, and declared that was what she meant to do. True now inquired what window, and Gertie unhesitatingly acknowledged what she had done, and avowed that she did it on purpose. True and Willie were shocked and silent. Gertie was silent, too, for the rest of the walk. There were clouds on her face, and she felt unhappy in her little heart. She did not understand herself— or her own sensations. We may not say how far she was responsible for them, but this much is certain. Her face alone betrayed that, as evil took violent possession of her soul, peace and pleasantness fled away. Poor child! How much she needs to learn the truth! God grant that the inward may one day become as dear to her as now the outward light. Willie bade them good night at the house door, and, as usual, they saw no more of him for a week. End of chapter 8《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》ママママママママママママママママママママママママママママママママママママママママママママママママママママママママママママママママママママママママママママママママママママママママママママママママママママママママone afternoon, as he was preparing to go out and to take with him a number of articles which he wanted for his Saturday's work in the church. "'Why don't you get little Gertie to go with you, and carry some of your things? You can't take them all at once, 
and she'd like to go, I know. She'd only be in the way, said Mr. Cooper. I can take them myself. But when he had swung a lantern and an empty coal hod on one arm, taken a little hatchet and a basket of kindlings in his hand, and hoisted a small ladder over his shoulder, he was fain to acknowledge that there was no accommodation for his hammer and a large paper of nails. So Mrs. Sullivan called Gertie, and asked her to go to the church with Mr. Cooper, and help him carry his tools. Gertie was very much pleased with the proposal, and, taking the hammer and nails, started off with great alacrity. When they reached the church, the old sexton took them from her hands, and, telling her she could play about until he went home, but to be sure and do no mischief, left her, and went down into the vestry room, to commence there his operation of sweeping, dusting, and building fires. Gertie was thus left to her own amusement, and ample amusement she found it, for some time, to wander round among the empty aisles and pews, and examine closely what, hitherto, she had only viewed from a corner of the gallery. Then she ascended the pulpit, and in imagination addressed a large audience. She was just beginning to grow weary and restless, however, when the organist, who had entered unperceived, commenced playing some low, sweet music, and Gertie, seating herself on the pulpit stairs, listened with the greatest attention and pleasure. He had not played long before the door at the foot of the broad aisle opened, and a couple of visitors entered, and observing whom, Gertie was soon wholly engrossed. One was an elderly man, dressed like a clergyman, short and spare, with hair thin and gray, forehead high, and features rather sharp. But, though a plain man, remarkable for his calm and benignant expression of countenance, a young lady, apparently about twenty-five years of age, was leaning on his arm. She was attired with great simplicity, wearing a dark brown cloak and a bonnet of the same color, relieved by some light blue ribbon about the face. The only article of her dress which was either rich or elegant was some beautiful dark fur, fastened at her throat with a costly enameled slide. She was somewhat below the middle size, but had a pleasing and well-rounded figure. Her features were small and regular, her complexion clear, though rather pale, and her light brown hair was most neatly and carefully arranged. She never lifted her eyes as she walked slowly up the aisle, and the long lashes nearly swept her cheek. The two approached the spot where Gertie sat, but without perceiving her. "'I am glad you like the organ,' said the gentleman. "'I'm not much of a judge of music myself, but they say it is a superior instrument, and that Herman plays it remarkably well.' "'Nor is my opinion of any value,' said the lady, "'for I have very little knowledge of music, much as I love it. But that symphony sounds very delightful to me. It is a long time since I have heard such touching strains. Or, it may be, it is partly owing to their striking so sweetly on the solemn quiet of the church this afternoon. I love to go into a large church on a weekday. It was very kind in you to call for me this afternoon. How came you to think of it?' "'I thought you would enjoy it, my dear. "'I knew Herman would be playing about this time. "'And, besides, when I saw how pale you were looking, "'it seemed to me the walk would do you good. "'It has done me good. "'I was not feeling well, "'and the clear, cold air was just what I needed. "'I knew it would refresh me. "'But Mrs. Ellis was busy, "'and I could not, you know, go out alone. "'I thought I should find Mr. Cooper, the sexton here,' "'said the gentleman. "'I want to speak to him about the light.' The afternoons are so short now, and it grows dark so early. I must ask him to open more of the blinds, or I cannot see to read my sermon to-morrow. Perhaps he is in the vestry room. He is always somewhere about here on Saturday. I think I had better go and look for him. Just then Mr. Cooper entered the church, and seeing the clergyman, came up, and after receiving his directions about the light, seemed to request him to accompany him somewhere. For the gentleman hesitated, glanced at the young lady, and then said, "'I suppose I ought to go to-day, and, as you say, you are at leisure. It is a pity I should not, but I don't know.' Then turning to the lady, he said, "'Emily, Mr. Cooper wants me to go to Mrs. Glass's with him, and I suppose I should have to be absent some time. Do you think you should mind waiting here until I return? She lives in the next street, but I may be detained, for it's about that matter of the library books being so mischievously defaced.' and I am very much afraid that oldest boy of hers had something to do with it. It ought to be inquired into before to-morrow, and I can hardly walk so far as this again to-night, 
or I would not think of leaving you. "'Oh, go by all means,' said Emily. "'Don't mind me. It will be a pleasure to sit here and listen to the music. Mr. Herman's playing is a great treat to me, and I don't care how long I wait. So I beg you won't hurry on my account, Mr. Arnold.' Thus assured, Mr. Arnold concluded to go, and having first led the lady to a chair beneath the pulpit, went away with Mr. Cooper. All this time Gertie had been quite unnoticed, and had remained very quiet on the upper stair, a little secured from sight by the pulpit. Hardly had the doors closed, however, with a loud bang, when the child got up and began to descend the stairs. The moment she moved, the lady, whose seat was very near, started and exclaimed rather suddenly who's that gertie stood quite still and made no reply strangely enough the lady did not look up though she must have perceived that the movement was above her head there was a moment's pause and then gertie began again to run down the stairs this time the lady sprung up and stretching out her hand said as quickly as before who is it me said gertie looking up into the lady's face it's only me "'Will you stop and speak to me?' said the lady. Gertie not only stopped, but came close up to Emily's chair, irresistibly attracted by the music of the sweetest voice she had ever heard. The lady placed her hand on Gertie's head, drew her towards her, and said, "'Who are you?' "'Gertie.' "'Gertie who?' "'Nothing else but Gertie.' "'Have you forgotten your other name?' "'I haven't got any other name.' "'How came you here?' I came with Mr. Cooper, to help him bring his things. And he's left you here to wait for him, and I'm left too, so we must take care of each other, mustn't we? Gertie laughed at this. Where were you, on the stairs? Yes. Suppose you sit down on this step by my chair, and talk with me a little while. I want to see if we can't find out what your other name is. Where do you say you live? With Uncle True. True? "'Yes, Mr. True Flint, I live with now. "'He took me home to his house one night, "'when Nan Grant put me out on the sidewalk. "'Why, are you that little girl? "'Then I've heard of you before. "'Mr. Flint told me all about you. "'Do you know my Uncle True?' "'Yes, very well. "'What's your name?' "'My name is Emily Graham.' "'Oh, I know,' said Gertie, "'springing suddenly up and clapping her hands together. "'I know. "'You asked him to keep me. "'He said so.' I heard him say so. And you gave me my clothes, and you're beautiful, and you're good, and I love you. Oh, I love you ever so much. As Gertie spoke with a voice full of excitement, a strange look passed over Miss Graham's face, a most inquiring and restless look, as if the tones of the voice had vibrated on a chord of her memory. She did not speak, but passing her arm round the child's waist, drew her closer to her, as the peculiar expression passed away from her face, and her features assumed their usual calm composure, Gertie, as she gazed at her with a look of wonder, a look which the child had worn during the whole of the conversation, exclaimed at last, "'Are you going to sleep?' "'No. Why?' "'Because your eyes are shut.' "'They are always shut, my child.' "'Always shut? What for?' "'I am blind, Gertie. I can see nothing.' "'Not see,' said Gertie. "'Can't you see anything? "'Can't you see me now?' "'No,' said Miss Graham. "'Oh!' exclaimed Gertie, drawing a long breath. "'I'm so glad.' "'Glad?' said Miss Graham, "'in the saddest voice that ever was heard. "'Oh, yes,' said Gertie. "'So glad you can't see me, "'because now perhaps you'll love me.' "'And shouldn't I love you if I saw you?' said Emily, passing her hand softly and slowly over the child's features. "'Oh, no,' answered Gertie. "'I'm so ugly. I'm glad you can't see how ugly I am.' "'But just think, Gertie,' said Emily, in the same sad voice. "'How would you feel if you could not see the light, could not see anything in the world? "'Can't you see the sun, and the stars, and the sky, and the church we're in? Are you in the dark?' in the dark, all the time, day and night in the dark. Gertie burst into a paroxysm of tears. Oh, exclaimed she, as soon as she could find voice amid her sobs, it's too bad, it's too bad. The child's grief was contagious, and for the first time in years, Emily wept bitterly for her blindness. It was but for a few moments, however. 
Quickly recovering herself, she tried to compose the child also, saying, "'Hush, hush, don't cry, and don't say it's too bad. It's not too bad. I can bear it very well. I'm used to it, and am quite happy.' "'I shouldn't be happy in the dark. I should hate to be.' said Gertie. I ain't glad you're blind. I'm real sorry. I wish you could see me in everything. Can't your eyes be opened, anyway? No, said Emily, never. But we won't talk about that any more. We'll talk about you. I want to know what makes you think yourself so very ugly. Because folks say that I'm an ugly child, and that nobody loves ugly children. Yes, people do, said Emily, love ugly children, if they are good. "'But I ain't good,' said Gertie. "'I'm real bad.' "'But you can be good,' said Emily. "'And then everybody will love you.' "'Do you think I can be good?' "'Yes, if you try. "'I will try.' "'I hope you will,' said Emily. "'Mr. Flint thinks a great deal of his little girl, "'and she must do all she can to please him.' She then went on to make inquiries concerning Gertie's former way of life, and became so much interested in the recital of the little girl's early sorrows and trials, that she was unconscious of the flight of time, and quite unobservant of the departure of the organist, who had ceased playing, closed his instrument, and gone away. Gertie was very communicative. Always a little shy of strangers at first, she was nevertheless easily won by kind words and, in the present case, the sweet voice and sympathetic tones of Emily went straight to her heart. Singularly enough, though her whole life had been passed among the poorer, and almost the whole of it among the lowest class of people, she seemed to feel none of that awe and constraint which might be supposed natural, on her encountering, for the first time, one who, born and bred amid influence and luxury, showed herself, in every word and motion, a lady of polished mind and manners. On the contrary, Gertie clung to Emily as affectionately, and stroked her soft boa with as much freedom as if she herself had been born in a palace and cradled in sable fur. Once or twice she took Emily's nicely gloved hand between both her own and held it tight, her favorite mode of expressing her enthusiastic warmth of gratitude and admiration. The excitable but interesting child took no less strong a hold upon Miss Graham's feelings, the latter saw at once how totally neglected the little one had been, and the importance of her being educated and trained with care, lest early abuse, acting upon an impetuous disposition, should prove destructive to a nature capable of the best attainments. The two were still entertaining each other, and, as we have said, unconscious of the lateness of the hour, when Mr. Arnold entered the church hastily, and somewhat out of breath. As he came up the aisle, when he was yet some way off, he called to Emily, saying, "'Emily, dear, I'm afraid you thought I had forgotten you. I have been gone so much longer than I intended. Were you not quite tired and discouraged?' "'Have you been gone long?' replied Emily. "'I thought it was but a very little while. I have had company, you see.' "'What, little folks?' said Mr. Arnold, good-naturedly. "'Where did this little body come from?' "'She came to the church this afternoon, with Mr. Cooper. Isn't he here for her?' "'Cooper? No, he went straight home, after he left me. "'He's probably forgotten all about the child. "'What's to be done? "'Can't we take her home? "'Is it far? "'It is two or three streets from here, and directly out of our way, "'altogether too far for you to walk. "'Oh, no, it won't tire me. "'I'm quite strong now, and I wouldn't but know she was safe home, on any account. "'I'd rather get a little fatigued.' If Emily could have seen Gertie's grateful face that moment, she would indeed have felt repaid for almost any amount of weariness. So they went home with Gertie, and Emily kissed Gertie at the gate, and Gertie was a happy child that night. End of chapter 9「Chapter 10 of the Lamplighter This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bridget Gage the Lamplighter by Maria Susanna Cummins Chapter ten By the strong spirit's discipline, by the fierce wrong forgiven, by all that rings the heart of sin, is woman won to heaven. N. P. Willis As may be supposed, the blind girl did not forget our little Gertie. Emily Graham never forgot the sufferings, the wants, the necessities of others. She could not see the world without but there was a world of love and sympathy within her, which manifested itself in abundant benevolence and charity, 
both of heart and deed. She lived a life of love. She loved God with her whole heart, and her neighbor as herself. Her own great misfortunes and trials could not be helped, and were borne without repining. But the misfortunes and trials of others became her care, the alleviation of them her greatest delight. Emily was never weary of doing good. Many a blessing was called down upon her head, by young and old, for kindness past. Many a call was made upon her for further aid, and to the call of none was she ever deaf. But never had she been so touched as now by any tale of sorrow. Ready listener as she was, to the story of grief and trouble, she knew how many children were born into the world amid poverty and privation, how many were abused, neglected, and forsaken, so that Gertie's experience was not new to her. But it was something in the child herself that excited and interested Emily in an unwanted degree. The tones of her voice, the earnestness and pathos with which she spoke, the confiding and affectionate manner in which she had clung to her, the sudden clasping of her hand, and finally her vehement outbreak of grief when she became conscious of Emily's great misfortune. All these things so haunted Miss Graham's recollection that she dreamt of the child at night, and thought much of her by day. She could not account to herself for the interest she felt in the little stranger. But the impulse to see and know more of her was irresistible. And sending for True, she talked a long time with him about the child. True was highly gratified by Miss Graham's account of the meeting in the church, and of the interest the little girl had inspired in one for whom he felt the greatest admiration and respect. Gertie had previously told him how she had seen Miss Graham, and had spoken in the most glowing terms of the dear lady who was so kind to her and brought her home when Mr. Cooper had forgotten her. But it had not occurred to the old man that the fancy was mutual. Emily asked him if he didn't intend to send her to school. "'Well, I don't know,' said he. "'She's a little thing, and ain't much use to being with other children. Besides, I don't exactly like to spare her. I like to see her round.' Emily suggested that it was time she was learning to read and write, and that the sooner she went among other children, the easier it would be to her. "'Very true, Miss Emily, very true,' said Mr. Flint. "'I dare say you're right. And if you think she'd better go, I'll ask her and see what she says.' "'I would,' said Emily. "'I think she might enjoy it, besides improving very much. And about her clothes, if there's any deficiency, I'll—' "'Oh, no, no, Miss Emily,' interrupted True. "'There's no necessity. She's very well on it now, thanks to your kindness.' "'Well,' said Emily, "'if she should have any wants, you must apply to me. You know we adopted her jointly, and I agreed to do anything I could for her, so you must never hesitate. It will be a pleasure to serve either of you. Father always feels under obligations to you, Mr. Flint, for faithful service, that cost you dear in the end.' "'Oh, Miss Emily,' said True, "'Mr. Graham has always been my best friend. "'And as to that air accident that happened when I was in his employ, "'it was nobody's fault but my own. "'It was my own carelessness, and nobody's else.' "'I know you say so,' said Emily. "'But we regretted it very much, "'and you mustn't forget what I tell you, "'that I shall delight in doing anything for Gertie. "'I should like to have her come and see me some day, "'if she would like to, and you'll let her.' "'Sartin, sartin,' said True, "'and thank you kindly. "'She'd admire to come.' "'A few days after, "'Gertie went with True to see Miss Graham. "'But the housekeeper, whom they met in the hall, "'told them that she was ill and could see no one. "'So they went away, full of disappointment and regret. "'It proved afterwards that Emily took a severe cold "'the day she sat so long in the church, "'and was suffering with it when they called.' But though confined to her room, she would have been glad to have a visit from Gertie, and was sorry and grieved that Mrs. Ellis should have sent them away so abruptly. One Saturday evening, when Willie was present, True broached the subject of Gertie's going to school. Gertie herself was very much disgusted with the idea, but it met with Willie's warm approbation, and when Gertie learned that Miss Graham also wished it, she consented though rather reluctantly, to begin the next week and try how she liked it. So, on the following Monday, Gertie accompanied True to one of the primary schools, was admitted, and her education commenced. When Willie came home the next Saturday, he rushed into True's room, 
full of eagerness to hear how Gertie liked going to school. He found her seated at the table, with her spelling-book, and as soon as he entered, she exclaimed, "'Oh, Willie, Willie, come and hear me read!' Her performance could not properly be called reading. She had not got beyond the alphabet, and a few syllables which she had learned to spell. But Willie bestowed upon her much well-merited praise, for she had really been very diligent. He was astonished to hear that Gertie liked going to school, liked the teacher and the scholars, and had a fine time at recess. He had fully expected that she would dislike the whole business, and very probably go into tantrums about it, which was the expression he used to denote her fits of ill-temper. On the contrary, everything thus far had gone well, and Gertie had never looked so animated and happy as she did this evening. Willie promised to assist her in her studies, and the two children's literary plans soon became as high-flown as if one had been a poet laureate and the other a philosopher. For two or three weeks all appeared to go on smoothly, Gertie went regularly to school, and continued to make rapid progress. Every Saturday Willie heard her read and spell, assisted, praised, and encouraged her. He had, however, a shrewd suspicion that on one or two occasions she had come near having a brush with some large girls, for whom she began to show symptoms of dislike. Whatever the difficulty originated in, it soon reached a crisis. One day, when the children were assembled in the schoolyard, during recess, Gertie caught sight of True in his working dress, just passing down the street, with his ladder and lamp filler. Shouting and laughing, she bounded out of the yard, pursued and overtook him. She came back in a few minutes, seeming much delighted at the unexpected re-encounter, and ran into the yard out of breath and full of happy excitement. The troop of large girls, whom Gertie had already had some reason to distrust, had been observing her, and, as soon as she returned, one of them called out, saying, "'Who's that man?' "'That's my Uncle True,' said Gertie. "'Your what?' "'My uncle, Mr. Flint, that I live with.' "'So you belong to him, do you?' said the girl, in an insolent tone of voice. "'Ha, ha, ha!' "'What are you laughing at?' said Gertie, fiercely. "'Ugh! Before I'd live with him,' said the girl. "'Old smutty!' The others caught it up and the laugh and epithet old smutty circulated freely in the corner of the yard where Gertie was standing. Gertie was furious, her eyes glistened, she doubled her little fist, and without hesitation came down in battle upon the crowd. But they were too many for her, and helpless as she was with passion, they drove her out of the yard. She started for home on a full run, screaming with all her might. As she flew along the sidewalk, she brushed roughly against a tall and rather stiff-looking lady, who was walking slowly in the same direction, with another and much smaller person leaning on her arm. "'Bless me!' said the tall lady, who had almost lost her equilibrium from her fright and the suddenness of the shock. "'Why, you horrid little creature!' As she spoke, she grasped Gertie by the shoulder, and, before the child could break away, succeeded in giving her a slight shake." This served to increase Gertie's anger, and her speed gaining in proportion. It was but a few minutes before she was at home, crouched in a corner of True's room, behind the bed, her face to the wall, and, as usual, on such occasions, covered with both her hands. Here she was free to cry as loud as she pleased, for Mrs. Sullivan was gone out, and there was no one in the house to hear her, a privilege, indeed, of which she fully availed herself but she had not had time to indulge long in her tantrum, when the gate at the end of the yard closed with a bang, and footsteps were heard coming towards Mr. Flint's door. Gertie's attention was arrested, for she knew by the sound that it was a step of a stranger who was approaching. With a strong effort, she succeeded, after one or two convulsive sobs, in so far controlling herself as to keep quiet. There was a knock at the door, but Gertie did not reply to it remaining in her position, concealed behind the bed. The knock was not repeated, but the stranger lifted the latch and walked in. "'There doesn't seem to be any one at home,' said a female voice. "'What a pity!' "'Isn't there? I'm sorry,' replied another, in the sweet, musical tones of Miss Graham. Gertie knew the voice at once. "'I thought you'd better not come here yourself,' rejoined the first speaker who was no other than Mrs. Ellis, the identical lady whom Gertie had so frightened and disconcerted. 
"'Oh, I don't regret coming,' said Emily. "'You can leave me here while you go to your sister's. "'And very likely Mr. Flint or the little girl will come home in the meantime.' "'It don't become you, Miss Emily, to be carried round everywhere, "'and left, like an expressman's parcel, till called for. "'You caught a horrid cold, that you're hardly well of now, "'waiting there in the church for the minister. "'And Mr. Graham will be finding fault next.' "'Oh, no, Mrs. Ellis, it's very comfortable here. "'The church must have been damp, I think. "'Come, put me in Mr. Flynn's armchair, "'and I can make myself quite contented.' "'Well, at any rate,' said Mrs. Ellis, "'I'll make up a good fire in this stove before I go.' "'As she spoke, the energetic housekeeper seized the poker, "'and after stirring up the coals, "'and making free with all true's kindling wood, "'waited long enough to hear the roaring and see the blaze.' and then, having laid aside Emily's cloak and boa, went away with the same firm, steady step with which she had come, and which had so overpowered Emily's noiseless tread, that Gertie had only anticipated the arrival of a single guest. As soon as Gertie knew, by the swinging of the gate, that Mrs. Ellis had really departed, she suspended her effort at self-control, and with a deep-drawn sigh, gasped out, "'Oh, dear! Oh, dear!' "'Why, Gertie!' exclaimed Emily. "'Is that you?' "'Yes,' sobbed Gertie. "'Come here.' The child waited no second bidding, but starting up, ran, threw herself on the floor by the side of Emily, buried her face in the blind girl's lap, and once more commenced crying aloud. By this time her whole frame was trembling with agitation. "'Why, Gertie,' said Emily, "'what is the matter?' But Gertie could not reply. And Emily, finding this to be the case, desisted from her inquiries until the little one should be somewhat composed. She lifted Gertie up into her lap, laid her head upon her shoulder, and with her own handkerchief wiped the tears from her face. Her soothing words and caresses soon quieted the child, and when she was calm, Emily, instead of recurring at once to the cause of her grief, very judiciously questioned her upon other topics. At last, however, she asked her if she went to school. "'I have been,' said Gertie, raising her head suddenly from Emily's shoulder. "'But I won't ever go again.' "'What? Why not?' "'Because,' said Gertie angrily, "'I hate those girls. Yes, I hate em. Ugly things.' "'Gertie,' said Emily, "'don't say that. You shouldn't hate anybody.' "'Why shouldn't I?' said Gertie. "'Because it's wrong.' "'No, it's not wrong. I say it isn't,' said Gertie. "'And I do hate em and I hate Nan Grant, and I always shall. Don't you hate anybody? No, answered Emily, I don't. Did anybody ever drown your kitten? Did anybody ever call your father old smutty? said Gertie. If they had, I know you'd hate him just as I do. Gertie, said Emily solemnly, didn't you tell me the other day that you were a naughty child, but that you wished to be good and would try? Yes, said Gertie. If you wish to become good and be forgiven, you must forgive others. Gertie said nothing. Do you not wish God to forgive and love you? God, that lives in heaven, that made the stars, said Gertie. Yes. Will he love me and let me go some time to heaven? Yes, if you try to be good and love everybody. Miss Emily, said Gertie, after a moment's pause, I can't do it, so I suppose I can't go. Just at this moment a tear fell upon Gertie's forehead. She looked thoughtfully up in Emily's face, then said, "'Dear Miss Emily, are you going?' "'I am trying to.' "'I should like to go with you,' said Gertie, shaking her head meditatively. Still Emily did not speak. She left the child to the working of her own thoughts. "'Miss Emily,' said Gertie, at last, in the lowest whisper, "'I mean to try.' "'but I don't think I can.' "'God bless you, and help you, my child,' said Emily, laying her hand upon Gertie's head. For fifteen minutes or more, not a word was spoken by either. Gertie lay perfectly still in Emily's lap. By and by the latter perceived, by the child's breathing, that worn out with the fever and excitement of all she had gone through, she had dropped into a quiet sleep. When Mrs. Ellis returned, Emily pointed to the sleeping child, and asked her to place her on the bed. She did so wonderingly, and then, turning to Emily, exclaimed, 
"'Upon my word, Miss Emily, that's the same rude, bawling little creature that came so near being the death of us.' Emily smiled at the idea of a child eight years old overthrowing and annihilating a woman of Mrs. Ellis's inches, but said nothing. Why did Emily weep long that night, as she recalled the scene of the morning? Why did she, on bended knee, wrestle so vehemently with a mighty sorrow? Why did she pray so earnestly for new strength and heavenly aid? Why did she so beseechingly ask of God his blessing on the little child? Because she had felt, in many a year of darkness and bereavement, in many an hour of fearful struggle, in many a pang of despair, how a temper like that which Gertie had this day shown might in one moment of its fearful reign cast a blight upon a lifetime, and write in fearful lines the mournful requiem of earthly joy. And so she prayed to heaven that night for strength to keep her firm resolve, and aid in fulfilling her undying purpose, to cure that child of her dark infirmity. End of chapter 10「Chapter Eleven of the Lamplighter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bridget Gage. The Lamplighter by Maria Susanna Cummins. Chapter Eleven. Her influence breathes and bids the blighted heart to life and hope from desolation start. Hemans. The next Sabbath afternoon found Gertie seated on a cricket in front of a pleasant little wood fire in Emily's own room. Her large eyes were fixed upon Emily's face which always seemed, in some unaccountable way, to fascinate the little girl. So attentively did she watch the play of the features in a countenance the charm of which many an older person than Gertie had felt, but tried in vain to describe. It was not beauty, at least not brilliant beauty, for that Emily had not possessed, even when her face was illumined, as it had once been, by beautiful hazel eyes. Nor was it the effect of what is usually termed fascination of manner, for Emily's manner and voice were both so soft and unassuming that they never took the fancy by storm. It was not compassion for her blindness, though so great a misfortune might well, and always did, excite the warmest sympathy. But it was hard to realize that Emily was blind. It was a fact never forced upon her friend's recollection by any repining or selfish indulgences on the part of the sufferer and, as there was nothing painful in the appearance of her closed lids, shaded and fringed as they were by her long and heavy eyelashes, it was not unusual for those immediately about her to converse upon things which could only be evident to the sense of sight, and even direct her attention to one object and another, quite forgetting, for the moment, her sad deprivation. And Emily never sighed, never seemed hurt at their want of consideration, or showed any lack of interest in objects thus shut from her gaze. But apparently quite satisfied with the description she heard, or the pictures which she formed in her imagination, would talk pleasantly and playfully upon whatever was uppermost in the minds of her companions. Some said that Emily had the sweetest mouth in the world, and they loved to watch its ever-varying expression. Some said her chief attraction lay in a small dimple in her right cheek. Others, and these were young girls who wanted to be charming themselves, remarked that if they thought they could make their hair wave like Emily's, they'd braid it up every night. It was so becoming. But the chosen few, who were capable, through their own spirituality, of understanding and appreciating Emily's character, the few, the very few, who had known her struggles and had witnessed her triumphs, had they undertaken to express their belief concerning the source whence she derived that power by which her face and voice stole into the hearts of young and old, and won their love and admiration, they would have said, as Gertie did, when she sat gazing so earnestly at Emily on the very Sunday afternoon of which we speak, "'Miss Emily, I know you've been with God.' Gertie was certainly a strange child, all untaught as she was, she had felt Emily's entire superiority to any being she had ever seen before. And, yielding to that belief in her belonging to an order above humanity, she reposed implicit confidence in what she told her, allowed herself to be guided and influenced by one whom she felt loved her and saw only her good. And as she sat at her feet and listened to her gentle voice while she gave her her first lesson upon the distinction between right and wrong, 
Emily, though she could not see the little thoughtful face that was looking up at her, knew by the earnest attention she had gained, by the child's perfect stillness, and still more by the little hand which had sought hers, and now held it tight, that one great point was won. Gertie had not been to school since the day of her battle with the great girls. All True's persuasions had failed, and she would not go. But Emily understood the child's nature so much better than True did, and urged upon her so much more forcible motives than the old man had thought of employing, that she succeeded where he had failed. Gertie considered that her old friend had been insulted, and that was the chief cause of indignation with her. But Emily placed the matter in a different light, and convincing her at last that, if she loved Uncle True, she would show it much better by obeying his wishes than by retaining her foolish anger, she finally obtained Gertie's promise that she would go to school the next morning. She also advised her how to conduct herself towards the scholars whom she so much disliked, and gave her some simple directions with regard to her behavior the next day, telling her that perhaps Mr. Flint would go with her, make suitable apologies to the teacher for her absence, and that, in such case, she would have no further trouble. The next morning true, much pleased that Gertie's repugnance to the school was at last overcome, went with her, and inquiring for the teacher at the door, stated the case to her in his blunt, honest way, and then left Gertie in her special charge. Miss Brown, who was a young woman of good sense and good feelings, saw the matter in the right light, and taking an opportunity to speak privately to the girls, who had excited Gertie's temper by their rudeness, made them feel so ashamed of their conduct that they no longer molested the child. And as Gertie soon after made friends with one or two quiet children of her own age, with whom she played in recess, she got into no more such difficulties. The winter passed away. The pleasant, sunny spring days came, days when Gertie would sit at open windows, or on the doorstep, when birds sang in the morning among the branches of an old locust tree that grew in the narrow yard, and the sun at evening threw bright rays across True's great room, and Gertie could see to read until almost bedtime. She had been to school steadily all winter, and had improved as rapidly as most intelligent children do, who were first given the opportunity to learn at an age when, full of ambition, the mind is most fertile and capable of progress. She was looking healthy and well, her clothes were clean and neat, for her wardrobe was well stocked by Emily, and the care of it superintended by Mrs. Sullivan. She was bright and happy, too, and tripped round the house so joyously and lightly that True declared his birdie knew not what it was to touch her heel to the ground, but flew about on the tips of her toes. The old man could not have loved the little adopted one better had she been his own child. And as he sat by her side on the wide settle, which, when the warm weather came, was moved outside the door, and listened patiently and attentively while she read aloud to him story after story, of little girls who never told lies, boys who always obeyed their parents, or, more frequently still, of the child who knew how to keep her temper, they seemed, as indeed they were, most suitable companions for each other. The old man's interest in the story-books, which were provided by Emily, and read and re-read by Gertie, was as keen and unflagging as if he had been a child himself, and he would sit with his elbows on his knees, hearing the simple stories, laughing when Gertie laughed, sympathizing as fully and heartily as she did in the sorrows of her little heroines, and rejoicing with her in the final triumph of truth, obedience, and patience. Emily knew the weight that such tales often carried with them to the hearts of children, and most carefully and judiciously did she select books for Gertie. Gertie's life was now as happy and prosperous as it had once been wretched and miserable. Six months before, she had felt herself all alone, unloved, uncared for. Now she had many friends, and knew what it was to be thought of, provided for, and caressed. All the days in the week were joyous, but Saturday and Sunday were marked days with her, as well as with Mrs. Sullivan. For Saturday brought Willie home to hear her recite her lessons, walk, laugh, and play with her. He had so many pleasant things to tell, he was so full of life and animation, so ready to enter into all her plans, and in every way promote her amusement, that on Monday morning she began to count the days until Saturday would come again. Then if anything went wrong or got out of order, if the old clock stopped, or her toys got broken, 
or, worse still, if her lessons troubled or any little childish grief oppressed her. Willie knew how to put everything right, to help her out of every difficulty. So Willie's mother looked not more anxiously for his coming than Gertie did. Sunday afternoon Gertie always spent with Emily, in Emily's own room, listening to her sweet voice, and half unconsciously imbibing a portion of her sweet spirit. Emily preached no sermons, nor did she weary the child with exhortations and precepts. Indeed, it did not occur to Gertie that she went there to be taught anything, but simply and gradually the blind girl imparted light to the child's dark soul, and the truths that make for virtue, the lessons that are divine, were implanted in her so naturally, and yet so forcibly, that she realized not the work that was going on. But long after, when goodness had grown strong within her, and her first feeble resistance of evil, her first attempts to keep her childish resolves, had matured into deeply rooted principles, and confirmed habits of right, she felt, as she looked back into the past, that on those blessed Sabbaths, sitting on her cricket at Emily's knee, she had received into her heart the first beams of that immortal light that never could be quenched. Thus her silent prayer was answered. God had chosen an earthly messenger to lead his child into everlasting peace, a messenger from whose closed eyes the world's paths were all shut out, but who had been so long treading the heavenly road that it was now familiar ground, who was so fit to guide the little one as she, who with patience had learned the way, who so well able to cast light upon the darkness of another soul as she, to whose own darkened life God had lent a torch divine. It was a grievous trial to Gertie about this time, to learn that the Grahams were soon going into the country for the summer. Mr. Graham owned a pleasant residence, about six miles from Boston, to which he invariably resorted as soon as the planting season commenced. For, though devoted to business during the winter, he had of late years allowed himself much relaxation from his counting-room in the summer, and ledgers and day-books were now soon to be supplanted, in his estimation, by the labors and delights of gardening. Emily promised Gertie, however, that she should come and pass a day with her when the weather was fine, a visit which Gertie enjoyed three months in anticipation, and more than three in retrospection. It was some compensation for Emily's absence that, as the days became long, Willie was frequently able to leave the shop and come home for an hour or two in the evening. And Willie, as we have said, always knew how to comfort Gertie, whatever the trouble might be. End of chapter 11「Chapter Twelve of the Lamplighter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bridget Gage. The Lamplighter by Maria Susanna Cummins. Chapter Twelve. Let every minute, as it springs, convey fresh knowledge on its wings. Let every minute, as it flies, record thee good, as well as wise. Cotton. It was one pleasant evening in the latter part of April that Gertie, who had been to see Miss Graham and bid her good-bye, before her departure for the country, stood at the back part of the yard weeping bitterly. She held in her hand a book and a new slate, Emily's parting gifts, but she had not removed the wrapper from the one, and the other was quite besmeared with tears. She was so full of grief at the parting. With her, the first of those many sad partings life is so full of, that she did not hear any one approach, and was unconscious of any one's presence, until a hand was placed upon each of her shoulders, and as she turned round, she found herself encircled by Willie's arms, and face to face with Willie's sunny countenance. "'Why, Gertie,' said he, "'this is no kind of a welcome, when I've come home on a weeknight to stay with you all the evening. Mother and Grandfather are both gone out somewhere.' And then, when I come to look for you, you're crying so I can't see your face through such oceans of tears. Come, come, do leave off. You don't know how shockingly you look. Willie, sobbed she, do you know Miss Emily's gone? Gone where? Way off, six miles, to stay all summer. But Willie only laughed. Six miles, said he, that's a terrible way, certainly. But I can't see her any more, said Gertie. "'You can see her next winter,' rejoined Willie. "'Oh, but that's so long,' said the child. "'What makes you think so much of her?' asked Willie. "'She thinks much of me. "'She can't see me, and she likes me better than anybody but Uncle True.' 
I don't believe it. I don't believe she likes you half as well as I do. I know she don't. How can she, when she's blind, and never saw you in her life? And I see you all the time, and love you better than I do anybody in the world, except my mother. Do you really, Willie? Yes, I do. I always think when I come home, now I'm going to see Gertie, and everything that happens all the week, I think to myself, I shall tell Gertie that. I shouldn't think you'd like me so well. Why not? Oh, because you're so handsome, and I ain't handsome a bit. I heard Ellen Chase tell Lucretta Davis the other day that she thought Gertie Flint was the worst-looking girl in the school. Then she ought to be ashamed of herself, said Willie. I guess she ain't very good-looking. I should hate the looks of her, or any other girl that said that. Oh, Willie, exclaimed Gertie, earnestly, it's true, as true as can be. No, it ain't true, said Willie. To be sure, you haven't got long curls and a round face and blue eyes, like Belle Clinton's, and nobody'd think of setting you up for a beauty. But when you've been running and have rosy cheeks, and your great black eyes shine, and you laugh so heartily as you do sometimes at anything funny, I often think you're the brightest looking girl I ever saw in my life, and I don't care what other folks think, s as long as I like your looks. I feel just as bad when you cry, or anything's the matter with you, as if it were myself. And worse. George Bray struck his little sister Mary yesterday because she tore his kite. I should have liked to give him a flogging. I wouldn't strike you, Gertie, if you tore all my playthings to pieces. Such professions of affection on Willie's part were frequent, and always responded to by a like declaration from Gertie. Nor were they mere professions. The two children loved each other dearly. They were very differently constituted. For Willie was earnest, persevering, and patient, calm in his temperament, and equal in his spirits. Gertie, on the other hand, excitable and impetuous, was constantly thrown off her guard. Her temper was easily roused, her spirits variable, her whole nature sensitive to the last degree. Willie was accustomed to be loved, expected to be loved, and was loved by everybody. Gertie had been an outcast from all affection, looked not for it. And except under favorable circumstances, and by those who knew her well, did not readily inspire it. But that they loved each other, there could be no doubt. And if in the spring the bond between them was already strong, autumn found it cemented by still firmer ties. For during Emily's absence, Willie filled her place, and his own too. And though Gertie did not forget her blind friend, she passed a most happy summer. And continued to make such progress in her studies at school that when Emily returned to the city in October, she could hardly understand how so much had been accomplished in what had seemed to her so short a time. The following winter, too, was passed most profitably by Gertie. Miss Graham's kindly feeling towards her little protege, far from having diminished, seemed to have been increased by time and absence, and Gertie's visits to Emily became more frequent than ever. The profit derived from these visits was not all on Gertie's part. Emily had been in the habit, the previous winter, of hearing her read occasionally, that she might judge of her proficiency. Now, however, she discovered on the first trial that the little girl had attained to a greater degree of excellence in this accomplishment than is common among grown people. She read understandingly, and her accent and intonations were so admirable that Emily found rare pleasure in listening to her. Partly with a view to the child's benefit, and partly for her own gratification, she proposed that Gertie should come every day and read to her for an hour. Gertie was only too happy to oblige her dear Miss Emily, who, in making the proposal, represented it as a personal favor to herself, and a plan by which Gertie's eyes could serve for them both. It was agreed that when True started on his lamplighting expeditions, he should take Gertie to Mr. Graham's and call for her on his return. Owing to this arrangement, Gertie was constant and punctual in her attendance at the appointed time, and none but those who have tried it are aware what a large amount of reading may be accomplished in six months, if only an hour is devoted to it regularly each day. Emily, in her choice of books, did not confine herself to such as come strictly within a child's comprehension. She judged rightly that a girl of such keen intelligence as Gertie was naturally endowed with would suffer nothing by occasionally encountering what was beyond her comprehension. 
but that, on the contrary, the very effort she would be called upon to make would enlarge her capacity, and be an incentive to her genius. So history, biography, and books of travels were perused by Gertie at an age when most children's literary pursuits are confined to stories and pictures. The child seemed, indeed, to give the preference to this comparatively solid reading, and aided by Emily's kind explanations and encouragement, she stored up in her little brain many an important fact and much useful information. At Gertie's age the memory is strong and retentive, and things impressed on the mind then are usually better remembered than what is learned in after years, when the thoughts are more disturbed and divided. Her especial favorite was a little work on astronomy, which puzzled her more than all the rest put together, but which delighted her in the same proportion, for it made some things clear, and all the rest, though a mystery still, was to her a beautiful mystery, and one which she fully meant some time to explore to the uttermost. And this ambition to learn more, and understand better, by and by, was after all the greatest good she derived. Awaken a child's ambition, and implant in her a taste for literature, and more is gained than by years of schoolroom drudgery, where the heart works not in unison with the head. From the time Gertie was first admitted, until she was twelve years old, she continued to attend the public schools, and was rapidly advanced and promoted. But what she learned with Miss Graham, and acquired by study with Willie at home, formed nearly as important a part of her education. Willie, as we have said, was very fond of study, and was delighted at Gertie's warm participation in his favorite pursuit. They were a great advantage to each other, for each found encouragement in the other's sympathy and cooperation. After the first year or two of their acquaintance, Willie could not be properly called a child, for he was in his fifteenth year, and beginning to look quite manly. But Gertie's eagerness for knowledge had all the more influence upon him. For if the little girl ten years of age was patient and willing to labor at her books until after nine o'clock, the youth of fifteen must not rub his eyes and plead weariness. It was when they had reached these respective years that they commenced studying French together. Willie's former teacher continued to feel a kindly interest in the boy, who had long been his best scholar, and who would certainly have borne away from his class the first prizes, had not a higher duty called him to inferior labors previous to the public exhibition. Whenever he met him in the street or elsewhere, he inquired concerning his mode of life, and whether he continued his studies. Finding that Willie had considerable spare time, he earnestly advised him to learn the French language, that being a branch of knowledge which would undoubtedly prove useful to him, whatever business he might chance to pursue in life, and offered to lend him such books as he would need at the commencement. Willie availed himself of his teacher's advice, and his kind offer, and began to study in good earnest. When he was at home in the evening, he was in the habit of coming into True's room, partly for the sake of quiet, for True was a quiet man, and had too great a veneration for learning to interrupt the students with his questions, and partly for the sake of being with Gertie, who was usually at that time occupied with her books. Gertie, as may be supposed, conceived a strong desire to learn French too. Willie was willing she should try, but had no confidence that she would long persevere. To his surprise, however, she not only discovered a wonderful determination, but a decided talent for language. And, as Emily furnished her with books similar to Willie's, she kept pace with him, oftentimes translating more during the week than he could find time to do. On Saturday evening, when they always had a fine study time together, True would sit on his old settle by the fire, watching Willie and Gertie, side by side at the table, with their eyes bent on the page, which to him seemed the greatest of earthly labyrinths. Gertie always looked out the words, in which employment she had great skill, her bright eyes diving, as if by magic, into the very heart of the dictionary, and transfixing the right word at a glance, while Willie's province was to make sense. Almost the only occasion when True was known to disturb them, by a word even, was when he first heard Willie talk about making sense. "'Making sense, Willie?' said the old man. "'Is that what you're after? Well, you couldn't do a better business. I'll warrant you a market for it. There's want enough on it in the world.' It was but natural that, under such favorable influences as Gertie enjoyed, with Emily to advise and direct, and Willie to aid and encourage, her intellect should rapidly expand and strengthen. 
but how is it with that little heart of hers that at once warm and affectionate impulsive sensitive and passionate now throbs with love and gratitude and now again burns as vehemently with a consuming fire that a sense of wrong a consciousness of injury to herself or her friends would at any moment enkindle has she in two years of happy childhood learned self-control has she also attained to an enlightened sense of the distinction between right and wrong truth and falsehood in short has emily been true to her self-imposed trust her high resolve to soften the heart and instruct the soul of the little ignorant one has gertie learned religion has she found out god and begun to walk patiently in that path which is lit by a holy light and leads to rest she has begun and though her footsteps often falter though she sometimes quite turns aside and impatient of the narrow way gives the rein to her old irritability and ill-temper she is yet but a child and there is the strongest foundation for hopefulness in the sincerity of her good intentions and the depth of her contrition when wrong has had the mastery emily has spared no pains in teaching her where to place her strong reliance and gertie has already learned to look to higher aid than emily's and to lean on a mightier arm miss graham had appointed for herself no easy task when she undertook to inform the mind and heart of a child utterly untaught in the ways of virtue in some important points however she experienced far less difficulty than she had anticipated for instance after her first explanation to gertie of the difference between honesty and dishonesty the truth and a lie she never had any cause to complain of the child whose whole nature was the very reverse of deceptive and whom nothing but extreme fear had ever driven to the meanness of falsehood if gertie's greatest fault lay in a proud and easily roused temper that very fault carried with it its usual accompaniment of frankness and sincerity under almost any circumstances gertie would have been too proud to keep back the truth even before she became too virtuous emily was convinced before she had known gertie six months that she could always depend upon her word and nothing could have been a greater encouragement to miss graham's unselfish efforts than the knowledge that truth the root of every holy thing had thus easily and early been made to take up its abode in the child but this sensitive proud temper of gertie's seemed an inborn thing abuse and tyranny had not been able to crush it on the contrary it had flourished in the midst of the unfavorable influences amid which she had been nurtured kindness could accomplish almost anything with her could convince and restrain but restraint from any other source was unbearable and however proper and necessary a check it might be she was always disposed to resent it emily knew that to such a spirit even parental control is seldom sufficient she knew of but one influence that is strong enough one power that never fails to quell and subdue earthly pride and passion the power of christian humility engrafted into the heart the humility of principle of conscience the only power to which native pride will ever pay homage she knew that a command of almost any kind laid upon gertie by herself or uncle true would be promptly obeyed for in either case the little girl would know that the order was given in love and she would fulfil it in the same spirit but to provide for all contingencies and to make the heart right as well as the life it was necessary to inspire her with a higher motive than merely pleasing either of these friends and in teaching her the spirit of her divine master emily was making her powerful to do and to suffer to bear and to forbear when depending on herself she should be left to her own guidance alone how much gertie had improved in the two years that had passed since she first began to be so carefully instructed and provided for the course of our story must develop we cannot pause to dwell upon the trials and struggles the failures and victories that she experienced it is sufficient to say that miss graham was satisfied and hopeful true proud and overjoyed while mrs sullivan and even old mr cooper declared she had improved wonderfully in her behavior and her looks and was remarkably mannerly for such a child end of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of the lamplighter this librivox recording is in the public domain Recording by Bridget Gage. The Lamplighter by Maria Susanna Cummins. Chapter 13. 
No caprice of mind, no passing influence of idle time, no popular show, no clamor from the crowd, can move him, erring, from the path of right. W. G. Sims One Saturday evening in December, the third winter of Gertie's residence with True, Willie came in with his French books under his arm, and after the first salutations were over, exclaimed, as he threw the grammar and dictionary upon the table, "'Oh, Gertie, before we begin to study, I must tell you and Uncle True the funniest thing that happened to-day. I have been laughing so at home, as I was telling Mother about it.' "'I heard you laugh,' said Gertie. "'If I had not been so busy, I should have gone into your mother's room, to hear what it was so very droll. But come, do tell us.' "'Why, you will not think it's anything like a joke when I begin. And I should not be so much amused, if she hadn't been the very queerest old woman that I ever saw in my life.' "'Old woman? You haven't told us about any old woman.' "'But I'm going to,' said Willie. "'You noticed how everything was covered with ice this morning? How splendidly it looked, didn't it? I declare, when the sun shone on that great elm-tree in front of our shop, I thought I never saw anything so handsome in my life. But there, that's nothing to do with my old woman. Only that the sidewalks were just like everything else. A perfect glare.' "'I know it,' interrupted Gertie. "'I fell down going to school.' "'Did you?' said Willie. "'Didn't you get hurt?' "'No, indeed. But go on. I want to hear about your old woman.' "'I was standing at the shop door, about eleven o'clock, looking out, when I saw the strangest-looking figure that you ever imagined coming down the street. I must tell you how she was dressed. She did look so ridiculous. She had on some kind of a black silk or satin gown, made very scant, and trimmed all round with some brownish-looking lace. Black, I suppose it had been once, but it isn't now.' Then she had a grey cloak, of some sort of silk material, that you certainly would have said came out of the ark, if it hadn't been for a little cape of a different colour, that she wore outside of it, and which must have dated a generation further back. I would not undertake to describe her bonnet, only I know it was twice as big as anybody's else, and she had a figured lace veil thrown over one side, that reached nearly to her feet. But her goggles were the crowner, such immense, horrid-looking things I never saw. She had a work-bag, made of black silk, with pieces of cloth of all the colors in the rainbow sewed on to it, zigzag. Then her pocket-handkerchief was pinned to her bag, and a great feather fan, only think at this season of the year, that was pinned on somewhere, by a string, I suppose, and a bundle-handkerchief, and a newspaper. Oh, gracious, I can't think of half the things, but they were all pinned together with great brass pins, and hung in a body on her left arm, all depending on the strength of the bag string. Her dress, though, wasn't the strangest thing about her. What made it too funny was to see her way of walking. She looked quite old and infirm, and it was evident she could hardly keep her footing on the ice. And yet she walked with such a smirk, such a consequential little air. Oh, Gertie, it's lucky you didn't see her— "'You'd have laughed from then till this time.' "'Some poor crazy critter, wasn't she?' asked True. "'Oh, no,' said Willie. "'I don't think she was. "'Queer enough, to be sure, but not crazy. "'Just as she got opposite the shop door, her feet slipped, "'and the first thing I knew she fell flat on the sidewalk. "'I rushed out, for I thought the fall might have killed the poor little thing, "'and Mr. Bray and a gentleman he was waiting upon followed me. "'She did appear stunned at first but we carried her into the shop, and she came to her senses in a minute or two. "'Crazy, you asked if she were, Uncle True. No, not she. She's as bright as a dollar. As soon as she opened her eyes and seemed to know what she was about, she felt for her work-bag and all its appendages, counted them up to see if the number were right, and then nodded her head very satisfactorily. Mr. Bray poured out a glass of cordial and offered it to her. By this time she had got her airs and graces back again, so when he recommended to her to swallow the cordial, she retreated, with a little old-fashioned curtsy, and put up both hands to express her horror at the idea of such a thing. The gentleman that was standing by smiled, and advised her to take it, telling her it would do her no harm. Upon that, she turned round, made another curtsy to him, and answered in a little cracked voice, "'Can you assure me, sir, as a gentleman of candor and gallantry, that it is not an exhilarating potion? The gentleman could hardly keep from laughing, but he told her it was nothing that would hurt her. 
Then, said she, I will venture to sip the beverage. It has a most aromatic fragrance. She seemed to like the taste, as well as the smell, for she drank every drop of it. And when she had set the glass down on the counter, she turned to me and said, Except upon this gentleman's assurance of the harmlessness of the liquid, I would not have swallowed it in your presence, my young master, if it were only for the example. I have set my seal to no temperance pledge, but I am abstemious because it becomes a lady. It is with me a matter of choice, a matter of taste. She now seemed quite restored, and talked of starting again on her walk. But it really was not safe for her to go alone on the ice, and I rather think Mr. Bray thought so, for he asked her where she was going. She told him, in her roundabout way, that she was proceeding to pass the day with Mistress Somebody that lived in the neighborhood of the common. I touched Mr. Bray's arm, and said in a low voice, that if he could spare me, I'd go with her. He said he shouldn't want me for an hour, so I offered her my arm, and told her I should be happy to wait upon her. You ought to have seen her then. If I had been a grown-up man, and she a young lady, she couldn't have tossed her head or giggled more. But she took my arm, and we started off. I knew Mr. Bray and the gentleman were laughing to see us. But I didn't care. I pitied the old lady, and I did not mean she should get another tumble. Every person we met stared at us, and it's no wonder they did, for we must have been a most absurd-looking couple. She not only accepted my offered crook, but clasped her hands together round it, making a complete handle of her two arms, and so she hung on with all her might. But there, I ought not to laugh at the poor thing, for she needed somebody to help her along, and I'm sure she wasn't heavy enough to tire me out, if she did make the most of herself. I wonder who she belongs to. I shouldn't think her friends would let her go about the streets so, especially such walking as it is to-day. "'What's her name?' inquired Gertie. "'Didn't you find out?' "'No,' answered Willie. "'She wouldn't tell me. I asked her, but she only said, in her little cracked voice, and here Willie began to laugh immoderately, that she was the incognito, and that it was part of a true and gallant knight to discover the name of his fair lady. Oh, I promise you she was a case. Why, you never heard any one talk so ridiculously as she did. I asked her how old she was. Mother says that was very impolite. But it's the only uncivil thing I did, or said, as the old lady would testify herself, if she were here. How old is she? said Gertie. Sixteen. Why, Willie, what do you mean? That's what she told me, returned Willie, and a true and gallant knight is bound to believe his fair lady. Poor body, said True, she's childish. No, she isn't, Uncle True, said Willie. You'd think so part of the time, to hear her run on with her nonsense. And then the next minute, she'd speak as sensibly as anybody, and say how much obliged she was to me for showing such a spirit of conformity as to be willing to put myself to so much trouble for the sake of an old woman like her. Just as we turned into Beacon Street, we met a whole school of girls, blooming beauties, handsome enough to kill, my old lady called them, and from the instant they came in sight, she seemed to take it for granted I should try to get away from her and run after some of them. But she held on with a vengeance, it's lucky I had no idea of forsaking her, for it would have been impossible. Some of them stopped and stared at us. Of course, I didn't care how much they stared. But she seemed to think I should be terribly mortified. And when we had passed them all, she complimented me again and again on my spirit of conformity, her favorite expression. Here Willie paused, quite out of breath. True clapped him upon the shoulder. "'Good boy, Willie,' said he. "'Clever boy. You always look out for the old folks, and that's right. Respect for the aged is a good thing, though your grandfather says it's very much out of fashion.' "'I don't know much about fashion, Uncle True, but I should think it was a pretty mean sort of a boy that would see an old lady get one fall on the ice, and not save her from another by seeing her safe home.' "'Willie's always kind to everybody,' said Gertie. "'Willie's either a hero,' said the boy, "'or else he has got two pretty good friends. "'I rather think it's the latter. "'But come, Gertie. "'Charles the Twelfth is waiting for us, "'and we must study as much as we can to-night. "'We may not have another chance very soon. "'For Mr. Bray isn't well this evening. "'He seems threatened with a fever, "'and I promise to go back to the shop after dinner to-morrow. "'If he should be sick, I shall have plenty to do, "'without coming home at all.' "'Oh, I hope Mr. Bray is not going to have a fever,' said True and Gertie, in the same breath. 
"'He's such a clever man,' said True. "'He's so good to you, Willie,' added Gertie. Willie hoped not to, but his hopes gave place to his fears, when he found, on the following day, that his kind master was not able to leave his bed. The doctor pronounced his symptoms alarming. A typhoid fever set in, which in a few days terminated the life of the excellent apothecary. The death of Mr. Bray was so sudden and dreadful a blow to Willie, that he did not at first realize the important bearing the event had upon his own fortunes. The shop was closed, the widow having determined to dispose of the stock and remove into the country as soon as possible. Willie was thus left without employment, and deprived of Mr. Bray's valuable recommendation and assistance. His earnings during the past year had been very considerable, and had added essentially to the comfort of his mother and grandfather, who had thus been enabled to relax the severity of their own labors. The thought of being a burden to them, even for a day, was intolerable to the independent and energetic spirit of the boy, and he earnestly set himself to work to obtain another place. He commenced by applying to the different apothecaries in the city, but none of them wanted a youth of his age, and one day was spent in fruitless inquiries. He returned home at night disappointed, but not by any means discouraged. If he could not obtain employment with an apothecary, he would do something else. But what should he do? That was the question. He had long talks with his mother about it. She felt that his talents and education entitled him to fill a position equal, certainly, to that he had already occupied, and could not endure the thought of his descending to a more menial service. Willie, without too much self-esteem, thought so too. He knew, indeed, that he was capable of giving satisfaction in a station which required more business talent than his situation at Mr. Bray's had ever given scope to. But if he could not obtain such a place as he desired, he would take what he could get. So he made every possible inquiry. But he had no one to speak a good word for him, and he could not expect people to feel confidence in a boy concerning whom they knew nothing. So he met with no success, and day after day returned home silent and depressed. He dreaded to meet his mother and grandfather after every fresh failure. The careworn, patient face of the former turned towards him, so hopefully, that he could not bear to sadden it by the recital of any new disappointment, and his grandfather's incredulity in the possibility of his ever having anything to do again was equally tantalizing, so long as he saw no hope of convincing him to the contrary. After a week or two, Mrs. Sullivan avoided asking him any questions concerning the occurrences of the day, for her watchful eye saw how much such inquiries pained him and therefore she waited for him to make his communications, if he had any. Sometimes nothing was said on either side of the manner in which Willie had passed his day, and many an application did he make for employment, many a mortifying rebuff did he receive, of which his mother never knew. End of chapter 13《This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bridget Gage. The Lamplighter by Maria Susanna Cummins. Chapter 14. Yet where an equal poise of hope and fear does arbitrate the event, my nature is that I incline to hope rather than fear. Camus. This was altogether a new experience to Willie, and one of the most trying he could have been called upon to bear. But he bore it and bore it bravely kept all his worst struggles from his anxious mother and desponding grandfather, and resolved manfully to hope against hope. Gertie was now his chief comforter. He told her all his troubles, and, young as she was, she was a wonderful consoler, always looking on the bright side, always prophesying better luck to-morrow. She did much towards keeping up his hopes and strengthening his resolutions. Gertie was so quick, sagacious, and observing— that she knew more than most children of the various ways in which things are often brought about, and she sometimes made valuable suggestions to Willie, of which he gladly availed himself. Among others, she one day asked him if he had applied at the intelligence offices. He had never thought of it, wondered he had not, but would try the plan the very next day. He did so, and for a time was buoyed up with the hopes held out to him. But they proved fleeting, and he was now almost in despair when his eye fell upon an advertisement in a newspaper, which seemed to afford still another chance. 
He showed the notice to Gertie. It was just the thing. He had only to apply. He was the very boy that man wanted. Just fifteen, smart, capable, and trustworthy. And would like, when he had learned the business, to go into partnership. That was what was required, and Willie was the very person. She was sure. Gertie was so sanguine that Willie presented himself the next day at the place specified, with a more eager countenance than he had ever yet worn. The gentleman, a sharp-looking man, with very keen eyes, talked with him some time, asked a great many questions, made the boy very uncomfortable by hinting his doubts about his capability and honesty, and finally wound up by declaring that, under the most favorable circumstances, and with the very best recommendations, he could not think of engaging with any young man, unless his friends were willing to take some interest in the concern, and invest a small amount on his account. This, of course, made the place out of the question for Willie, even if he had liked the man, which he did not, for he felt in his heart that he was a knave, or not many degrees removed from one. Until now he had never thought of despairing, but when he went home after this last interview, it was with such a heavy heart that it seemed to him utterly impossible to meet his mother, and so he went directly to True's room. It was the night before Christmas. True had gone out, and Gertie was alone. There was a bright fire in the stove, and the room was dimly lighted by the last rays of the winter sunset, and by the glare of the coals, seen through one of the open doors of the stove. Gertie was engaged in stirring up an Indian cake for tea, one of the few branches of the cooking department in which she had acquired some little skill. She was just coming from the pantry, with a scoop full of meal in her hand, when Willie entered at the opposite door. The manner in which he tossed his cap upon the settle, and seating himself at the table, leaned his head upon both his hands, betrayed at once to Gertie the defeat the poor boy had met with in this last encounter with ill fate. It was so unlike Willie to come in without even speaking. It was such a strange thing to see his bright young head bowed down with care, and his elastic figure looking tired and old, that Gertie knew at once his brave heart had given way. She laid down the scoop, and walking softly and slowly up to him, touched his arm with her hand, and looked up anxiously into his face. Her sympathetic touch and look were more than he could bear. He laid his head on the table, and in a minute more Gertie heard great heavy sobs, each one of which sank deep into her soul. She often cried herself, it seemed only natural. But Willie, the laughing, happy, light-hearted Willie, she had never seen him cry, she didn't know he could. She crept up on the rounds of his chair, and putting her arm round his neck whispered, "'I shouldn't mind, Willie, if I didn't get the place.' I don't believe it's a good place. I don't believe it is either, said Willie, lifting up his head. But what shall I do? I can't get any place, and I can't stay here doing nothing. We like to have you at home, said Gertie. It's pleasant enough to be at home. I was always glad enough to come when I lived at Mr. Bray's, and was earning something, and could feel as if anybody was glad to see me. Everybody is glad to see you now. "'But not as they were then,' said Willie, rather impatiently. "'Mother always looks as if she expected to hear I'd got something to do. "'And Grandfather, I believe, never thought I should be good for much. "'And now, just as I was beginning to earn something, and be a help to them, I've lost my chance. "'But that ain't your fault, Willie. You couldn't help Mr. Bray's dying. "'I shouldn't think Mr. Cooper would blame you for not having anything to do now.' He don't blame me, but if you were in my place, you'd feel just as I do, to see him sit in his armchair, evenings, and groan and look up at me, as much as to say, It's you I'm groaning about. He thinks this is a dreadful world, and that he's never seen any good luck in it himself. So I suppose he thinks I never shall. I think you will, said Gertie. I think you'll be rich some time, and then won't he be astonished. "'Oh, Gertie, you're a nice child, and think I can do anything. "'If ever I am rich, I promise to go shares with you. "'But,' added he despondently, "'tain't so easy. "'I used to think I could make money when I grew up, "'but it's a pretty slow business.' "'Here he was on the point of leaning down upon the table again, "'and giving himself up to melancholy. "'But Gertie caught hold of his hands. "'Come,' said she, "'Willie, don't think any more about it. "'People have troubles always, but they get over em. Perhaps next week you'll be in a better shop than Mr. Bray's, and we shall be as happy as ever. 
"'Do you know,' said she, by way of changing the subject, "'a species of tact which children understand as well as grown people. "'It's just two years to-night since I came here.' "'Is it?' said Willie. "'Did Uncle True bring you home with him the night before Christmas?' "'Yes.' "'Why, that was Santa Claus carrying you to good things "'instead of bringing good things to you, wasn't it?' "'Gertie did not know anything about Santa Claus, "'that special friend of children. "'And Willie, who had only lately read about him in some book, "'undertook to tell her what he knew of the veteran toy dealer. "'Finding the interest of the subject had engaged his thoughts in spite of himself, "'Gertie returned to her cooking, "'listening attentively, however, to his story, "'while she stirred up the corn-cake.' When he had finished, she was just putting her cake in the oven, and as she sat on her knee by the stove, swinging the handle of the oven door in her hand, her eyes twinkled with such a merry look that Willie exclaimed, "'What are you thinking of, Gertie, that makes you look so sly?' "'I was thinking that perhaps Santa Claus would come for you to-night. If he comes for folks that need something, I expect he'll come for you, and carry you to some place where you'll have a chance to grow rich.' "'Very likely,' said Willie. "'He'll clap me into his bag and trudge off with me as a present to somebody. "'Some old Croesus that will give me a fortune for the asking. "'I do hope he will, for if I don't get something to do before New Year, "'I shall give up in despair.' "'True came in now, and interrupted the children's conversation "'by the display of a fine turkey, a Christmas present from Mr. Graham. "'He had also a book for Gertie, a gift from Emily. "'Isn't that queer?' exclaimed Gertie. "'Willie was just saying you were my Santa Claus, Uncle True, and I do believe you are.' As she spoke, she opened the book, and in the frontispiece was a portrait of that individual. "'It looks like him, Willie. I declare it does,' shouted she. "'A fur cap, a pipe, and such a pleasant face. "'Oh, Uncle True, if you only had a sack full of toys over your shoulder, instead of your lantern and that great turkey, you would be a complete Santa Claus. "'Haven't you got anything for Willie, Uncle True?' "'Yes, I've got a little something, but I'm afeard he won't think much on it. "'It's only a bit of a note.' "'A note for me?' inquired Willie. "'Who can it be from?' "'Can't say,' said True, fumbling in his great pockets. "'Only just round the corner I met a man who stopped me to inquire where Miss Sullivan lived. "'I told him she lived just here, and I'd show him the house. "'When he saw I belonged here, too, he give me this little scrap of paper, "'and asked me to hand it over.' "'as it was directed to Master William Sullivan. "'I suppose that's you, ain't it?' "'He now handed Willie the slip of paper, "'and the boy, taking True's lantern in his hand, "'and holding the note up to the light, read aloud, "'R. H. Clinton would like to see William Sullivan "'on Thursday morning, between ten and eleven o'clock, "'at number eighteen, blank wharf.' "'Willie looked up in amazement. "'What does it mean?' said he. "'I don't know any such person.' "'I know who he is,' said True. "'Why, it's he as lives in the great stone house in Blank Street. "'He's a rich man, and that's the number of his store, "'his counting-room, rather, on Blank Wharf. "'What, father to those pretty children we used to see in the window? "'The very same. "'What can he want of me?' "'Very like he wants your services,' suggested True. "'Then it's a place,' cried Gertie, "'a real good one, and Santa Claus came and brought it. "'I said he would.' "'Oh, Willie, I'm so glad.' Willie did not know whether to be glad or not. It was such a strange message, coming, too, from an utter stranger. He could not but hope, as Gertie and True did, that it might prove the dawning of some good fortune. But he had reasons, of which they were not aware, for believing that no offer from this quarter could be available to him, and therefore made them both promise to give no hint of the matter to his mother or Mr. Cooper. On Thursday, which was the next day but one, being the day after Christmas, Willie presented himself at the appointed time and place. Mr. Clinton, a gentlemanly man, with a friendly countenance, received him very kindly, asked him but few questions, and did not even mention such a thing as a recommendation from his former employer, but telling him that he was in want of a young man to fill the place of junior clerk in his counting-room, offered him the situation. Willie hesitated, for though the offer was most encouraging to his future prospects, Mr. Clinton made no mention of any salary, and that was a thing the youth could not dispense with. Seeing that he was undecided, Mr. Clinton said, "'Perhaps you do not like my proposal, or have already made some other engagement.' "'No, indeed,' answered Willie, quickly. 
"'You are very kind to feel so much confidence in a stranger "'as to be willing to receive me, "'and your offer is a most unexpected and welcome one. "'But I have been in a retail store "'where I obtained regular earnings, "'which were very important to my mother and grandfather. "'I had far rather be in a counting-room like yours, sir, "'and I think I might learn to be of use. "'But I know there are numbers of boys, "'sons of rich men, "'who would be glad to be employed by you.' and would ask no compensation for their services, so that I could not expect any salary, at least for some years. I should indeed be well repaid, at the end of that time, by the knowledge I might gain of mercantile affairs. But unfortunately, sir, I can no more afford it than I could afford to go to college. The gentleman smiled. How did you know so much of these matters, my young friend? I have heard, sir, from boys who were at school with me, and are now clerks in mercantile houses that they received no pay. And I always considered it a perfectly fair arrangement. But it was the reason why I felt bound to content myself with a position I held in an apothecary shop, which, though it was not suited to my taste, enabled me to support myself, and to relieve my mother, who was a widow, and my grandfather, who was old and poor. Your grandfather is... Mr. Cooper, sexton of Mr. Arnold's church. Aha! said Mr. Clinton. I know him. "'What you say, William,' added he, after a moment's pause, "'is perfectly true. "'We are not in the habit of paying any salary to our young clerks, "'and are overrun with applications at that rate. "'But I have heard good accounts of you, my boy. "'I shan't tell you where I had my information, "'though I see you look very curious. "'And, moreover, I like your countenance, "'and believe you will serve me faithfully. "'So if you will tell me what you received from Mr. Bray, "'I will pay you the same next year.' and after that increase your salary, if I find you deserve it. And if you please, you shall commence with me the first of January. Willie thanked Mr. Clinton in the fewest possible words, and hastened away. The senior clerk, who as he leaned over his accounts, listened to the conversation, thought the boy did not express much gratitude, considering the unusual generosity of the merchant's offer. But the merchant himself, who was watching the boy's countenance, while despondency gave place to surprise, and surprise again was superseded by hope, joy, and a most sincere thankfulness, saw there a gratitude too deep to express itself in words, and remembered the time when he too, the only son of his mother, and she a widow, had come alone to the city, sought long for employment, and finding it at last, had sat down to write and tell her how he hoped soon to earn enough for himself and her. The grass had been growing on that parent's grave, far back in the country, more than twenty years, and the merchant's face was furrowed with the lines of care. But as he returned slowly to his desk, and unconsciously traced on a blank sheet of paper, and with a dry pen, the words, Dear Mother, she for the time became a living image, he a boy again, and those invisible words were the commencement of the very letter that carried her the news of his good fortune. No. The boy was not ungrateful, or the merchant would not thus have been reminded of the time when his own heart had been so deeply stirred. And the spirits of those mothers, who have wept, prayed, and thanked God over similar communications from much-loved sons, may know how to rejoice and sympathize with good little Mrs. Sullivan when she heard from Willie the joyful tidings. Mr. Cooper and Gertie also have their prototypes in many an old man, whose dim and world-worn eye lights up occasionally with the hope that, disappointed as he has been himself, he cannot help cherishing for his grandson, and in many a proud little sister, who now sees her noble brother appreciated by others, as he has always been by her. Nor on such an occasion is the band of rejoicing ones complete, without some such hearty friend as true to come in unexpectedly, tap the boy on the shoulder, and exclaim, "'Ah, Master Willie, they needn't have worried about you, need they? I've told your grandfather, more than once, that I was of the opinion t'would all come out right at last.' The great mystery of the whole matter was Mr. Clinton's ever having heard of Willie at all. Mrs. Sullivan thought over all her small circle of acquaintances, and suggested a great many impossible ways. But as, with much conjecturing, they came no nearer to the truth, they finally concluded to do as Gertie did, set it all down to the agency of Santa Claus. End of chapter 14「Chapter 15 of the Lamplighter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bridget Gage. The Lamplighter by Maria Susanna Cummins. Chapter 15. 
Whether the day its wonted course renewed, or midnight Virgils wrapped the world in shade, her tender task assiduous she pursued, to soothe his anguish, or his wants to aid. Blacklock. I wonder, said Miss Peacout, as she leaned both her hands on the sill of the front window, and looked up and down the street, a habit in which she indulged herself for about ten minutes, after she had washed up the breakfast things, and before she trimmed the solar lamp. I wonder who that slender girl is that walks by here every morning, with that feeble-looking old man leaning on her arm. I always see them at just about this time, when the weather and walking are good. She's a nice child, I know, and seems to be very fond of the old man, probably her grandfather. I notice she's careful to leave the best side of the walk for him, and she watches every step he takes. She needs to, indeed, for he totters sadly. Poor little thing! She looks pale and anxious. I wonder if she takes all the care of the old man. But they are quite out of sight, and Miss Peacout turns round to wonder whether the solar lamp doesn't need a new wick. I wonder, said old Miss Grumble, as she sat at her window, a little further down the street, if I should live to be old and infirm. Mrs. Grumble was over seventy, but as yet suffered from no infirmity but that of a very irritable temper. I wonder if anybody would wait upon me, and take care of me, as that little girl does of her grandfather. No, I'll warrant not. Who can the patient little creature be? There, look, Belle, said one young girl to another, as they walked up the shady side of the street on their way to school. There's the girl that we meet every day with the old man. How can you say you don't think she's pretty? I admire her looks. You always do manage, Kitty, to admire people that everybody else thinks are horrid-looking. Horrid-looking, replied Kitty, in a provoked tone. She's anything but horrid-looking. Do notice now, Belle, when we meet them. She has the sweetest way of looking up in the old man's face and talking to him. I wonder what is the matter with him. Do you see how his arm shakes, the one that's passed through hers? The two couples are now close to each other, and they pass in silence. "'Don't you think she has an interesting face?' said Kitty, eagerly, as soon as they were out of hearing. "'She's got handsome eyes,' answered Belle. "'I don't see anything else that looks interesting about her. "'I wonder if she don't hate to have to walk in the street with that old grandfather, "'trudging along so slow, with the sun shining right in her face, "'and he leaning on her arm, and shaking so he can hardly stand on his feet. "'I wouldn't do it for anything.' "'Why, Belle!' exclaimed Kitty. "'How can you talk so? "'I'm sure I pity that old man dreadfully.' "'Lor!' said Belle. "'What's the use of pitying? "'If you are going to begin to pity, "'you'll have to do it all the time. "'Look!' "'And here Belle touched her companion's elbow. "'There's Willie Sullivan, father's clerk. "'Ain't he a beauty? "'I want to stop and speak to him.' "'But before she could address a word to him, "'Willie, who was walking very fast, passed her with a bow, and a pleasant, "'Good morning, Miss Isabel. "'And ere she had recovered from the surprise and disappointment, "'with some rods down the street. "'Polite,' muttered the pretty Isabel. "'Why, Belle, do see,' said Kitty, "'who was looking back over her shoulder. "'He's overtaken the old man and my interesting little girl. "'Look, look! "'He's put the old man's other arm through his, "'and they are all three walking off together. "'Isn't that quite a coincidence?' "'Nothing very remarkable,' replied Belle, who seemed a little annoyed. "'I suppose they are persons he's acquainted with. Come, make haste. We shall be late at school.' "'Reader, do you wonder who they are, the girl and the old man? Or have you already conjectured that they are no other than Gertie and Truman Flint? True is no longer the brave, strong, sturdy protector of the feeble, lonely child. The cases are quite reversed.' True has had a paralytic stroke. His strength is gone, his power even to walk alone. He sits all day in his armchair, or on the old settle, when he is not out walking with Gertie. The blow came suddenly, struck down the robust man, and left him feeble as a child. And the little stranger, the orphan girl, who, in her weakness, her loneliness, and her poverty, found in him a father and a mother, she now is all the world to him, his staff, his stay, his comfort, and his hope. During four or five years that he has cherished the frail blossom, she has been gaining strength for the time when he should be the leaning, she the sustaining power. 
and when the time came, and it came full soon, she was ready to respond to the call. With the simplicity of a child, but a woman's firmness, with the stature of a child, but a woman's capacity, the earnestness of a child, but a woman's perseverance, from morning till night, the faithful little nurse and housekeeper labors untiringly in the service of her first, her best friend, ever at his side, ever attending to his wants, and yet most wonderfully accomplishing many things which he never sees her do. She seems, indeed, to the fond old man, what he once prophesied she would become, God's embodied blessing to his latter years, making light his closing days, and cheering even the pathway to the grave. Though disease had robbed True's limbs of all their power, the blast had happily spared his mind, which was clear and tranquil as ever, while his pious heart was fixed in humble trust on that God whose presence and love he had ever acknowledged, and on whom he so fully relied, that even in this bitter trial he was able to say, in perfect submission, Thy will, not mine, be done. Little did those who wondered, as day after day they watched the invalid and his childish guardian, at the patience and self-sacrifice of the devoted girl, little did they understand the emotions of Gertie's loving, grateful heart. Little did they realize the joy it was to her to sustain and support her beloved friend. Little did she, who would have been too proud to walk with the old paralytic, know what Gertie's pride was made of. She would have wondered, had she been told, that the heart of the girl, whom she would have pitied, could she have spared time to pity any one, had never swelled with so fervent and noble a satisfaction as when, with a trembling old man leaning on her arm, she gloried in the burden. The outward world was nothing at all to her. She cared not for the conjectures of the idle, the curious, or the vain. She lived for true now. She might almost be said to live in him, so wholly were her thoughts bent on promoting his happiness, prolonging and blessing his days. It had not long been thus. Only about two months previous, to the morning of which we have been speaking, had True been stricken down with this weighty affliction. He had been in failing health, but had still been able to attend to all his duties and labors, until one day, in the month of June, when Gertie went into his room, and found, to her surprise, that he had not risen, although it was much later than his usual hour. On going to the bedside and speaking to him, she perceived that he looked strangely, and had lost the power of replying to her questions. Bewildered and frightened, she ran to call Mrs. Sullivan. A physician was summoned. The case pronounced one of paralysis, and for a time there seemed reason to fear that it would prove fatal. He soon, however, began to amend, recovered his speech, and in a week or two was well enough to walk about, with Gertie's assistance. The doctor had recommended as much gentle exercise as possible, and every pleasant morning, before the day grew warm, Gertie presented herself bonneted and equipped for those walks, which, unknown to her, excited so much observation. She usually took advantage of this opportunity to make such little household purchases as were necessary, that she might not be compelled to go out again and leave True alone that being a thing she as much as possible avoided doing. On the occasion already alluded to, Willie accompanied them as far as the provision shop, which was their destination, and having seen True comfortably seated, proceeded to blank wharf, while Gertie stepped up to the counter to bargain for the dinner. She purchased a bit of veal suitable for broth, gazed wishfully at some tempting summer vegetables, turned away and sighed. She held in her hand the wallet which contained all their money, it had now been in her keeping for some weeks, and was growing light, so she knew it was no use to think about the vegetables, and she sighed, because she remembered how much Uncle True enjoyed the green peas last year. "'How much is the meat?' asked she of the rosy-cheeked butcher, who was wrapping it up in a paper. He named the sum. It was very little, so little that it almost seemed to Gertie as if he had seen into her purse, and her thoughts, too, and knew how glad she would be that it did not cost any more. As he handed her the change, he leaned over the counter, and asked, in an undertone, what kind of nourishment Mr. Flint was able to take. "'The doctor said any wholesome food,' replied Gertie. "'Don't you think he'd relish some green peas? I've got some first-rate ones, fresh from the country. And if you think he'd eat em, I should like to send you some. My boy shall take round half a peck or so, and I'll put the meat right in the same basket.' 
"'Thank you,' said Gertie. "'He likes green peas.' "'Very well, very well. "'Then I'll send him some beauties.' "'And he turned away to wait upon another customer, "'so quick that Gertie thought he did not see "'how the color came into her face "'and the tears into her eyes. "'But he did see, "'and that was the reason he turned away so quickly. "'He was a clever fellow, that rosy-cheeked butcher. "'True had an excellent appetite, "'enjoyed and praised the dinner exceedingly, "'and after eating heartily of it, "'fell asleep in his chair. "'The moment he awoke, "'Gertie sprung to his side, exclaiming, "'Uncle True, here's Miss Emily. "'Here's dear Miss Emily come to see you.' "'The Lord bless you, my dear, dear young lady,' said True, "'trying to rise from his chair and go towards her. "'Don't rise, Mr. Flint, I beg you will not,' exclaimed Emily, "'whose quick ear perceived the motion. "'From what Gertie tells me, I fear you are not able. "'Please give me a chair, Gertie, nearer to Mr. Flint.' "'She drew near, took True's hand.' but looked inexpressibly shocked as she observed how tremulous it had become. "'Ah, Miss Emily,' said he, "'I'm not the same man as when I saw you last. The Lord has given me a warning, and I shan't be here long.' "'I'm so sorry I did not know of this,' said Emily. "'I should have come to see you before, but I never heard of your illnesses until to-day. George, my father's man, saw you and Gertrude at a shop this morning, and mentioned it to me as soon as he came out of town.' I have been telling this little girl that she should have sent me word. Gertie was standing by True's chair, smoothing his gray locks with her slender fingers. As Emily mentioned her name, he turned and looked at her. Oh, what a look of love he gave her! Gertie never forgot it. Miss Emily, said he, "'twas no need for anybody to be troubled. The Lord provided for me his own self. All the doctors and nurses in the land couldn't have done half as much for me as this little gal o' mine. It wasn't at all in my mind some four or five years gone when I brought the little barefoot mite of a thing to my home, and when she was sick, and Ian almost dying in this very room, and I carried her in my arms night and day, that her turn would come so soon. Ah, I little thought then, Miss Emily, how the Lord would lay me low, how those very same feet would run about in my service how her bit of a hand would come in the dark nights to smooth my pillow, and I'd go about daytimes leaning on her little arm. Truly God's ways are not like our ways, nor his thoughts like our thoughts. "'Oh, Uncle True,' said Gertie, "'I don't do much for you. I wish I could do a great deal more. I wish I could make you strong again.' "'I dare say you do, my darling, but that can't be in this world. You've given me what's far better than strength the body.' "'Yes, Miss Emily,' added he, turning again towards the blind girl. "'It's you we have to thank for all the comfort we enjoy. I loved my little birdie, but I was a foolish man, and I should have spoiled her. You knew better what was for her good, and mine, too. You made her what she is now, one of the lambs of Christ, a handmaiden of the Lord. If anybody told me six months ago that I should become a poor cripple, and sit in my chair all day—' and not know who was goin' to furnish a livin' for me, or Bertie either. I should have said I never could bear my lot with patience, or keep up any heart at all. But I've learned a lesson from this little one. When I first got so I could speak, after the shock, and tell what was in my mind, I was so mightily troubled a thinkin' of my sad case, and Gertie, with nobody to work, or do anything for her, that I took on bad enough, and said, "'What shall we do now? What shall we do now?' And then she whispered in my ear, "'God will take care of us, Uncle True.' And when I forgot the saying, and asked, "'Who will feed and clothe us now?' She said again, "'The Lord will provide.' And in my deepest distress of all, when one night I was full of anxious thoughts about my child, I said aloud, "'If I die, who will take care of Gertie?' The little thing, that I supposed was sound asleep in her bed, laid her head down beside me, and said, "'Uncle True, when I was turned out into the dark streets all alone, "'and had no friends nor any home, "'my Heavenly Father sent you to me. "'And now, if he wants you to come to him, "'and is not ready to take me too, "'he will send somebody else to take care of me "'the rest of the time I stay. "'After that, Miss Emily, I gave up worrying any more. "'Her words and the blessed teachings of the holy book "'that she reads me every day "'have sunk deep into my heart, and I'm at peace.' I used to think that, if I lived and had my strength spared me, Gertie would be able to go to school, and get a sight o' learnin'. 
for she has a natural lurch for it, and it comes easy to her. She's but a slender child, and I never could bear the thought of her being driven to hard work for a livin'. She don't seem made for it somehow. I hoped, when she grew up, to see her a schoolmistress, like Miss Brown, or something in that line. But I've done being vexed about it now. I know, as she says, it's all for the best, or it wouldn't be. When he finished speaking, Gertie, whose face had been hid against his shoulder, looked up and said bravely, "'Oh, Uncle True, I'm sure I can do almost any kind of work. Mrs. Sullivan says I sew very well, and I can learn to be a milliner or a dressmaker. That isn't hard work.' "'Mr. Flint,' said Emily, "'would you be willing to trust your child with me? If you should be taken from her, would you feel as if she were safe in my charge?' "'Miss Emily,' said True, "'would I think her safe in angel-keepin'? "'I should believe her in little short o' that "'if she could have you to watch over her.' "'Oh, do not say that,' said Miss Emily, "'or I shall be afraid to undertake so solemn a trust. "'I know too well that my want of sight, "'my ill health, and my inexperience, "'almost unfit me for the care of a child like Gertie. "'But since you approve of the teaching I have already given her, "'and are so kind as to think a great deal better of me than I deserve, I know you will at least believe in the sincerity of my wish to be of use to her. And if it will be any comfort to you to know that in case of your death, I will gladly take Gertie to my home, see that she is well educated, and, as long as I live, provide for and take care of her. You have my solemn assurance, and here she laid her hand on his, that it shall be done, and that to the best of my ability I will try to make her happy." Gertie's first impulse was to rush towards Emily, and fling her arms around her neck. But she was arrested in the act, for she observed that True was weeping like an infant. In an instant his feeble head was resting upon her bosom, her hand was wiping away the great tears that had rushed to his eyes. It was an easy task, for they were tears of joy, of a joy that had quite unnerved him in his present state of prostration and weakness. The proposal was so utterly foreign to his thoughts or expectations, that it seemed to him a hope too bright to be relied upon, and after a moment's pause, an idea occurring to him which seemed to increase his doubts, he gave utterance to it in the words, "'But your father, Miss Emily, Mr. Graham, he's particular, and not over young now. I'm afeard he wouldn't like a little gale in the house.' "'My father is indulgent to me,' replied Emily. He would not object to any plans I had at heart, and I have become so much attached to Gertrude that she would be of great use and comfort to me. I trust, Mr. Flint, that you will recover a portion at least of your health and strength, and be spared to her for many a year yet. But in order that you may in no case feel any anxiety on her account, I take this opportunity to tell you that, if I should outlive you, she will be sure of a home with me. Ah, uh, Miss Emily, said the old man, my time's about out. I feel right sure o' that. And since you're willin', you'll soon be called to take charge on her. I haven't forgot how tossed I was in my mind the day after I brought her home with me, with thinkin' that p'raps I wasn't fit to undertake the care of such a little thing, and hadn't ways to make her comfortable. And then, Miss Emily, do you remember you said to me, You've done quite right. The Lord will bless and reward you. I've thought many a time since that you was a true prophet, and that your words were, what I thought em then, a whisper right from heaven. And now you talk of doin' the same thing yourself, and I, that am just goin' home to God, and feel as if I read his ways clearer than ever afore. I tell you, Miss Emily, that you are doin' right too, and if the Lord rewards you as he has done me, there'll come a time when this child will pay you back in love and care all you ever do for her. Gertie? She's not here, said Emily. I heard her run into her own room. Poor Bertie, said True. She doesn't like to hear am I leaving her. I'm sad to think how some day soon she'll almost sob her heart away over her old uncle. Never mind now. I was going to bid her to be a good child to you, but I think she will without bidding, and I can say my say to her another time. Good-bye, my dear young lady. For Emily had risen to go, and George, the manservant, was waiting at the door for her. If I never see you again, remember that you've made an old man so happy that he's nothing in this world left to wish for, and that you carry with you a dying man's best blessing, and his prayer that God may grant such perfect peace to your last days as now he does to mine. 
That evening, when True had already retired to rest, and Gertie had finished reading aloud in her little Bible, as she always did at bedtime, True called her to him, and asked her, as he had often done of late, to repeat his favorite prayer for the sick. She knelt at his bedside, and with a solemn and touching earnestness fulfilled his request. Now, darling, the prayer for the dying. Isn't there such a one in your little book? Gertie trembled. There was such a prayer, a beautiful one, and the thoughtful child, to whom the idea of death was familiar, knew it by heart. But could she repeat the words? Could she command her voice? Her whole frame shook with agitation. But Uncle True wished to hear it. It would be a comfort to him, and she would try. Concentrating all her energy and self-command, she began, and gaining strength as she proceeded, went on to the end. Once or twice her voice faltered, but with new effort she succeeded, in spite of the great bunches in her throat, and her voice sounded so clear and calm that Uncle True's devotional spirit was not once disturbed by the thought of the girl's sufferings. For, fortunately, he could not hear how her heart beat and throbbed and threatened to burst. She did not rise at the conclusion of the prayer. She could not, but remained kneeling, her head buried in the bedclothes. For a few moments there was a solemn stillness in the room. Then the old man laid his hand upon her head. She looked up. "'You love Miss Emily, don't you, Bertie?' "'Yes, indeed. "'You'll be a good child to her when I'm gone?' "'Oh, Uncle True,' sobbed Gertie, "'you mustn't leave me. "'I can't live without you, dear Uncle True.' "'It is God's will to take me, Gertie. "'He has always been good to us, "'and we mustn't doubt him now. "'Miss Emily can do more for you than I could, "'and you'll be very happy with her.' "'No, I shan't. "'I shan't ever be happy again in this world. "'I never was happy until I came to you, "'and now, if you die, I wish I could die too. "'You mustn't wish that, darling. "'You are young and must try to do good in the world "'and bide your time. "'I'm an old man, and only a trouble now.' "'No, no, Uncle True,' said Gertie, earnestly. "'You are not a trouble. "'You never could be a trouble. "'I wish I'd never been so much trouble to you.' "'So far from that, Bertie. "'God knows you've long been my heart's delight. "'It only pains me now to think that you're a-spendin' all your time "'and slavin' here at home, instead of goin' to school, as you used to. "'But, oh, we all depend on each other so, first on God, and then on each other. "'And that minds me, Gertie, of what I was going to say. "'I feel as if the Lord would call me soon, sooner than you think for now. "'And at first you'll cry and be sore vexed, no doubt.' But Miss Emily will take you with her, and she'll tell you blessed things to comfort you. How we shall all meet again, and be happy in that world where there's no partins. And Willie'll do everything he can to help you in your sorrow, and in time you'll be able to smile again. At first, and perhaps for a long time, Gertie, you'll be a care to Miss Emily, and she'll have to do a deal for you in the way of schoolin', clothin', and so on. And what I want to tell you is, that Uncle True expects you'll be as good as can be, and do just what Miss Emily says. And by and by, maybe, when you're bigger and older, you'll be able to do something for her. She's blind, you know, and you must be eyes for her, and she's not over-strong, and you must lend a helping hand to her weakness, just as you do to mine. And if you're good and patient, God will make your heart light at last, while you're only trying to make other folks happy. And when you're sad and troubled— for everybody is sometimes. Then think of old Uncle True and how he used to say, Cheer up, Bertie, for I'm of the opinion to will all come out right at last. There, don't feel bad about it. Go to bed, darling, and tomorrow we'll have a nice walk. And Willie's a-goin' with us, you know. Gertie tried to cheer up, for True's sake, and went to bed. She did not sleep for some hours. But when at last she did fall into a quiet slumber, it continued unbroken until morning. She dreamed that morning was already come, that she and Uncle True and Willie were taking a pleasant walk, that Uncle True was strong and well again, his eye bright, his step firm, and Willie and herself laughing and happy. And while she dreamed the beautiful dream, little thinking that her first friend and she should no longer tread life's paths together, the messenger came, a gentle, noiseless messenger, and in the still night, while the world was asleep, took the soul of good old True, and carried it home to God. 
End of chapter 15「Chapter sixteen of the Lamplighter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bridget Gage. The Lamplighter by Maria Susanna Cummins. Chapter sixteen. The stars are mansions built by nature's hand, and haply there the spirits of the blessed dwell, clothed in radiance, their immortal vest. Wordsworth. Two months have passed since Truman Flynn's death, and Gertrude has for a week been domesticated in Mr. Graham's family. It was through the newspaper that Emily first heard of the little girl's sudden loss, and, immediately acquainting her father with her wishes and plans concerning the child, she found she had no opposition to fear from him. He reminded her, however, of the inconvenience that would attend Gertrude's coming to them at once, as they were soon to start on a visit to some distant relatives, from which they would not return until it was nearly time to remove to the city for the winter. Emily felt the force of this objection for although Mrs. Ellis would be at home during their absence, she knew that, even were she willing to undertake the charge of Gertrude, she would be a very unfit person to console her in her time of sorrow and affliction. This thought troubled Emily, who now considered herself the orphan girl's sole protector, and she regretted much that this unusual journey should take place so inopportunely. There was no help for it, however, for Mr. Graham's plans were arranged, and must not be interfered with unless she would make Gertrude's coming, at the very outset, unwelcome and disagreeable. She started for town, therefore, the next morning, quite undecided what course to pursue, under the circumstances. The day was Sunday, but Emily's errand was one of charity and love, and would not admit of delay. And, an hour before the time for morning service, Mrs. Sullivan, who stood at her open window, which looked out upon the street, saw Mr. Graham's carryall stop at the door, she ran to meet Emily, and with the politeness and kindness always observable in her, waited upon her into a neat parlour, guided her to a comfortable seat, placed in her hand a fan, for the weather was excessively warm, and then proceeded to tell how thankful she was to see her, and how sorry she felt that Gertrude was not at home. Emily wonderingly asked where Gertrude was, and learned that she was out walking with Willie. A succession of inquiries followed and a long and touching story was told by Mrs. Sullivan of Gertrude's agony of grief, the impossibility of comforting her, and the fears the little kind woman had entertained, lest the girl would die of sorrow. "'I couldn't do anything with her myself,' said she. There she sat day after day last week on her little cricket, by Uncle True's easy-chair, with her head on the cushion, and I couldn't get her to move or eat a thing. She didn't appear to hear me when I spoke to her.' and if I tried to move her, she didn't struggle, for she was very quiet, but she seemed just like a dead weight in my hands, and I couldn't bear to make her come away into my room, though I knew it would change the scene, and be better for her. If it hadn't been for Willie, I don't know what I should have done. I was getting so worried about the poor child, but he knows how to manage her a great deal better than I do. When he is at home, we get along very well, for he takes her right up in his arms." He's very strong, and she's as light as a feather, you know, and either carries her into some other room or out into the yard, and somehow he contrives to cheer her up wonderfully. He persuades her to eat, and in the evenings, when he comes home from the store, takes long walks with her. Now last evening they went way over Chelsea Bridge, where it was cool and pleasant, you know, and I suppose he diverted her attention and amused her, for she came home brighter than I've seen her at all, and quite tired. I got her to go to bed in my room, and she slept soundly all night, so that she really looks quite like herself to-day. They've gone out again this morning, and being Sunday, and Willie at home all day, I've no doubt he'll keep her spirits up, if anybody can. "'Willie shows very good judgment,' said Emily, in trying to change the scene for her, and divert her thoughts. "'I'm thankful she has such kind friends. I promised Mr. Flint she should have a home with me when he was taken away.' and not knowing of his death until now, I consider it a great favor to myself, as well as her, that you have taken such excellent care of her. I felt sure you had been all goodness, or it would have given me great regret that I had not heard of True's death before. "'Oh, Miss Emily,' said Mrs. Sullivan, "'Gertrude is so dear to us, and we have suffered so much in seeing her suffer, that it was a kindness to ourselves to do all we could to comfort her.' 
why i think she and willie could not love each other better if they were own brother and sister and willie and uncle true were great friends indeed we shall all miss him very much my old father doesn't say much about it but i can see he's very downhearted more conversation followed in the course of which mrs sullivan informed emily that a cousin of hers a farmer's wife living in the country about twenty miles from boston had invited them all to come and pass a week or two with her at the farm and as willie was now to enjoy his usual summer vacation they proposed accepting the invitation she spoke of gertrude's accompanying them as a matter of course and enlarged upon the advantage it would be to her to breathe the country air and ramble about the fields and woods after all the fatigue and confinement she had endured emily finding from her inquiries that gertrude would be a welcome and expected guest cordially approved of the visit and also arranged with mrs sullivan that she should remain under her care until mr graham removed to boston for the winter she was then obliged to leave without waiting for gertrude's return though she left many a kind message for her and placed in mrs sullivan's hands a sufficient sum of money to provide for all her wants and expenses gertrude went into the country and abundance of novelty of country fare healthful exercise and heartfelt kindness and sympathy brought the color into her cheek and calmness and composure if not happiness into her heart soon after the sullivans returned from their excursion the grahams removed to the city and as we have said before gertrude had now been with them about a week are you still standing at the window gertrude what are you doing dear i'm watching to see the lamps lit miss emily but they will not be lit at all the moon will rise at eight o'clock and light the streets sufficiently for the rest of the night i don't mean the street lamps what do you mean my child said emily coming towards the window and lightly resting a hand on each of gertrude's shoulders I mean the stars, dear Miss Emily. Oh, how I wish you could see them, too. Are they very bright? Oh, they are beautiful, and there are so many. The sky is as full as it can be. How well I remember when I used to stand at this very window, and look at them as you were doing now. It seems to me as if I saw them this moment. I know so well how they look. I love the stars. All of them, said Gertrude but my own star I love the best. Which do you call yours? That splendid one, there, over the church steeple. It shines into my room every night and looks me in the face. Miss Emily, and here Gertrude lowered her voice to a whisper, it seems to me as if that star were lit on purpose for me. I think Uncle True lights it every night. I always feel as if he were smiling up there and saying, See, Gertie, I'm lighting the lamp for you. Dear Uncle True, Miss Emily, do you think he loves me now? I do indeed, Gertrude, and I think if you make him an example, and try to live as good and patient a life as he did, that he will really be a lamp to your feet, and as bright a light to your path as if his face were shining down upon you through the star. I was patient and good when I lived with him, at least I almost always was, and I'm good when I'm with you. But I don't like Mrs. Ellis. She tries to plague me, and she makes me cross, and then I get angry, and don't know what I do or say. I did not mean to be impertinent to her today, and I wished I hadn't slammed the door. But how could I help it, Miss Emily, when she told me, right before Mr. Graham, that I tore up the last night's journal, and I know that I did not. It was an old paper that she saw me tying your slippers up in and I am almost sure that she lit the library fire with that very journal herself. But Mr. Graham will always think I did it. I have no doubt, Gertrude, that you had some reason to feel provoked, and I believe you when you say that you were not the person to blame for the loss of the newspaper. But you must remember, my dear, that there is no merit in being patient and good-tempered when there is nothing to irritate you. I want you to learn to bear even injustice without losing your self-control. You know Mrs. Ellis has been here a number of years. She has had everything her own way, and is not used to young people. She felt, when you came, that it was bringing new care and trouble upon her. And it is not strange that when things go wrong she should sometimes think you in fault. She is a very faithful woman, very kind and attentive to me, and very important to my father. It will make me unhappy if I have any reason to fear that you and she will not live pleasantly together." 
"'I do not want to make you unhappy. "'I do not want to be a trouble to anybody,' said Gertrude, with some excitement. "'I'll go away. "'I'll go off somewhere, where you will never see me again.' "'Gertrude,' said Emily, seriously and sadly, "'her hands were still upon the young girl's shoulders, "'and as she spoke she turned her round "'and brought her face to face with herself. "'Gertrude, do you wish to leave your blind friend? "'Do you not love me?' So touchingly grieved was the expression of the countenance that met her gaze, that Gertrude's proud, hasty spirit was subdued. She threw her arms around Emily's neck, and exclaimed, "'No, dear Miss Emily, I would not leave you for all the world. I will do just as you wish. I will never be angry with Mrs. Ellis again, for your sake.' "'Not for my sake, Gertrude,' replied Emily. "'For your own sake, for the sake of duty and of God.' A few years ago I should not have expected you to be pleasant and amiable towards any one whom you felt ill-treated you. But now that you know so well what is right, now that you are familiar with the life of that blessed Master, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again, now that you have learned faithfully to fulfill so many important duties, I had hoped that you had learned also to be forbearing under the most trying circumstances. But do not think, Gertrude, because I remind you when you have done wrong— I despair of your becoming one day all I wish to see you. What you are experiencing now being a new trial, you must bring new strength to bear upon it. And I have such confidence in you as to believe that, knowing my wishes, you will try to behave properly to Mrs. Ellis on all occasions. I will, Miss Emily, I will. I'll not answer her back when she's ugly to me, if I have to bite my lips to keep them together. Oh, I do not believe it will be so bad as that, said Emily, smiling. Mrs. Ellis's manner is rather rough, but you will get used to her. Just then a voice was heard in the entry. To see Miss Flint? Really? Well, Miss Flint is in Miss Emily's room. She's going to entertain company, is she? Gertrude colored to her temples, for it was Mrs. Ellis's voice, and the tone in which she spoke was very derisive. Emily stepped to the door and opened it. Mrs. Ellis? What say, Emily? Is there any one below? "'Yes, a young man wants to see Gertrude. "'It's that young Sullivan, I believe.' "'Willie!' exclaimed Gertrude, starting forward. "'You can go down and see him, Gertrude,' said Emily. "'Come back here when he's gone. "'And, Mrs. Ellis, I wish you would step in "'and put my room a little in order. "'I think you will find plenty of pieces for your rag-bag about the carpet. "'Miss Randolph always scatters so many "'when she is engaged with her dressmaking.' "'Mrs. Ellis made her collection.' and then, seating herself on a couch at the side of the fireplace, with her colored rags in one hand, and the white in the other, commenced speaking of Gertrude. "'What are you going to do with her, Emily?' said she. "'Send her to school?' "'Yes. She will go to Mr. W.'s this winter.' "'Why, isn't that a very expensive school for a child like her?' "'It is expensive, certainly. But I wish her to be with the best teacher I know of, and father makes no objection to the terms.' He thinks, as I do, that if we undertake to fit her to instruct others, she must be thoroughly taught herself. I talked with him about it the first night after we came into town for the season, and he agreed with me that we had better put her out to learn a trade at once, than half educate, make a fine lady of her, and so unfit her for anything. He was willing I should manage the matter as I pleased, and I resolved to send her to Mr. W.'s. So she will remain with us for the present. I wish to keep her with me as long as I can, not only because I am fond of the child, but she is delicate and sensitive, and now that she is so sad about old Mr. Flint's death, I think we ought to do all we can to make her happy. Don't you, Mrs. Ellis? I always calculate to do my duty, said Mrs. Ellis, rather stiffly. Where is she going to sleep when we get settled? In the little room at the end of the passage. Then where shall I keep the linen press? Can't it stand in the back entry? I should think the space between the windows would accommodate it. "'I suppose it's got to,' said Mrs. Ellis, flouncing out of the room and muttering to herself. "'Everything turned topsy-turvy for the sake of that little upstart.' Mrs. Ellis was vexed on more accounts than one. She had long had her own way in the management of all household matters at Mr. Graham's, and had consequently become rather tyrannical. She was capable, methodical, and neat, accustomed to a small family, and now for many years quite unaccustomed to children. Gertrude was in her eyes an unwarrantable intruder, 
one who must of necessity be continually in mischief, continually deranging her most cherished plans. Then, too, Gertrude had been reared, as Mrs. Ellis expressed it, among the lower classes. And the housekeeper, who was not in reality very hard-hearted, and quite approved of all public and private charities, had a slight prejudice in favor of high birth. Indeed, though now depressed in her circumstances, she prided herself on being of a good family, and considered it an insult to her dignity to expect that she should feel an interest in providing for the wants of one so inferior to her in point of station. More than all this, she saw in the new inmate a formidable rival to herself in Miss Graham's affections, and Mrs. Ellis could not brook the idea of being second in the regard of Emily who, owing to her peculiar misfortune and to her delicate health, had long been in her especial charge, and for whom she felt as much tenderness as it was in her nature to feel for any one. Owing to all these circumstances, Mrs. Ellis was far from being favorably disposed towards Gertrude, and Gertrude, in her turn, was not yet prepared to love Mrs. Ellis very cordially. End of chapter 16「Chapter seventeen of the Lamplighter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bridget Gage. The Lamplighter by Maria Susanna Cummins. Chapter seventeen. And thou must sail upon the sea, a long, eventful voyage. The wise may suffer wreck, the foolish must. Oh, then, be early wise. Warn. Emily sat alone in her room. Mr. Graham had gone to a meeting of bank directors. Mrs. Ellis was stoning raisins in the dining-room. Willie still detained Gertrude in the little library below stairs, and Emily, with the moonlight now streaming across the chamber, which was none the less dark to her on that account, was indulging in a long train of meditation. Her head rested on her hand. Her face, usually so placid, was sad and melancholy in its expression and her whole appearance and attitude denoted despondency and grief. As thought pressed upon thought, and past sorrows arose in quick succession, her head gradually sunk upon the cushions of the couch where she sat, and tears slowly trickled through her fingers. Suddenly a hand was laid softly upon hers. She gave a quick start, as she always did when surprised, for her unusual preoccupation of mind had made Gertrude's approaching step unheard. "'Is anything the matter, Miss Emily?' said Gertrude. "'Do you like best to be alone, or may I stay?' The sympathetic tone, the delicacy of the child's question, touched Emily. She drew her towards her, saying as she did so, "'Oh, yes, stay with me.' Then observing, as she passed an arm round the little girl, that she trembled, and seemed violently agitated, she added, "'But what is the matter with you, Gertie? What makes you tremble and sob so?' At this, Gertrude broke forth with, "'Oh, Miss Emily, I thought you were crying when I came in, and I hoped you would let me come and cry with you, for I am so miserable I can't do anything else.' Calmed herself by the more vehement agitation of the child, Emily endeavored to discover the cause of this evidently new and severe affliction. It proved to be this. Willie had been to tell her that he was going away, going out of the country, as Gertrude expressed it, to the very other end of the world, to India. Mr. Clinton was interested in a mercantile house at Calcutta, and had offered William the most favorable terms to go abroad as clerk to the establishment. The prospect thus afforded was far better than he could hope for by remaining at home. The salary was, at the very first, sufficient to defray all his own expenses, and provide for the wants of those who were now becoming every year more and more dependent upon him. The chance, too, of future advancement was great, and though the young man's affectionate heart clung fondly to home and friends, there was no hesitation in his mind as to the course which both duty and interest prompted. He agreed to the proposal, and whatever his own struggles were at the thought of five, or perhaps ten years' banishment, he kept them manfully to himself, and talked cheerfully about it to his mother and grandfather. "'Miss Emily,' said Gertrude, when she had acquainted her with the news, and become again somewhat calm. "'How can I bear to have Willie go away? How can I live without Willie? He is so kind and loves me so much. He was always better than any brother, and since Uncle True died, he has done everything in the world for me. 
I believe I could not have borne Uncle True's death if it had not been for Willie. And now, how can I let him go away? It is hard, Gertrude, said Emily, kindly. But it is no doubt for his advantage. You must try and think of that. I know it, replied Gertrude. I suppose it is. But, Miss Emily, you do not know how I love Willie. We were so much together, and there were only us two, and we thought everything of each other. He was so much older than I, and always took such good care of me. Oh, I don't think you have any idea what friends we are. Gertrude had unconsciously touched a chord that vibrated through Emily's whole frame. Her voice trembled as she answered, I, Gertrude, not know, my child? I know better than you imagine how dear he must be to you. I, too, had... Then checking herself, she paused abruptly, and there was a few moments' silence, during which Emily got up, walked hastily to the window, pressed her aching head against the frosty glass, and then, returning to Gertrude, said in a voice which had recovered its usual calmness, Oh, Gertrude, in the grief that oppresses you now, you little realize how much you have to be thankful for. Think, my dear, what a blessing it is that Willie will be where you can often hear from him, and where he can have constant news of his friends. Yes, replied Gertie. He says he shall write to his mother and me very often. Then, too, said Emily, you ought to rejoice at the good opinion Mr. Clinton must have of Willie, the perfect confidence he must feel in his uprightness to place in him so much trust. I think that is very flattering. So it is, said Gertrude. I did not think of that. And you have lived so happily together, continued Emily, and will part in such perfect peace. Oh, Gertrude, Gertrude, such a parting as that should not make you sad. There are so much worse things in the world. Be patient, my dear child, do your duty, and perhaps there will some day be a happy meeting that will quite repay you for all you suffer in the separation. Emily's voice trembled as she uttered the last few words. Gertrude's eyes were fixed upon her friend with a very puzzled expression. Miss Emily, said she, I begin to think everybody has trouble. Certainly, Gertrude, can you doubt it? I did not use to think so. I knew I had, but I thought other folks were more fortunate. I fancied that rich people were all happy. And though you are blind, and that is a dreadful thing, I supposed you were used to it, and you always looked so pleasant and quiet. I took it for granted nothing ever vexed you now. And then Willie. I believed once that nothing could make him look sad. He was always so gay. But when he hadn't any place, I saw him really cry. And then, when Uncle True died, and now again tonight, when he was telling me about going away, he could hardly speak, he felt so badly. And so, Miss Emily, since I see that you and Willie have troubles, and that tears will come, though you tried to keep them back, I think the world is full of trials, and that everybody gets a share. It is the lot of humanity, Gertrude, and we must not expect it to be otherwise. Then who can be happy, Miss Emily? Those only, my child, who have learned submission. Those who, in the severest afflictions, see the hand of a loving father, and, obedient to his will, kiss the chastening rod. It is very hard, Miss Emily. It is hard, my child, and therefore few in this world can rightly be called happy. But if, even in the midst of our distress, we can look to God in faith and love, we may, when the world is dark around, experience a peace that is a foretaste of heaven. And Emily was right. Who that is striving after the Christian life has not experienced moments when, amid unusual discouragements and disappointments, the heart, turning in love and trust to its great source, experiences emotions of ecstatic joy and hope that never come to the prosperous and the world called happy. He who has had such dreams of eternal peace can form some conception of the rest which remaineth for the people of God, when, with an undivided affection and a faith undimmed by a single doubt, the soul reposes in the bosom of its Creator. Gertrude had often found in time and the soothing influences of religious faith some alleviation to her trials. But never, until this night, did she feel a spirit not of earth, coming forth from the very chaos of sorrow into which she was plunged, and enkindling within her the flame of a higher and nobler sensation than she ever yet had cherished. When she left Emily that night, it was with a serenity which is strength. And if the spirit of Uncle True, looking down upon her through the bright star which she so loved, sighed to see the tears which glittered in her eyes, 
It was reassured by the smile of a heaven-lit light that played over her features, and when she sunk to slumber, stamped them with the seal of peace. Willie's departure was sudden, and Mrs. Sullivan had only a week in which to make those arrangements which a mother's thoughtfulness deems necessary. Her hands were therefore full of work, and Gertie, whom Emily at once relinquished for the short time previous to the vessel's sailing, was of great assistance to her. Willie was very busy daytimes, but was always with them in the evening. On one occasion he returned home about dusk, and his mother and grandfather both being out, and Gertrude having just put aside her sewing, he said to her, "'Come, Gertie, if you are not afraid of taking cold, come and sit on the doorstep with me, as we used to in old times. There will be no more such warm days as this, and we may never have another chance to sit there and watch the moon rise above the old house at the corner.' "'Oh, Willie,' said Gertrude, "'do not speak of our never being together in this old place again. I cannot bear the thought. There is not a house in Boston I could ever love as I do this.' "'Nor I,' replied Willie, "'but there is not one chance in a hundred, if I should be gone for five years, that there would not be a block of brick stores in this spot when I come to look for it. I wish I did not think so, for I shall have many a longing after the old home.' "'But what will become of your mother and grandfather if this house is torn down?' "'It is not easy to tell, Gertie, what will become of any of us by that time. But if there is any necessity for their moving, I hope I shall be able to provide a better house than this for them. "'You won't be here, Willie.' "'I know it, but I shall be always hearing from you, and we can talk about it by letters, and arrange everything. The idea of any such changes, after all,' added he, "'is what troubles me most in going away.' I think they would miss me and need me so much. Gertrude, you will take care of them, won't you? I, said Gertrude, in amazement, such a child as I, what can I do? If I am gone five or ten years, Gertie, you will not be a child all that time, and a woman is often a better dependence than a man, especially such a good, brave woman as you will be. I have not forgotten the beautiful care you took of Uncle True, and whenever I imagine grandfather or mother old and helpless, I always think of you, and hope you will be near them, for I know, if you are, you will be a greater help than I could be. So I leave them in your care, Gertie, though you are only a child yet. Thank you, Willie, said Gertrude, for believing I shall do everything I can for them. I certainly will, as long as I live. But, Willie, they may be strong and well all the time you are gone, and I, although I am so young, may be sick and die. Nobody knows." "'That is true enough,' said Willie, sadly, "'and I may die myself. "'But it will not do to think of that. "'It seems to me I never should have courage to go "'if I didn't hope to find you all well and happy when I come home. "'You must write to me every month, "'for it will be a much greater task to mother, "'and I am sure she will want you to do nearly all the writing. "'And whether my letters come directed to her or you, "'it will be all the same, you know. "'And, Gertie, you must not forget me, darling. "'You must love me just as much when I am gone.' "'Won't you?' "'Forget you, Willie? "'I shall be always thinking of you, "'and loving you the same as ever. "'What else shall I have to do? "'But you will be off in a strange country, "'where everything will be different, "'and you will not think half as much of me, I know. "'If you believe that, Gertrude, "'it is because you do not know. "'You will have friends all around you, "'and I shall be alone in a foreign land. "'But every day of my life "'my heart will be with you and my mother, "'and I shall live here a great deal more than there.' They were now interrupted by Mr. Cooper's return. Nor did they afterwards renew the conversation on the above topics. But the morning Willie left them, when Mrs. Sullivan was leaning over a neatly packed trunk in the next room, trying to hide her tears, and Mr. Cooper's head was bowed lower than usual, while the light had gone out in the neglected pipe, which he still held in his hand. Willie whispered to Gertie, who was standing on a small chest of books, in order to force down the lid for him to lock it. "'Gertie, dear, for my sake take good care of our mother and grandfather. "'They are yours almost as much as mine.' "'On Willie's thus leaving home for the first time "'to struggle and strive among men, "'Mr. Cooper, who could not yet believe "'that the boy would be successful in the war with fortune, "'gave him many a caution against indulging hopes "'which never would be realized, "'and reminding him again and again "'that he knew nothing of the world. "'Mrs. Sullivan bestowed on her son "'but little parting counsel.' trusting to the lessons he had been learning from his childhood, 
she compressed her parental advice into few words, saying, Love and fear God, Willie, and do not disappoint your mother. We pause not to dwell upon the last night the youth spent at home, his mother's last evening prayer, her last morning benediction, the last breakfast they all took together, Gertrude among the rest, or the final farewell embrace. And Willie went to see, and the pious, loving, hopeful woman, who for eighteen years had cherished her boy with tenderness and pride, maintained now her wonted spirit of self-sacrifice, and gave him up without a murmur. None knew how she struggled with her aching heart, or whence came the power that sustained her. No one had given the little widow credit for such strength of mind, and the neighbors wondered much to see how quietly she went about her duties the day before her son sailed, and how, when he had gone, she still kept on with her work, and wore the same look of patient humility that ever characterized her. At the present moment, when emigration offers rare hopes and inducements, there is scarcely to be found in New England a village so insignificant, or so secluded, that there is not there some mother's heart bleeding at the perhaps lifelong separation from a darling son. Among the wanderers we hope, ay, we believe, that there is many a one who is actuated, not by the love of gold, the love of change, the love of adventure, but by the love he bears his mother, the earnest longing of his heart to save her from a life of toil and poverty. Blessings and prosperity to him who goes forth with such a motive. And if he fail, he has not lived in vain. For though stricken by disease or violence at the very threshold of his labors, he dies in attestation of the truth that there are sons worthy of a mother's love, a love which is the highest, the holiest, the purest type of God on earth. And now, in truth, commenced Gertrude's residence at Mr. Graham's, hitherto in various ways interrupted. She at once commenced attending school, and until the spring labored diligently at her studies. Her life was varied by few incidents, for Emily never entertained much company, and in the winter scarcely any at all, and Gertrude formed no intimate acquaintances among her companions. With Emily she passed many happy hours. They took walks, read books, and talked much with each other and Miss Graham found that in Gertrude's observing eyes, and her feeling and glowing descriptions of everything that came within their gaze, she was herself renewing her acquaintance with the outside world. In errands of charity and mercy, Gertrude was either her attendant or her messenger, and all the dependents of the family, from the cook to the little boy who called at the door for the fragments of broken bread, agreed in loving and praising for the child, who, though neither beautiful nor elegantly dressed, had a fairy lightness of step, a grace of movement, and a dignity of bearing, which impressed them all with the conviction that she was no beggar in spirit, whatever might be her birth or fortune, and all were in the invariable habit of addressing her as Miss Gertrude. Mrs. Ellis's prejudices against her were still strong, but as Gertrude was always civil, and Emily prudently kept them much apart, no unhappy result had yet ensued. Mr. Graham, seeing her sad and pensive, did not at first take much notice of her. But having on several occasions found his newspaper carefully dried, and his spectacles miraculously restored, after a vain search on his part, he began to think her a smart girl. And when, a few weeks after, he took up the last number of The Working Farmer, and saw, to his surprise, that the leaves were cut and carefully stitched together, he, supposing that she had done it for her own benefit, pronounced her decidedly an intelligent girl. She went often to see Mrs. Sullivan, and as the spring advanced, they began to look for news of Willie. No tidings had come, however, when the season arrived for the Grahams to remove into the country for the summer. A letter, written by Gertrude to Willie, soon after they were established there, will give some idea of her situation and mode of life. After dwelling at some length upon the disappointment of not having yet heard from him, and giving an account of the last visit she had made his mother before leaving the city, she went on to say, "'But you made me promise, Willie, to write about myself, and said you should wish to hear everything that occurred at Mr. Graham's which concerned me in any way. So if my letter is more tedious than usual, it is your own fault, for I have much to tell of our removal to D, and of the way in which we live here, so different from our life in Boston.' I think I hear you say, when you have read so far, Oh, dear, now Gertie is going to give me a description of Mr. Graham's country house. But you need not be afraid. I have not forgotten how, the last time I undertook to do so, you placed your hand over my mouth to stop me, 
and assured me you knew the place as well as if you had lived there all your life, for I had described it to you as often as once a week ever since I was eight years old. I made you beg my pardon for being so uncivil, but I believe I talked enough about my first visit here to excuse you for being quite tired of the subject. Now, however, quite to my disappointment, everything looks smaller and less beautiful than it seemed to me then. And though I do not mean to describe it to you again, I must just tell you that the entry and the piazzas are much narrower than I expected, the rooms lower, and the garden and summer houses not nearly so large. Miss Emily asked me a day or two ago how I liked the place, and if it looked as it used to. I told her the truth, and she was not at all displeased, but laughed at my old recollections of the house and grounds, and said it was always so with the things we had seen when we were little children. I need not tell you that Miss Emily is kind and good to me as ever, for nobody who knows her as you do would suppose she could ever be anything but the best and loveliest person in the world. I can never do half enough, Willie, to repay her for all her goodness to me. And yet, she is so pleased with little gifts, and so grateful for trifling attentions, that it seems as if everybody might do something to make her happy. I found a few violets in the grass yesterday and when I brought them to her she kissed and thanked me, as if they had been so many diamonds. And little Ben Gately, who picked a hatful of dandelion blossoms, without a single stem, and then rang at the front door-bell, and asked for Miss Gam, so as to give them to her himself, got a sweet smile for his trouble, and a thank you, Benny, that he will not soon forget. Wasn't it pleasant in Miss Emily, Willie? Mr. Graham has given me a garden, and I mean to have plenty of flowers for her by and by. That is, if Mrs. Ellis doesn't interfere. But I expect she will, for she does in almost everything. Willie, Mrs. Ellis is my trial, my great trial. She is just the kind of person I cannot endure. I believe there are some people that other people can't like, and she is just the sort I can't. I would not tell anybody else so, because it would not be right. And I do not know as it is right to mention it at all, but I always tell you everything. Miss Emily talks to me about her, and says I must learn to love her. And when I do, I shall be an angel. There, I know you will think that it is some of Gertie's old temper, and perhaps it is, but you don't know how she tries me. It is in little things that I cannot tell very easily, and I would not plague you with them if I could do so. So I won't write about her any more. I will try to be perfect, and love her dearly. You will think that now, while I am not going to school— I shall hardly know what to do with my time. But I have plenty to do. The first week after we came here, however, I found the mornings very dull. You know I am always an early riser, but as it does not agree with Miss Emily to keep early hours, I never see her until eight o'clock, full two hours after I am up and dressed. When we were in Boston, I always spent that time studying, but this spring Miss Emily, who noticed that I was growing fast, and heard Mr. Arnold observe how pale I looked, fancied it would not do for me to spend so much time at my books. And so, when we came to D, she planned my study hours, which are very few, and arranged that they should take place after breakfast and in her own room. She also advised me, if I could, to sleep later in the morning. But I could not, and was up at my usual time, wandering around the garden. One day I was quite surprised to find Mr. Graham at work, for it was not like his winter habits. But he is a queer man, he asked me to come and help him plant onion seeds, and I rather think I did it pretty well, for after that he let me help him plant a number of things, and label little sticks to put down by the side of them. At last, to my joy, he offered to give me a piece of ground for a garden, where I might raise flowers. He does not care for flowers, which seems so strange. He only raises vegetables and trees. And so I am to have a garden— but I am making a very long story, Willie, and have not time to say a thousand other things that I want to. Oh, if I could see you, I could tell you in an hour more than I can write in a week. In five minutes I expect to hear Miss Emily's bell, and then she will send for me to come and read to her. I long to hear from you, dear Willie, and pray to God, morning and evening, to keep you in safety, and soon send tidings of you to your loving Gertie. End of chapter 17《Chapter Eighteen of the Lamplighter》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bridget Gage. The Lamplighter by Maria Susanna Cummins. Chapter Eighteen. Is it not lovely? 
tell me where doth dwell the fay that wrought so beautiful a spell in thine own bosom brother didst thou say then cherish as thine own so good a fay dana a few weeks after the date of this letter gertie learned through george who went daily to the city to attend to the marketing that mrs sullivan had left word at the shop of our old acquaintance the rosy-cheeked butcher that she had received a letter from willie and wanted gertie to come into town and see it emily was willing to let her go but afraid it would be impossible to arrange it as charlie the only horse mr graham kept was in use and she saw no way of sending her why don't you let her go in the omnibus asked mrs ellis gertie looked gratefully at mrs ellis it was the first time that lady had ever seemed anxious to promote her views i don't think it's safe for her to go alone in the coach said emily safe what for that great girl exclaimed mrs ellis whose position in the family was such that there were no forms of restraint in her intercourse with miss graham do you think it is inquired emily she seems a child to me to be sure but as you say she is almost grown up and i dare say is capable of taking care of herself gertrude are you sure you know the way from the omnibus office in boston to mrs sullivan's perfectly well miss emily without further hesitation two tickets for the coach were put into gertrude's hand and she set forth on her expedition with beaming eyes and a full heart she found mrs sullivan and mr cooper well and rejoicing over the happiest tidings from willie who after a long but agreeable voyage had reached calcutta in health and safety a description of his new home his new duties and employers filled all the rest of the letter excepting what was devoted to affectionate messages and inquiries a large share of which were for gertie gertrude stayed and dined with mrs sullivan and then hastened to the omnibus she took her seat and as she waited for the coach to start amused herself with watching the passers-by it was nearly three o'clock and she was beginning to think she should be the only passenger when she heard a strange voice proceeding from a person whose approach she had not perceived she moved towards the door and saw standing at the back of the coach the most singular-looking being she had ever beheld it was an old lady small and considerably bent with years gertrude knew at a glance that the same original mind must have conceived and executed every article of the most remarkable toilet she had ever witnessed but before she could observe the details of that which was as a whole so wonderfully grotesque her whole attention was arrested by the peculiar behavior of the old lady she had been vainly endeavoring to mount the inconvenient vehicle and now with one foot upon the lower step was calling to the driver to come to her assistance sir said she in measured tones is this travelling equipage under your honourable charge what say marm yes i'm the driver saying which he came up to the door opened it and without waiting for the polite request which was on the old lady's lips placed his hand beneath her elbow and before she was aware of his intention lifted her into the coach and shut the door bless me ejaculated she as she seated herself opposite gertrude and began to arrange her veil and other draperies that individual is not versed in the art of assisting a lady without detriment to her habiliments oh dear oh dear added she in the same breath i've lost my parasol she rose as she spoke but the sudden starting of the coach threw her off balance and she would have fallen had it not been for gertrude who caught her by the arm and reseated her saying as she did so do not be alarmed madame here is the parasol as she spoke she drew into view the missing article which though nearly the size of an umbrella was fastened to the old lady's waist by a green ribbon and having slipped out of place was supposed lost and not a parasol only did she thus bring to light numerous other articles arranged in the same manner and connected with the same green string now met gertrude's astonished eyes a reticule of unusual dimensions and a great variety of colors a black lace cap a large feather fan a roll of fancy paper and several other articles they were partly hidden under a thin black silk shawl and gertrude began to think her companion had been on a pilfering expedition if so however the culprit seemed remarkably at her ease for before the coach had gone many steps she deliberately placed her feet on the opposite seat and proceeded to make herself comfortable in the first place much to gertrude's horror she took out all her teeth and put them in her work-bag 
then drew off a pair of black silk gloves, and replaced them by cotton ones, removed her lace veil, folded and pinned it to the green string. She next untied her bonnet, threw over it, as a protection from the dust, a large cotton handkerchief, and with some difficulty, unloosing her fan, applied herself so diligently to the use of it, closing her eyes as she did so, and evidently intending to go to sleep. She probably did fall into a doze, for she was very quiet, and Gertrude, occupied with her own thoughts, and with observing some heavy clouds that were arising from the west, forgot to observe her fellow-traveller, until she was startled by a hand suddenly laid upon her own, and an abrupt exclamation of, "'My dear young damsel, do not those dark shadows betoken adverse weather?' "'I think it will rain very soon,' replied Gertrude. "'This morn, when I ventured forth,' soliloquized the old lady, "'the sun was bright, the sky serene. "'Even the winged songsters, as they piped their hymns, "'proclaimed their part in the universal joy. "'And now, before I can regain my retirement, "'my delicate lace flounces, "'and she glanced at the skirt of her dress, "'will prove a sacrifice to the pitiless storm.' "'Doesn't the coach pass your door?' inquired Gertrude, "'her compassion excited by the old lady's evident distress.' "'No, oh no, not within half a mile. "'Does it better accommodate you, my young miss?' "'No, I have a mile to walk beyond the omnibus office.' "'The old lady, moved by a deep sympathy, "'drew nearer to Gertrude, saying, in the most doleful accents, "'Alas, for the delicate whiteness of your bonnet-ribbon!' "'The coach had by this time reached its destination, "'and the two passengers alighted. "'Gertrude placed her ticket in the driver's hand, "'and would have started at once on her walk.' but was prevented by the old lady, who grasped her dress, and begged her to wait for her, as she was going the same way. And now great difficulty and delay ensued. The old lady refused to pay the amount of fare demanded by the driver, declared it was not the regular fare, and accused the man of an intention to put the surplus of two cents in his own pocket. Gertrude was impatient, for she was every moment expecting to see the rain pour in torrents, but at last, the matter being compromised between the driver and his closely calculating passenger, she was permitted to proceed. They had walked about a quarter of a mile, and that at a very slow rate, when the rain commenced falling, and now Gertrude was called upon to unloose the huge parasol, and carry it over her companion and herself. In this way they had accomplished nearly as much more of the distance, when the water began to descend as if all the reservoirs of heaven were at once thrown open. At this moment Gertrude heard a step behind them, and turning she saw George, Mr. Graham's man, running in the direction of the house. He recognized her at once, and exclaimed, "'Miss Gertrude, you'll be wet through, and Miss Pace, too,' added he, seeing Gertie's companion. "'Sure, and you'd better bathe hasten to her house, where you'll be secure.' So saying, he caught Miss Pace in his arms, and signing to Gertrude to follow, rushed across the street and hurrying on to a cottage near by, did not stop until he had placed the old lady in safety beneath her own porch, and Gertie at the same instant gained its shelter. Miss Pace, for such was the old lady's name, was so bewildered that it took her some minutes to recover her consciousness, and in the meantime it was arranged that Gertrude should stop where she was for an hour or two, and that George should call for her when he passed that way with a carriage, on his return from the depot, where he went regularly on three afternoons in the week for Mr. Graham. Miss Patty Pace was not generally considered a person of much hospitality. She owned the cottage which she occupied, and lived there quite alone, keeping no servants, and entertaining no visitors. She herself was a famous visitor, and, as but a small part of her life had been passed in D, and all her friends and connections lived either in Boston or at a much greater distance, she was a constant frequenter of omnibuses and other public vehicles. But though, through her travelling propensities, and her regular attendance at church, she was well known. Gertrude was, perhaps, the first visitor that had ever entered her house, and she, as we have seen, could scarcely be said to have come by invitation. Even when she was at the very door, she found herself obliged to take the old lady's key, unlock and open it herself, and finally lead her hostess into the parlour, and help her off with her innumerable capes, shawls, and veils. Once come to a distinct consciousness of her situation, however, and Miss Patty Pace conducted herself with all the elegant politeness for which she was remarkable. Suffering though she evidently was, with a thousand regrets, at the trying experience her own clothes had sustained, 
She commanded herself sufficiently to express nearly as many fears, lest Gertrude had ruined every article of her dress. It was only after many assurances from the latter that her boots were scarcely wet at all, her gingham dress and cape not likely to be hurt by rain, and her nice straw bonnet safe under the scarf she had thrown over it, that Miss Patty could be prevailed upon to so far forget the duties of a hostess as to retire and change her lace flounces for something more suitable for home wear. As soon as she left the room, Gertrude, whose curiosity was wonderfully excited, hastened to take a nearer view of numbers of articles, both of ornament and use, which had already attracted her attention from their odd and singular appearance. Miss Pace's parlor was as remarkable as its owner. Its furniture, like her apparel, was made up of the gleanings of every age and fashion, from chairs that undoubtedly came over in the Mayflower, to feeble attempts at modern pincushions, and imitations of crystallized grass, that were a complete failure. Gertrude's quick and observing eye was reveling amid the few relics of ancient elegance, and the numerous specimens of folly and bad taste, with which the room was filled, when the old lady returned. A neat though quaint black dress having taken the place of the much-valued flounces, she now looked far more ladylike. She held in her hand a tumbler of pepper and water, and begged her visitor to drink, assuring her it would warm her stomach and prevent her taking cold. And when Gertrude, who could only with great difficulty keep from laughing in her face, declined the beverage, Miss Patty seated herself, and while enjoying the refreshment, carried on a conversation which at one moment satisfied her visitor she was a woman of sense, and the next persuaded her that she was either foolish or insane. The impression which Gertrude made upon Miss Patty, however, was more decided. Miss Patty was delighted with the young miss, who, she declared, possessed an intellect that would do honor to a queen, a figure that was airy as a gazelle, and motions more graceful than those of a swan. When George came for Gertrude, Miss Pace, who seemed really sorry to part with her, cordially invited her to come again, and Gertrude promised to do so. The satisfactory news from Willie, and the amusing adventures of the afternoon— had given to Gertrude such a feeling of buoyancy and light-heartedness that she bounded into the house and up the stairs, with that fairy quickness Uncle True had so loved to see in her, and which, since his death, her subdued spirits had rarely permitted her to exercise. She hastened to her own room to remove her bonnet and change her dress before seeking Emily, to whom she longed to communicate the events of the day. At the door of her room she met Bridget, the housemaid, with a dustpan, hand-broom, etc., on inquiring what was going on there at this unusual hour, she learned that during her absence her room, which had since their removal been in some confusion, owing to Mrs. Ellis not having decided what furniture should be placed there, had been subjected to a thorough and comprehensive system of spring cleaning. Alarmed, though she scarcely knew why, at the idea of Mrs. Ellis having invaded her premises, she surveyed the apartment with a slight feeling of agitation— which, as she continued her observations, swelled into a storm of angry excitement. When Gertrude went from Mrs. Sullivan's to Mr. Graham's house in the city, she carried with her, beside a trunk containing her wardrobe, an old bandbox, which she stored away on the shelf of a closet in her chamber. There it remained during the winter, unpacked and unobserved by any one. When the family went into the country, however, the box went also, carefully watched and protected by its owner. As there was no closet or other hiding-place in Gertrude's new room, she placed it in a corner behind the bed, and the evening before her expedition to the city had been engaged in removing and inspecting a part of its contents. Each article was endeared to her by the charm of old association, and many a tear had the little maiden shed over her stock of valuables. There was the figure of the Samuel, Uncle True's first gift, now defaced by time and accident. As she surveyed a severe contusion on the back of the head, the effect of an inadvertent knock given to it by True himself, and remembered how patiently the dear old man labored to repair the injury, she felt that she would not part with a much-valued memento for the world. There, too, were his pipes, of common clay, and dark with smoke and age, but as she thought how much comfort they had been to him, she felt that the possession of them was a consolation to her. She had brought away, too, his lantern, for she had not forgotten its pleasant light, the first that ever fell upon the darkness of her life. Nor could she leave behind an old fur cap, beneath which she had often saw a kindly smile, and never having sought in vain, could hardly realize that there was not one for her still hidden beneath its crown. 
There were some toys, too, and picture books, gifts from Willie, a little basket he had carved for her from a nut, and a few other trifles. All these things, excepting the lantern and cap, Gertrude had left upon the mantelpiece, and now, upon entering the room, her eye at once sought her treasures. They were gone. The mantelpiece was nicely dusted, and quite empty. She ran towards the corner where she had left the old box. That, too, was gone. To rush after the retreating housemaid, call her back, and pour forth a succession of eager inquiries was but the work of an instant. Bridget was a newcomer, a remarkably stupid specimen, but Gertrude contrived to obtain from her all the information she needed. The image, the pipes, and the lantern were thrown among a heap of broken glass and crockery, and, as Bridget declared, smashed all to nothing. The cap, pronounced moth-eaten, had been condemned to the flames, and the other articles— Bridget could not be sure. But, troth, she believed she was just after leaving them in the fireplace. And all this in strict accordance with Mrs. Ellis's orders. Gertrude allowed Bridget to depart unaware of the greatness of her loss. Then, shutting the door, she threw herself upon the bed, and gave way to a violent fit of weeping. So this, thought she, was the reason why Mrs. Ellis was so willing to forward my plans. And I was foolish enough to believe it was for my own sake. She wanted to come here and rob me, the thief. She rose from the bed as suddenly as she had thrown herself down, and started for the door. Then, some new thought seeming to check her, she returned again to the bedside, and with a loud sob fell upon her knees, and buried her face in her hands. Once or twice she lifted her head, and seemed on the point of rising and going to face her enemy. But each time something came across her mind and detained her. It was not fear— Oh, no, Gertrude was not afraid of anybody. It must have been some stronger motive than that. Whatever it might be, it was something that had, on the whole, a soothing influence. For after every fresh struggle she grew calmer, and presently rising, seated herself in a chair by the window, leaned her head on her hand, and looked out. The window was open, the shower was over, and the smiles of the refreshed and beautiful earth were reflected in a glowing rainbow that spanned the eastern horizon. A little bird came, and perched on a branch of a tree close to the window, and shouted forth a te deum. A Persian lilac bush in full bloom sent up a delicious fragrance. A wonderful composure stole into Gertrude's heart, and ere she had sat there many minutes, she felt the grace that brings peace succeed to the passions that produce trouble. She had conquered, she had achieved the greatest of earth's victories, a victory over herself. The brilliant rainbow, the carol of the bird, the fragrance of the blossoms, all the bright things that gladden the earth after the storm, were not half so beautiful as the light that overspread the face of the young girl when, the storm within her laid at rest, she looked up to heaven, and her heart sent forth its silent offering of praise. The sound of the tea-bell startled her. She hastened to bathe her face and brush her hair, and then went downstairs. There was no one in the dining-room but Mrs. Ellis. Mr. Graham had been detained in town and Emily was suffering with a severe headache. Consequently, Gertrude took tea alone with Mrs. Ellis. The latter, though unaware of the great value Gertrude attached to her old relics, was conscious she had done an unkind thing, and as the injured party gave no evidence of anger or ill-will, not even mentioning the subject, the aggressor felt more uncomfortable and mortified than she would have been willing to allow. The matter was never recurred to, but Mrs. Ellis experienced a stinging consciousness of the fact that Gertrude had shown a superiority to herself in point of forbearance. The next day Mrs. Prince, the cook, came to the door of Emily's room, and obtaining a ready admittance, produced the little basket, made of a nut, saying, "'I wonder now, Miss Emily, where Miss Gertrude is, for I found her little basket in the coal hod, and I guess she'll be right glad on it. Taint her a mite.' Emily inquired, "'What basket?' and the cook, placing it in her hands, proceeded with eagerness to give an account of the destruction of Gertrude's property, which she herself had witnessed with great indignation. She also gave a piteous description of the distress the young girl manifested in her questioning of Bridget, which the sympathizing cook had overheard from her own not very distant chamber. As Emily listened to the story, she well remembered having thought, the previous afternoon, that she heard Gertrude sobbing in her room which on one side adjoined her own, but that afterwards she concluded herself to have been mistaken. Go, said she, and carry the basket to Gertrude. She is in the little library. But please, Mrs. Prime, don't tell her that you have mentioned the matter to me. 
Emily expected, for several days, to hear from Gertrude the story of her injuries, but Gertrude kept her trouble to herself, and bore it in silence. This was the first instance of complete self-control in Gertie, and the last we shall have occasion to dwell upon. From this time she continued to experience more and more the power of governing herself, and with each new effort gaining new strength, became at last a wonder to those who knew the temperament she had had to contend with. She was now nearly fourteen years old, and so rapid had been her recent growth, that instead of being below the usual stature, she was taller than most girls of her age. Freedom from study, and plenty of air and exercise, prevented her, however, from suffering from this circumstance. Her garden was a source of great pleasure to her, and flowers seeming to prosper under her careful training, she had always a bouquet ready to place by Emily's plate at breakfast-time. Occasionally she went to see her friend Miss Patty Pace, and always met with a cordial reception. Miss Patty's attention was very much engrossed by the manufacture of paper flowers, and as Gertrude's garden furnished the models, she seldom went empty-handed. But the old lady's success, being very ill-proportioned to her efforts, it would have been a libel upon nature to pronounce even the most favorable specimens of this sort of fancy-work, true copies of the original. Miss Patty was satisfied, however, and it is to be hoped that her various friends, for whom the large bunches were intended that travelled about tied to her waist by the green string, were satisfied also. Miss Patty seemed to have a great many friends. Judging from the numbers of people that she talked about to Gertrude, the latter concluded she must be acquainted with everybody in Boston. And it would have been hard to find any one whose intercourse expanded to a wider circle. She had in her youth learned an upholsterer's trade, which she had practised for many years in the employment, as she said, of the first families in the city, and so observing was she, and so acute in her judgment, that a report at one time prevailed that Miss Pace had eyes in the back of her head, and two pairs of ears. Notwithstanding her wonderful visionary and comprehending powers, she had never been known to make mischief in families. She was prudent and conscientious, and though always peculiar in her habits and modes of expression, and so wild in some of her fancies, as to be often thought by strangers a little out, she had secured and continued to retain the good will of a great many kindly disposed ladies and gentlemen, at whose houses she was always well received and politely treated. She calculated, in the course of every year, to go the rounds among all these friends, and thus kept up her intimacy with households in every member of which she felt a warm personal interest. Miss Patty labored under one great and absorbing regret, and frequently expatiated to Gertrude on the subject. It was that she was without a companion. "'Ah, Miss Gertrude,' she would sometimes exclaim, seeming for the time quite forgetful of her age and infirmities, "'I should do vastly well in this world, if I only had a companion.' And here, with a slight toss of the head, and a little smirking air, she would add in a whisper, "'And you must know, my dear, I somewhat meditate matrimony.' Then seeing Gertrude's look of surprise and amusement, she would apologize for having so long delayed fulfilling what had always been her intention, and at the same time that she admitted not being as young as she had once been, would usually close with the remark, "'It is true, time is inexorable, but I cling to life, Miss Gertrude, I cling to life, and may marry yet.' On the subject of fashion, too, she would declaim at great length, avowing, for her own part, a rigid determination to be modern, whatever the cost might be. Gertrude could not fail to observe that she had failed in this intention, as signally as in that of securing a youthful swain, and she was also gradually led to conclude that Miss Pace, whatever might be her means, was a terrible miser. Emily, who knew the old lady very well, and had often employed her, did not oppose Gertrude's visits to the cottage, and sometimes accompanied her, for Emily loved to be amused, and Miss Patty's quaint conversation was as great a treat to her as to Gertrude. These calls were so promptly returned that it was made very evident that Miss Patty preferred doing the greater part of the visiting herself, observing which, Emily gave her a general invitation to the house, of which she was not slow to avail herself. End of chapter 18「nineteen of the Lamplighter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bridget Gage. The Lamplighter by Maria Susanna Cummins. Chapter nineteen. More health, dear maid, thy soothing presence brings, than purest skies or salutary springs. Mrs. Berald. 
Persons who own residences within six miles of a large city cannot be properly said to enjoy country life. They have large gardens, oftentimes extensive grounds, and raise their own fruit and vegetables. They usually keep horses, drive about, and take the air. Some maintain quite a barnyard establishment, and pride themselves upon their fat cattle and Shanghai fowls. But after all, these suburban residents do not taste the charms of true country life. There are no pathless woods, no roaring brooks, no waving fields of grain, no wide stretches of pasture land. Every eminence commands a view of the near metropolis, the hum of which is almost audible, and every hourly omnibus or train of cars carries oneself or one's neighbor to or from the busy mart. Those who seek retirement and seclusion, however, can nowhere be more sure to find it than in one of these half country, half city homes, and many a family will, summer after summer, resort to the same quiet corner. And undisturbed by visitors or gossip, maintain an independence of life which would be quite impossible either in the crowded streets of the town, where one's acquaintances are forever dropping in, or in the strictly country villages where every newcomer is observed, called upon, and talked about. Mr. Graham's establishment was of the medium order, and little calculated to attract notice. The garden was certainly very beautiful. Abounding in rich shrubbery, summer houses, and arbors covered with grape vines. But a high board fence hid it from public view, and the house, standing back from the road, was rather old fashioned and very unobtrusive in its appearance. Excepting his horticultural propensities, Mr. Graham's associations were all connected with the city. And Emily, being unfitted for much general intercourse with society, entertained little company. Save that of the neighbors who made formal calls, and some particular friends, such as Mr. Arnold, the clergyman, and a few intimates, who often towards evening drove out of town to see Emily and eat fruit. The summer was passing away most happily, and Gertrude, in the constant enjoyment of Emily's society, and in the consciousness that she was, in various ways, rendering herself useful and important to this excellent friend. Was finding in every day new causes of contentment and rejoicing, when a seal was suddenly set to all her pleasure. Emily was taken ill with a fever, and Gertrude, on occasion of her first undertaking to enter the sick room, and share in its duties, was rudely repulsed by Mrs. Ellis, who had constituted herself sole nurse, and who declared, when the poor girl pleaded hard to be admitted, that the fever was catching, and Miss Emily did not want her there. That when she was sick, she never wanted any one about her but herself. For three or four days, Gertrude wandered about the house, inconsolable. On the fifth morning after her banishment from the room, she saw Mrs. Prime, the cook, going upstairs with some gruel, and thrusting into her hand some beautiful rosebuds, which she had just gathered. She begged her to give them to Emily, and ask if she might not come in and see her. She lingered about the kitchen, awaiting Mrs. Prime's return. In hopes of some message, at least from the sufferer, but when the cook came down, the flowers were still in her hand, and as she threw them on the table, the kind-hearted woman gave vent to her feelings. Well, folks do say that first-rate cooks and nurses are allers as cross as bears. Tain't for me to say whether it's so about cooks, but about nurses there ain't no sort o' doubt. I would not want to go there, Miss Gertrude. I wouldn't ensure you but what she'd bite your head off. Wouldn't Miss Emily take the flowers? Asked Gertrude. Looking quite grieved. Well, she hadn't no word in the matter. You know she couldn't see what they were, and Miss Ellis flung 'em outside the door, vowin' I might as well bring pison into the room with a fever as them roses. I tried to speak to Miss Emily, but Miss Ellis set up such a hush. I supposed she was goin' to sleep, and just made the best of my way out. Ugh! Don't she scold when there's anybody sick. Gertrude sauntered out into the garden. She had nothing to do but think anxiously about Emily. Who she feared was very ill. Her work and her books were all in Emily's room, where they were usually kept. The library might have furnished amusement, but it was locked up. So the garden was the only thing left for her, and there she spent the rest of the morning, and not that morning only, but many others, for Emily continued to grow worse, and a fortnight passed away without Gertrude seeing her, or having any other intimation regarding her health than Mrs. Ellis's occasional report to Mr. Graham. Who, however, as he saw the physician every day, and made frequent visits to his daughter himself, 
did not require that particular information which Gertrude was eager to obtain. Once or twice she had ventured to question Mrs. Ellis, whose only reply was, "'Don't bother me with questions. What do you know about sickness?' One afternoon, Gertrude was sitting in a large summer-house at the lower end of the garden. Her own piece of ground, fragrant with mignonette and verbena, was close by, and she was busily engaged in tying up and marking some little papers of seeds, the gleanings from various seed-vessels, when she was startled by hearing a step close beside her, and, looking up, saw Dr. Jeremy, the family physician, just entering the building. "'Ah, what are you doing?' exclaimed the doctor, in a quick, abrupt manner, peculiar to him. "'Sorting seeds, eh?' "'Yes, sir,' replied Gertie, looking up and blushing, as she saw the doctor's keen black eyes scrutinizing her face. "'Where have I seen you before?' asked he, in the same blunt way. "'At Mr. Flint's.' "'Ah, true Flint's. I remember all about it. You're his girl. Nice girl, too. And poor true he's dead. Well, he's a loss to the community.' "'So this is the little nurse I used to see there. "'Bless me, how children do grow!' "'Dr. Jeremy,' asked Gertrude, in an earnest voice, "'will you please to tell me how Miss Emily is?' "'Emily, she ain't very well just now. "'Do you think she'll die?' "'Die? No! What should she die for? "'I won't let her die, if you'll help me keep her alive. "'Why ain't you in the house taking care of her?' "'I wish I might!' exclaimed Gertrude, starting up. "'I wish I might!' "'What's to hinder?' "'Mrs. Ellis, sir. She won't let me in. She says Miss Emily doesn't want anybody but her.' "'She's nothing to say about it, or Emily either. It's my business, and I want you. I'd rather have you to take care of my patients than all the Mrs. Ellis's in the world. She doesn't know anything about nursing. Let her stick to her cranberry sauce and squash pies. So mind, to-morrow you're to begin.' "'Oh, thank you, doctor.' "'Don't thank me yet. Wait till you've tried it. It's hard work taking care of sick folks. Whose orchard is that? Mrs. Bruce's. Is that her pear tree? Yes, sir. By George, Mrs. Bruce, I'll try your pears for you.' As he spoke, the doctor, a man some sixty-five years of age, stout and active, sprung over a stone wall, which separated them from the orchard, and carried along by the impetus the leap had given him, reached the foot of the tree almost at a bound. As Gertrude, full of mirth, watched the proceeding, she observed the doctor stumble over some obstacle, and only save himself from falling by stretching forth both hands, and sustaining himself against the huge trunk of the fine old tree. At the same instant, a head, adorned with a velvet smoking-cap, was slowly lifted from the long grass, and a youth, about sixteen or seventeen years of age, raised himself upon his elbow, and stared at the unlooked-for intruder. Nothing daunted, the doctor at once took offensive ground towards the occupant of the place, saying, "'Get up, lazy bones. What do you lie there for, tripping up honest folks?' "'Who do you call honest folks, sir?' inquired the youth, apparently quite undisturbed by the doctor's epithet and inquiry. "'I call myself and my little friend here remarkably honest people,' replied the doctor, winking at Gertrude, who, standing behind the wall and looking over, was laughing heartily at the way in which the doctor had got caught. The young man, observing the direction of the latter's eyes, turned and gave a broad stare at Gertrude's merry face. "'Can I do anything for you, sir?' asked he. "'Yes, certainly,' replied the doctor. "'I came here to help myself to pears. But you are taller than I. Perhaps, with the help of that crooked-handled cane of yours, you can reach that best branch.' "'A remarkably honourable and honest errand,' muttered the young man. I shall be happy to be engaged in so good a cause. As he spoke, he lifted his cane, which lay by his side, and, drawing down the end of the branch, so that he could reach it with his hand, shook it vigorously. The ripe fruit fell on every side, and the doctor, having filled his pockets, and both his hands, started for the other side of the wall. "'Have you got enough?' asked the youth, in a very lazy tone of voice. "'Plenty, plenty,' said the doctor. "'Glad of it,' said the boy." indolently throwing himself on the grass, and still staring at Gertrude. "'You must be very tired,' said the doctor, stepping back a pace or two. "'I'm a physician, and should advise a nap.' "'Are you indeed?' replied the youth, in the same, half-drawling, half-ironical tone of voice in which he had previously spoken. "'Then I think I'll take your advice. 
Saying which, he threw himself back upon the grass and closed his eyes. Having emptied his pockets upon the seat of the summer-house, and invited Gertrude to partake, the doctor, still laughing so immoderately at his boyish feet, that he could scarcely eat the fruit, happened to bethink himself of the lateness of the hour. He looked at his watch. Half-past four. The cars go in ten minutes. Who's going to drive me down to the depot? I don't know, sir, replied Gertrude, to whom the question seemed to be addressed. Where's George? He's gone to the meadow to get in some hay, but he left white Charlie harnessed in the yard. I saw him fasten him to the chain, after he drove you up from the cars. Ah, then you can drive me down to the depot. I can't, sir. I don't know how. But you must. I'll show you how. You're not afraid. Oh, no, sir. But Mr. Graham— Never you mind Mr. Graham. Do you mind me? I'll answer for your coming back safe enough. Gertrude was naturally courageous. She had never driven before. But having no fears, she succeeded admirably, and being often afterwards called upon by Dr. Jeremy to perform the same service, she soon became skillful in the use of the reins, an accomplishment not always particularly desirable in a lady, but which, in her case, proved very useful. Dr. Jeremy was true to his promise of installing Gertrude in Emily's sick-room. The very next visit he made to his patient, he spoke in terms of the highest praise of Gertrude's devotion to her old uncle, and her capability as a nurse, and asked why she had been expelled from the chamber. "'She is timid,' said Emily, "'and is afraid of catching the fever.' "'Don't believe it,' said Jeremy. "'Tain't like her.' "'Do you think not?' inquired Emily, earnestly. "'Mrs. Ellis—' "'Told a lie,' interrupted the doctor. "'Gertie wants to come and take care of you, "'and she knows how, as well as Mrs. Ellis, any day. "'It isn't much you need done. "'You want quiet, and that's what you can't have, "'with that great talking woman about. "'So I'll send her to Jericho to-day, "'and bring my little Gertrude up here. "'She's a quiet little mouse, "'and has got a head on her shoulders.' "'It is not to be supposed that Gertrude could provide for Emily's wants "'any better, or even as well, as Mrs. Ellis.' and Emily, knowing this, took care that the housekeeper should not be sent to Jericho, for though Dr. Jeremy, a man of strong prejudices, did not like her, she was excellent in her department, and could not be dispensed with. Had it been otherwise, Emily would not have hurt her feelings by letting her see that she was in any degree superseded. So, though Emily, Dr. Jeremy, and Gertrude were all made happy by the free admission of the latter to the sick-room, the housekeeper— unhandsomely as she had behaved, was never conscious that any one knew the wrong she had done to Gertrude, in keeping her out of sight, and giving a false reason for her continued absence. There was a watchfulness, a care, a tenderness in Gertrude, which only the warmest love could have dictated. When Emily awoke at night from a troubled sleep, found a quilling draught ready at her lips, and knew from Mrs. Ellis's deep snoring that it was not her hand that held it, when she observed that all day long no troublesome fly was ever permitted to approach her pillow, her aching head was relieved by hours of patient bathing, and the little feet that were never weary were always noiseless. She realized the truth, that Dr. Jeremy had brought her a most excellent medicine. A week or two passed away, and she was well enough to sit up nearly all the time, though not yet able to leave her room. A few weeks more, and the doctor began to insist upon air and exercise. "'Drive out two or three times every day,' said he. "'How can I?' said Emily. "'George has so much to do. It will be very inconvenient. "'Let Gertrude drive you. She is a capital hand.' "'Gertrude,' said Emily, smiling, "'I believe you are a great favorite of the doctor's. "'He thinks you can do every... "'He thinks you can do anything. "'You never drove in your life, did you?' "'Hasn't she driven me to the depot every day for these six weeks?' inquired the doctor." "'Is it possible?' asked Emily, who was unaccustomed to the idea of a lady's attempting the management of a horse. Upon her being assured that this was the case, and the doctor insisting that there was no danger, Charlie was harnessed into the carryall, and Emily and Mrs. Ellis went out to drive with Gertrude, an experiment which, being often repeated, was a source of health to the invalid and a pleasure to them all. In the early autumn, when Emily's health was quite restored, old Charlie was daily called into requisition. Sometimes Mrs. Ellis accompanied them, but as she was often engaged about household duties, they usually went by themselves, 
in a large old-fashioned buggy and emily declared that gertrude's learning to drive had proved one of the greatest sources of happiness she had known for years once or twice in the course of the summer and autumn gertrude saw again the lazy youth whom dr jeremy had stumbled over when he went to steal pears once he came and sat on the wall while she was at work in her garden professed himself astonished at her activity talked a little with her about the flowers asked some questions concerning her friend dr jeremy and ended by requesting to know her name gertrude blushed she was a little sensitive about her name and though she always went by that of flint and did not on ordinary occasions think much about it she could not fail to remember when the question was put to her point blank that she had in reality no surname of her own emily had endeavored to find nan grant in order to learn from her something of gertrude's early history but nan had left her old habitation and for years nothing had been heard of her gertrude as we have said blushed on being asked her name but replied with dignity that she would tell hers provided her new acquaintance would return the compliment shan't do it said the youth impudently and don't care about knowing yours either saying which he kicked an apple with his foot and walked off still kicking it before him leaving gertrude to the conclusion that he was the most ill-bred person she had ever seen end of chapter nineteen chapter twenty of the lamplighter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bridget gage the lamplighter by maria susanna cummins chapter twenty a perfect woman nobly planned to warn to comfort and command and yet a spirit still and bright with something of an angel light wordsworth it was the twilight of a sultry september day and wearied with many hours endurance of an excessive heat unlooked for so late in the season emily graham sat on the front piazza of her father's house inhaling a delicious and refreshing breeze which had just sprung up the western sky was still streaked with brilliant lines of red the lingering effects of a gorgeous sunset while the moon now nearly at the full and triumphing in the close of the day and the commencement of her nightly reign cast her full beams upon emily's white dress and gave to the beautiful hand and arm which escaping from the drapered sleeve rested on the side of her rustic armchair the semblance of polished marble ten years had passed since emily was first introduced to the reader and yet so slight were the changes wrought by time upon her face and figure that she looked scarcely any older than on the occasion of her first meeting Gertrude in Mr. Arnold's church. She had even then experienced much of the sorrow of life, and learned how to distill from the bitter dregs of suffering a balm for every pain. Even then that experience, and the blessed knowledge she had gained from it, had both stamped themselves upon her countenance, the one in a sobered and subdued expression, which usually belongs to more mature years the other in that sweet, calm smile of trust and hope, which proclaims the votary of heaven. Therefore time had little power upon her, and as she was then, so she was now, lovely in her outward appearance, and still more lovely in heart and life. A close observer might, however, perceive in her a greater degree of buoyancy of spirit, keenness of interest in what was going on about her, and evident enjoyment of life, than she had formerly evinced and this was due, as Emily felt and acknowledged, to her recent close companionship with one to whom she was bound by the warmest affection, and who, by her lively sympathy, her constant devotion, her natural appreciation of the entertaining and the ludicrous, as well as the beautiful and the true, and her earnest and unsparing efforts to bring her much-loved friend into communion with everything she herself enjoyed, had called into play faculties which blindness had rendered almost dormant, and become what Uncle True bade her to be, eyes to her benefactor. On the present occasion, however, as Emily sat alone, shut out from the beautiful sunset, and unconscious of the shadows that played over her in the moonlight, her thoughts seemed to be sad. She held her head a little on one side, in a listening attitude, and as often as she heard the sound of the gate swinging in the breeze, she would start, while a look of anxiety, and even pain, would cross her features. At length, some one emerges from behind the high fence which screens the garden from public gaze, and approaches the gate. None but Emily's quick ear could have distinguished the light step. 
but she hears it at once, and rising, goes to meet the newcomer, whom we must pause to introduce, for though an old acquaintance, time has not left her unchanged, and it would be hard to recognize in her our little quondam Gertrude. The present Gertrude, for she it is, has now become a young lady. She is some inches taller than Emily, and her figure is slight and delicate. Her complexion is dark, but clear, and rendered brilliant by the rosy hue that flushes her cheeks. But that may be the effect of her rapid walk from the railroad station. She has taken off her bonnet, and is swinging it by the string, a habit she always had as a child, so we will acquit her of any coquettish desire to display an unusually fine head of hair. Gertrude's eyes have retained their old luster, and do not now look too large for her face and, if her mouth be less classically formed than the strict rule of beauty would commend, one can easily forgive that, in consideration of two rows of small pearly teeth, which are as regular and even as a string of beads. Her neat dress of spotted muslin fits close to her throat, and her simple black mantle does not conceal the roundness of her taper waist. What, then, is Gertrude a beauty? By no means. Hers is a face and form about which there would be a thousand different opinions, and out of the whole number few would pronounce her beautiful. But there are faces whose ever-varying expression one loves to watch. Tell-tale faces, that speak the truth and proclaim the sentiment within. Faces that now light up with intelligence, now beam with mirth, now sadden at the tale of sorrow, now burn with a holy indignation for that which the soul abhors, and now, again, are sanctified by the divine presence, when the heart turns away from the world and itself, and looks upward in the spirit of devotion. Such a face was Gertrude's. There are forms, too, which, though neither dignified, queenly, or fairy-like, possess a grace, an ease, a self-possession, a power of moving lightly and airily in their sphere, and never being in any one's way. And such a form was Gertrude's. Whatever charm these attractions might give her, and there were those who estimated it highly, it was undoubtedly greatly enhanced by an utter unconsciousness, on her part, of possessing any attractions at all. The early engrafted belief in her own personal plainness had not yet deserted her, but she no longer felt the mortification she had formerly labored under on that account. As she perceived Miss Graham coming to meet her, she quickened her pace, and joining her near the doorstep, where a path turning to the right led into the garden, passed her arm affectionately over Emily's shoulder, in a manner which the latter's blindness, and Gertrude's superior height and ability to act as guide, had of late rendered usual, and turning into the walk which led from the house, said, while she drew the shawl closer around her blind friend, "'Here I am, Emily. Have you been alone ever since I went away?' "'Yes, dear, most of the time, and have been quite worried to think you were travelling about in Boston this excessively warm day.' It has not hurt me in the least. I only enjoy this cool breeze all the more. It is such a contrast to the heat and dust of the city. But, Gertie, said Emily, stopping short in their walk, what are you coming away from the house for? You have not been to tea, my child. I know it, Emily, but I don't want any supper. They walked on for some time, slowly and in perfect silence. At last Emily said, Well, Gertrude, have you nothing to tell me? "'Oh, yes, a great deal, but—' "'But you know it will be sad news to me, and so you don't like to speak it. Is it not so?' "'I ought not to have the vanity, dear Emily, to think it would trouble you very much. But ever since last evening, when I told you what Mr. W. said, and what I had in my mind, and you seemed to feel so badly at the thought of our being separated, I have felt almost doubtful what it was right for me to do.' And I, on the other hand, Gertrude, have been reproaching myself for allowing you to have any knowledge of my feeling in the matter, lest I should be influencing you against your duty, or at least making it harder for you to fulfill. I feel that you are right, Gertrude, and that, instead of opposing, I ought to do everything I can to forward your plans. Dear Emily, exclaimed Gertrude vehemently, if you thought so from what I told you yesterday, you would be convinced, had you seen and heard all that I have to-day. Why, are matters any worse than they were at Mrs. Sullivan's? Much worse than I described to you. I do not then know myself all that Mrs. Sullivan had to contend with, but I have been at their house nearly all the time since I left home this morning, for Mr. W. did not detain me five minutes, 
and it really does not seem to me safe for such a timid, delicate woman as Mrs. Sullivan to be alone with Mr. Cooper, now that his mind is in such a dreadful state. But do you think you can do any good, Gertrude? I know I can, dear Emily. I can manage him much better than she can, and at the same time do more for his comfort and happiness. He is like a child now, and full of whims. When he can possibly be indulged, Mrs. Sullivan will please him at any amount of inconvenience, and even danger to herself, not only because he is her father, and she feels it her duty, but I actually think she is afraid of him. He is so irritable and violent. She tells me he often takes it into his head to do the strangest things, such as going out late at night, when it would be perfectly unsafe, and sleeping with his window wide open, though his room is on the lower floor. "'Poor woman!' exclaimed Emily. "'What does she do in such cases?' "'I can tell you, Emily, for I saw an instance of it to-day. "'When I first went in this morning, "'he was preparing to make a coal fire in the grate, "'notwithstanding the heat, "'which was becoming intense in the city. "'And Mrs. Sullivan,' said Emily, "'was sitting on the lower stair, in the front entry, crying. "'Poor thing!' murmured Emily. She could do nothing with him, continued Gertrude, and had given up in despair. She ought to have a strong woman, or a man, to take care of him. That is what she dreads more than anything. She says it would kill her to see him unkindly treated, as he would be sure to be by a stranger. And besides, I can see that she shrinks from the idea of having any one in the house to whom she is unaccustomed. She is exceedingly neat and particular in all her arrangements." has always done her work herself, and declares she would sooner admit a wild beast into her family than an Irish girl. Her new house has not been a source of much pleasure to her yet, has it? Oh, no, she was saying to-day how strange it seemed, when she had been looking forward so long to the comfort of a new and well-built tenement, that just as she had moved in and got everything furnished to her mind, she should have this great trial come upon her. It seems strange to me, said Emily, that she did not sooner perceive its approach. I noticed, when I went with you to the house in E Street, the failure in the old man's intellect. I had observed it for a long time, remarked Gertrude, but never spoke of it to her, and I do not think she was in the least aware of it, until about the time of their removal, when the breaking up of old associations had a sad effect upon poor Mr. Cooper. Don't you think, Gertrude, that the pulling down of the church, and his consequent loss of employment, were a great injury to his mind? Yes, indeed, I am sure of it. He altered very much after that, and never seemed so happy, even while they were in the house in E Street, and when the owners of that land concluded to take it for stores and warehouses, and gave Mrs. Sullivan notice that she would be obliged to leave, the old sexton's mind gave way entirely. Sad thing, said Emily. How old is he, Gertrude? I don't know exactly, but I believe he is very old. I remember Mrs. Sullivan's telling me, some time ago, that he was near eighty. Is he so old as that? Then I am not surprised that these changes have made him childish. Oh, no, melancholy as it is, it is no more than we may any of us come to, if we live to his age, and as he seems for the most part full as contented and happy as I have ever seen him appear. I do not lament it so much on his own account as on Mrs. Sullivan's. But I do, Emily, feel dreadfully anxious about her. Does it seem to be so very hard for her to bear up under it? I think it would not be if she were well, but there is something the matter with her, and I fear it is more serious than she allows, for she looks very pale, and has, I know, had several alarming ill turns lately. Has she consulted a physician? No, she doesn't wish for one, and insists upon it she shall soon be better. But I do not feel sure that she will, especially as she takes no care of herself. And that is one great reason for my wishing to be in town as soon as possible. I am anxious to have Dr. Jeremy see her, and I think I can bring it about without her knowing that he comes on her account. I'll have a severe cold myself, if I can't manage it any other way. You speak confidently of being in town, Gertrude, so I suppose it is all arranged." Oh, I have not told you, have I, about my visit to Mr. W. Dear, good man, how grateful I ought to be to him. He has promised me the situation. I had no doubt he would, from what you told me he said to you at Mrs. Bruce's. You hadn't, really? Why, Emily, I was almost afraid to mention it to him. I couldn't believe he would have sufficient confidence in me, but he was so kind. 
I hardly dare tell you what he said about my capacity to teach. You will think me so vain. You need not tell me, my darling. I know from his own lips how highly he appreciates your ability. You could not tell me anything so flattering as what he told me himself. Dear Uncle True always wanted me to be a teacher. It was the height of his ambition. He would be pleased, wouldn't he, dear Emily? He would no doubt have been proud enough to see you assistant in a school like Mr. W.'s. I am not sure, however, but he would think, as I do, that you are undertaking too much. You expect to be occupied in the school the greater part of every morning, and yet you propose to establish yourself as nurse to Mrs. Sullivan, and guardian to her poor old father. My dear child, you are not used to so much care, and I shall be constantly troubled for you, lest your own health and strength give way. Oh, dear Emily, there is no occasion for any anxiety on my account. I am well and strong, and fully capable of all that I have planned for myself. My only dread is in the thought of leaving you, and the only fear I have is that you will miss me, and perhaps feel as if— I know what you would say, Gertrude. You need not fear that. I am sure of your affection. I am confident you love me next to your duty, and I would not for the world that you should give me the preference. So dismiss that thought from your mind, and do not carry with you the belief that I would be selfish enough to desire to retain you a moment. I only wish, my dear, that for the present you had not thought of entering the school. You might then have gone to Mrs. Sullivan's, stayed as long as you were needed, and perhaps found, by the time we are ready to start on our southern tour, that your services could be quite dispensed with, in which case you could accompany us on a journey, which I am sure your health will by that time require. But, dear Emily, how could I do that? I could not propose myself as a visitor to Mrs. Sullivan, however useful I might intend to be to her. Nor could I speak of nursing to a woman who will not acknowledge that she is ill. I thought of all that, and it seemed to me impossible, with all the delicacy and tact in the world, to bring it about. For I have been with you so long, that Mrs. Sullivan, I have no doubt, thinks me entirely unfitted for her primitive way of life. It was only when Mr. W. spoke of his wanting an assistant, and, as I imagined, hinted that he should like to employ me in that capacity, that the present plan occurred to me. I knew, if I told Mrs. Sullivan that I was engaged to teach there, and that you were not coming to town at all, but were soon going south, and represented to her that I wanted a boarding place for the winter, she would not only be loath to refuse me a home with her, but would insist that I should go nowhere else. And it proved as you expected— Exactly, and she showed so much pleasure at the thought of my being with her, that I realized still more how much she needed someone. She will have a treasure in you, Gertrude. I know that very well. No, indeed, I do not hope to be of much use. The feeling I have is that however little I may be able to accomplish, it will be more than anyone else could do for Mrs. Sullivan. She has lived so retired that she has not an intimate friend in the city, and I do not really know of any one, except myself, whom she would willingly admit under her roof. She is used to me, and loves me, and I am no restraint upon her, and she allows me to assist in whatever she is doing, although she often says that I live a lady's life now, and am not used to work. She knows, too, that I have an influence over her father, and I have, strange as it may seem to you, I have more than I know how to account for myself." I think it is partly because I am not at all afraid of him, and am firm in opposing his unreasonable fancies, and partly because I am more of a stranger than Mrs. Sullivan. But there is still another thing which gives me a great control over him. He naturally associates me in his mind with Willie, for we were for some years constantly together, both left the house at the same time, and he knows, too, that it is through me that the correspondence with him is chiefly carried on. Since his mind has been so weak, he seems to think continually of Willie, and I can at any moment, however irritable or willful he may be, make him calm and quiet by proposing to tell him the latest news from his grandson. It does not matter how often I repeat the contents of the last letter. It is always new to him. And you have no idea, Emily, what power this little circumstance gives me. Mrs. Sullivan sees how easily I can guide his thoughts— and I noticed what a load of care seemed to be taken from her mind by merely having me there to-day. She looked so happy when I came away to-night, and spoke so hopefully of the comfort it would be during the winter to have me with her, that I felt repaid for any sacrifice it has been to me. 
but when I came home, and saw you, and thought of your going so far away, and of the length of time it might be before I should live with you again, I felt as if— Gertrude could say no more. She laid her head on Emily's shoulder and wept. Emily soothed her with the greatest tenderness. "'We have been very happy together, Gertie,' said she, "'and I shall miss you sadly. Half of the enjoyment of my life has of late years been borrowed from you. But I never loved you half so well as I do now, at the very time that we must part. For I see in the sacrifice you are making of yourself one of the noblest and most important traits of character a woman can possess. I know how much you love the Sullivans, and you have certainly every reason for being attached to them, and desiring to repay your old obligations. But you are leaving us at this time, and renouncing, without a murmur, the southern tour from which you expected so much pleasure, proves that my Gertie is the brave, good girl I always hoped and prayed she might become. You are in the path of duty, Gertrude, and will be rewarded by the approbation of your own conscience, if in no other way. As Emily finished speaking, they reached a corner of the garden, and were here met by a servant girl, who had been looking for them to announce that Mrs. Bruce and her son were in the parlor, and had asked for them both. "'Did you get her buttons in town, Gertrude?' inquired Emily. "'Yes. I found some that were an excellent match for the dress. She probably wants to know what success I had. But how can I go in?' "'I will return to the house with Katie, and you can go in at the side door, and reach your own room without being seen.' I will excuse you to Mrs. Bruce for the present, and when you have bathed your eyes and feel composed, you can come in and report concerning the errand she entrusted to you. End of chapter 20 Chapter 21 of The Lamplighter This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bridget Gage. The Lamplighter by Maria Susanna Cummins. Chapter 21 But had we best retire? I see a storm. Milton. Accordingly, when Gertrude entered the room half an hour afterwards, there was no evidence in her appearance of any unusual distress of mind. Mrs. Bruce nodded to her good-naturedly from a corner of the sofa. Mr. Bruce rose and offered his chair, at the same time that Mr. Graham pointed to a vacant window-seat near him, and said kindly, "'Here is a place for you, Gertrude.' Declining, however, the civilities of both gentlemen, she withdrew to an ottoman which stood near an open glass door, where she was almost immediately joined by Mr. Bruce, who, seating himself in an indolent attitude upon the upper row of a flight of steps which led from the window to the garden, commenced conversation with her. Mr. Bruce, the same gentleman who some years before wore a velvet smoking-cap and took afternoon naps in the grass, had recently returned from Europe and glorying in the renown acquired from a moustache, a French tailor, and the possession of a handsome property in his own right, now viewed himself with more complacency than ever. "'So you've been in Boston all day, Miss Flint?' "'Yes, nearly all day.' "'Didn't you find it distressingly warm?' "'Somewhat so.' "'I tried to go in to attend to some business that Mother was anxious about, and even went down to the depot, but I had to give it up.' "'Were you overpowered by the heat?' "'I was.' "'How unfortunate,' remarked Gertrude, in a half-compassionate, half-ironical tone of voice. Mr. Bruce looked up, to judge, if possible, from her countenance, whether she were serious or not. But there being little light in the room, on account of the warmth of the evening, he could not decide the question in his mind, and therefore replied, "'I dislike the heat, Miss Gertrude, and why should I expose myself to it unnecessarily?' "'Oh, I beg your pardon. I thought you spoke of important business.' "'Only some affair of my mother's, nothing I felt any interest in, and she took the state of the weather for an excuse. If I had known that you were in the cars, as I have since heard, I should certainly have persevered, in order to have had the pleasure of walking down Washington Street with you.' "'I did not go down Washington Street.' "'But you would have done so with a suitable escort,' suggested the young man." If I had gone out of my way for the sake of accompanying my escort, the escort would have been a very doubtful advantage, said Gertrude, laughing. How very practical you are, Miss Gertrude. Do you mean to say that, when you go to the city, you always have a settled plan of operations, and never swerve from your course? By no means. I trust I am not difficult to influence, when there is a sufficient motive. The young man bit his lip. Then you never act without a motive? 
pray, what is your motive in wearing that broad-brimmed hat when you were at work in the garden? It is an old habit, adopted some years ago from motives of convenience, and still adhered to, in spite of later inventions, which would certainly be a better protection from the sun. I must plead guilty, I fear, to a little obstinacy in my partiality for that old hat. Why not acknowledge the truth, Miss Gertrude, and confess that you wear it in order to look so very fanciful and picturesque that the neighbor's slumbers are disturbed by the very thoughts of it? My own morning dreams, for instance, as you are well aware, are so haunted by that hat, as seen in company with its owner, that I am daily drawn, as if by magnetic attraction, in the direction of the garden. You will have a heavy account to settle with Morpheus one of these days, for defrauding him of his rights and your conscience, too, will suffer for injuries to my health, sustained by continued exposure to early dues. It is hard to condemn me for such innocent and unintentional mischief, but since I am to experience so much future remorse on account of your morning visits, I shall take upon myself the responsibility of forbidding them. Oh, you wouldn't be so unkind, especially after all the pains I have taken to impart to you the little I know of horticulture." "'Very little, I think it must have been, or I have but a little memory,' said Gertrude, laughing. "'Now, how can you be so ungrateful? Have you forgotten the pains I took yesterday to acquaint you with the different varieties of roses? Don't you remember how much I had to say at first of damask roses and damask bloom, and how, before I had finished, I could not find words enough in praise of blushes, especially such sweet and natural ones as met my eyes while I was speaking?' I know you talked a great deal of nonsense. I hope you don't think I listened to it all. Oh, Miss Gertrude, it is of no use to say flattering things to you. You always look upon my compliments as so many jokes. I have told you several times that it was the most useless thing in the world to waste so much flattery upon me. I am glad you are beginning to realize it. Well, then, to ask a serious question, where were you this morning? At what hour? Half past seven? On my way to Boston, in the cars. Is it possible? So early? Why, I thought you went at ten. Then all the time I was watching by the garden wall to get a chance to say good morning, you were half a dozen miles away. I wish I had not wasted that hour so. I might have spent it sleeping. Very true. It is a great pity. And then half an hour more here this evening. How came you to keep me waiting so long? I? When? Why now, to-night? I was not aware of doing so. I certainly did not take your visit to myself. My visit certainly was not meant for any one else. Then, said Mr. Graham, approaching rather abruptly, and taking part in the conversation, are you fond of gardening? I thought I heard you just now speaking of roses. Yes, sir, Miss Flint and I were having quite a discussion upon flowers, roses especially. Gertrude, availing herself of Mr. Graham's approach, tried to make her escape, and join the ladies at the sofa. But Mr. Bruce, who had risen on Mr. Graham's addressing him, saw her intention, and frustrated it by placing himself in the way, so that she could not pass him without positive rudeness. Mr. Graham continued, "'I propose placing a small fountain in the vicinity of Miss Flint's flower-garden. Won't you walk down with me, and give your opinion of my plan?' "'Isn't it too dark, sir, to—' "'No, no, not at all. There is ample light for our purpose. This way, if you please.' And Mr. Bruce was compelled to follow where Mr. Graham led, though, in spite of his acquaintance with Paris manners, he made a wry face, and shook his head menacingly. Gertrude was now permitted to relate to Mrs. Bruce the results of the shopping, which she had undertaken on her account, and display the buttons, which proved very satisfactory. The gentlemen, soon after returning to the parlour, took seats near the sofa, and the company forming one group, the conversation became general. "'Mr. Graham,' said Mrs. Bruce, "'I have been questioning Emily about your visit to the South, and from the route which she tells me you propose taking, I think it will be a charming trip.' "'I hope so, madame. We have been talking of it for some time. It will be an excellent thing for Emily.' and, as Gertrude has never travelled at all, I anticipate a great deal of pleasure for her. Ah, then you are to be of the party, Miss Flint. Of course, of course, answered Mr. Graham, without giving Gertrude a chance to speak for herself. We depend upon Gertrude, couldn't get along at all without her. It will be delightful for you, continued Mrs. Bruce, her eyes still fixed on Gertrude. 
"'I did expect to go with Mr. and Miss Graham,' answered Gertrude, "'and looked forward to the journey with the greatest eagerness. "'But I have just decided that I must remain in Boston this winter.' "'What are you talking about, Gertrude?' asked Mr. Graham. "'What do you mean? This is all news to me.' "'And to me, too, sir, or I should have informed you of it before. "'I supposed you expected me to accompany you, "'and there is nothing I should like so much. "'I should have told you before of the circumstances that now make it impossible, "'but they are of quite recent occurrence. "'But we can't give you up, Gertrude. "'I won't hear of such a thing. "'You must go with us, in spite of circumstances.' "'I fear I shall not be able to,' said Gertrude, smiling pleasantly, but still retaining her firmness of expression. "'You are very kind, sir, to wish it.' "'Wish it? I tell you I insist upon it. You are under my care, child, and I have a right to say what you shall do.' Mr. Graham was beginning to get excited. Gertrude and Emily both looked troubled, but neither of them spoke. "'Give me your reasons, if you have any.' added Mr. Graham, vehemently, and let me know what has put this strange notion into your head. I will explain it to you to-morrow, sir. To-morrow, I want to know now. Mrs. Bruce, plainly perceiving that a family storm was brewing, wisely rose to go. Mr. Graham suspended his wrath until she and her son had taken leave, but as soon as the door was closed upon them, burst forth with real anger. Now tell me what all this means. Here I plan my business, and make all my arrangements, on purpose to be able to give up this winter to travelling. And that, not so much on my own account, as to give pleasure to both of you. And just as everything is settled, and we are almost on the point of starting, Gertrude announces that she has concluded not to go. Now I should like to know her reasons. Emily undertook to explain Gertrude's motives, and ended by expressing her own approbation of her course. As soon as she had finished, Mr. Graham, who had listened very impatiently, and interrupted her with many a pish and a pshaw, burst forth with redoubled indignation. So Gertie prefers the Sullivans to us, and you seem to encourage her in it. I should like to know what they've ever done for her, compared with what I have done. They have been friends of hers for years, and now that they are in great distress, she does not feel as if she could leave them, and I confess I do not wonder at her decision." I must say I do. She prefers to make a slave of herself in Mr. W.'s school, and a still greater slave in Mrs. Sullivan's family, instead of staying with us, where she has always been treated like a lady, and more than that, like one of my own family. Oh, Mr. Graham, said Gertrude, earnestly, it is not a matter of preference or choice, except as I feel it to be a duty. And what makes it a duty, just because you used to live in the same house with them, and that boy out in Calcutta has sent you home a camel-hair scarf and a cageful of miserable little birds, and written you a great package of letters, you think you must forfeit your own interests to take care of his sick relations? I can't say that I see how their claim compares with mine. Haven't I given you the best of educations, and spared no expense, either for your improvement or your happiness? I did not think, sir— answered Gertrude, humbly, and yet with quiet dignity, of counting up the favors I had received, and measuring my conduct accordingly. In that case, my obligations to you are immense, and you would certainly have the greatest claim upon my services. Services! I don't want your services, child. Mrs. Ellis can do quite as well as you can for Emily, or me either. But I like your company, and I think it is very ungrateful in you to leave us, as you talk of doing." father said emily i thought the object in giving gertrude a good education was to make her independent of all the world and not simply dependent upon us emily said mr graham i tell you it is a matter of feeling you don't seem to look upon the thing in the light i do but you are both against me and i won't talk any more about it so saying mr graham took a lamp went to his study shut the door hard not to say slammed it and was seen no more that night poor Gertrude, Mr. Graham, who had been so kind and generous, who had seldom before spoken harshly to her, and had always treated her with great indulgence, was now deeply offended. He had called her ungrateful, he evidently felt that she had abused his kindness, and believed that he and Emily stood in her estimation secondary to other, and, as he considered them, far less warm-hearted friends. Deeply wounded and grieved, she hastened to say good-night to the no less afflicted Emily, and seeking her own room, gave way to feelings that exhausted her spirit, and caused her a sleepless night. 
End of chapter 21